Hello, and welcome to day two of the Census Open Innovation Summit 2024. I'm Haley Ashka Miller, Director of the Opportunity Project and an Innovation Advisor at Census Open Innovation Labs. And I'm Dominique Zhu, Head of Human-Centered Innovation at Census Open Innovation Labs. We're thrilled that you've taken the time to tune in today. If you joined us yesterday, welcome back. We hope you learned new things and were inspired by our speakers representing government, civil society, the technology industry, and more. If you missed our first day, welcome to Summit. The conference will continue from 12 to 5.15 p.m. Eastern today and in Zoom workshops from 12 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And as a reminder, this summit is free and open to the public, so we hope you'll share the invitation with your colleagues, coworkers, friends, and family, and encourage them to join over the next two days. Remember to share your favorite content on social media using hashtag COIL Summit 2024, hashtag Opportunity Project, and tag at U.S. Census Bureau. Yesterday was a packed day filled with fascinating and informative discussions, technology highlights, and innovative ideas from an incredible group of 40 speakers. Our themes were financial inclusion and economic growth. We opened the day with a keynote from Jed Kolko, Undersecretary of Commerce for Economic Affairs. We were introduced to incredible new data tools built in top sprint, focused on promoting competition in the credit card market, and increasing access to capital in both indigenous communities and Puerto Rico. We also featured, featured community leaders and data experts who shared their live reactions to these new tools and their thoughts on the work ahead. We hosted a lightning round of speakers from the venture capital ecosystem and shared updates on our newest program, Stat Ventures. And we concluded with a keynote from NOAA Undersecretary, Dr. Rick Spinrad. Hopefully each and every one of you learned something new that you can directly apply to your own work. If you missed yesterday, all these sessions are posted on YouTube and you can view them anytime and share them with other colleagues. Today, our theme is human-centered data, and we hope you've come prepared to actively listen, learn, and participate in the discussion. So what do we mean by human-centered data? At Census Open Innovation Labs, or COIL for short, and the Census Bureau broadly, we're constantly working to make our data easily usable by a huge range of stakeholders. This includes people who are very familiar with our data, many who are not, technologists, community leaders, students, elected officials, and more. Delivering useful and accessible data for all of these consumers and more is a tall order, and it's something we can't do in a vacuum. We continue to look for new ways to receive user feedback, adopt new approaches by bringing in the best talent, and work with industry and nonprofit partners to best present and share our data for different audiences. In a few moments, we'll hear more from our Census Bureau Deputy Director, Ron Jarman, about these efforts. This challenge may sound familiar to other government agencies tuning in, so we wanted to shed light on how our partners and collaborators have worked to make data more accessible and useful for different types of people around the country. This includes top sprints on making data more easily usable by local leaders, improving data quality on critical topics in Puerto Rico, a conversation on tribal data sovereignty, and more. Through all of these efforts, Sprint participants aim to put members of the public and their needs at the center of government data improvements. We hope you'll enjoy the sessions today, and we encourage you to use the YouTube chat to share your questions and ideas. Throughout the day, we hope you'll participate in our audience activity board, filled with prompts related to Summit 2024 themes. Please click on the link in the YouTube chat to access the board anytime during Summit. In addition to some questions relevant to all of Summit, you'll find prompts most relevant for today's sessions. Now, let's kick off day two of Summit with a very special keynote speaker. We're grateful to have the ongoing support of our leadership, and I'm thrilled to welcome Census Bureau Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer, Dr. Ron Jarman, to the virtual stage. Aside from being one of Census Open Innovation Lab's most enthusiastic champions, Dr. Jarman has served at the U.S. Census Bureau since 1992. From both 2017 to 2019 and 2021 to 2022, Ron served as acting director of the agency, leading 2020 decennial census operations. Previously, he led the team for the 2017 Economic Census, served as Associate Director for Economic Programs, Assistant Director for Research and Methodology, and in many other leadership roles. At the end of his remarks, Dr. Jarman will be taking questions from the audience. Please send your questions via the chat throughout his keynote. We're pleased to welcome a longtime COIL friend back to the summit stage. Ron, over to you. Thanks, Haley. And so uh, I, I think my remarks are going to be very much in line with what, uh, let me get the right thing here, uh, in, in line with both Haley and Dominique were just saying. And so 
Um, I'm going to talk about, so can everybody see that? Awesome. So, so, so one thing you should know is I, I give the same talk over and over again. So the beginning of this talk is going to be the same talk I give to other folks, but I tailor it for specific audiences. And I'm going to use the analogy today of the last mile. So thanks to the pandemic and supply chain issues and that sort of stuff, we're all kind of familiar with this last mile problem of, of delivering things to, to the consumer. And so you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute, but let me first back up and just start, sort of put all this in the context of the Census Bureau's broader initiatives to sort of modernize and become a truly 21st century um, statistical organization. And so, you know, why do we need to modernize the Census Bureau and, and other statistical organizations ar around the world? And, and first and foremost, we're, we're faced with uh, continuing challenges. And those challenges are around declining response rates to our surveys and our censuses. It's getting harder and harder to get households and businesses to cooperate and, and supply data. Um, and, and that's leading to, to increased uh, costs of op operations. But we also have a lot of opportunities. Um, so there's there's a something pushing us and there's something pulling us. And the things that are pulling us are just the increased demand for statistical information. So um, what this what this workshop is all about is really the these increased uh, uses of our, our data for, for across a, a broad array of data users. Um, but also, you know, the thing. The other things that are helping that is that you know we're we're much better at computation and modeling, and importantly, there's a there's a proliferation of new source data that we can use to produce the statistical products that our our data users use. So today, I, I think we're we're really going to kind of focus in on this uh, on increasing uh, uses of our our data from sectors that that previously have not been been part of the of the equation. So. When we when we talk about the last mile uh, of the statistical value chain, um, that is how do we deliver the right statistical information at the right time in an actionable format to address data user needs. Okay, so we're good at collecting the data, we're good at processing the data, but what what you know this workshop's about, what how census is trying to improve is trying to get the right information in people's hands when they need it. Okay, not two years after the fact or in some format that's un unusable. So, so that's where, where the analogy of the last mile comes in. And so um, we, we use our, our big dissemination platform, data.census.gov, as, as sort of the primary way of pushing data out from, from our statistical activities. And it's kind of analogous to IKEA, okay? You can use the, this information to, to decorate your house really nice, but you got to drive a long way. You got to you got to sort through this store that's maybe not exactly completely intuitive uh, uh, to to find what you need, and then you got to go home and and build it right. So it's not it's not easy to use. Whereas some things like our economic indicators, you know, like the unemployment rate, or retail sales, or the trade deficit, these things are like little bite sized morsels that come right to you when when you need them. Uh, you get it in the newspaper. It's easy to consume. Okay, so it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. And then in the middle, we got things that we've done a lot of work on over the last few years of of building sort of targeted tools online that help a specific sort of set of data users, like our community resilience estimates or the post secondary uh, uh, employment outcomes, which you know are targeted data products for a particular set of data users. Um, you know, they, they don't have, you know, you do have to work a little bit to, to get the data out. So it's kind of going to Home Depot and, and picking up something uh, that, that's easy to you. So, so that, that use this last mile analogy when we're thinking about, you know, trying to get the right information to people. So uh, again, so what the summit is largely about the, the, this question. Um, but, you know, if, if we if we think about it in terms of, of how the Census Bureau or other statistical organizations work, you know, getting the data to users gets a relatively small amount of, uh, of, of our resources and our attention. And uh, I think you'll see why in, in just a second. But, um, for example, the life cycle cost of the 2020 census was 
you know, fifteen point six billion dollars. I think we spent around fourteen billion, and and th these don't take me to a to an audit on this, but I, I think our dissemination costs were somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred million. Um, so out of fourteen billion that we spent, two hundred million was 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 used to get data to to data users. So you see the sort of the imbalance there. Um, and, and and often the way the way we run, you know, because collecting the data is is sort of the first and foremost thing you need to do, and it's difficult. Um, a lot of our a lot of our concern is is about that part of the of the value chain of statistical information and not and not the back end. And so, you know, the summit like this is is really our, our trying to refocus a little bit in that regard. So, when, when you think about um, you know, wh where places like the Census Bureau are coming from versus where we're going to, um, you know, in the 20th century, when when most of the infrastructure for not only census, but most of the other statistical agencies in the U.S. federal government and in statistical agencies around the world was set up. Um, I'm not at home, so I don't have my coffee today. Um, uh, you know, the federal government was really the dominant user. And um we produced data for uh other government agencies uh for the congress it was really targeted at those federal uses whereas today we still have those federal data users um but we have many many more we have researchers we have local governments we have students um so so i, I think it's you know the number of users and the diversity of their uses has has really mushroomed uh, as compared to say 30, 40 years ago. Um, so also, you know, it, in the mid 20th century and, and uh, you know, even, even in the late, whoops, um, late 20th century, the statistical system was, was a monopoly. Okay. So if you wanted to ha learn about the, the population, you want to learn about the economy, uh, the federal statistical agencies were where, where you got that information from. More and more, as time goes on, there are other organizations that that produce uh, data that sort of fits that fits that role. So there, there's again not only a diversity of users, but now a diversity of producers. Um, so back in the day, uh, we we published the data in in physical books. Those books were were uh, in in federal depository libraries. So if you're if you're kind of an old codger like me, you might remember as an undergrad uh, going to the library and finding the, these books and these you know stacks in the far back of the of the library and opening up and then like photocopying pages to to get to get your data. Um, you know, but when when we first started producing like them electronically, you know, it was largely just an electronic version of the of the books we were publishing. We weren't optimizing the data for for uh, using online. So 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 now increasingly the the data are produced or are are delivered online, or in in some cases where there's security uh, privacy concerns, we we use secure enclaves to allow you know certain folks to be able to get in and look at the data. Um, so so. You know, in the 20th century, source data acquisition, you know, the, the data we get from survey respondents uh, or, or from federal administrative data providers, it was difficult and costly. OK, um, source data are now more abundant um, and, and often uh, relatively economical. So, you know, we're using a lot of uh, administrative data from from companies and 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 from other agencies but also satellite imagery and stuff like that. Th this data is, is, you know, getting easier to get your hands onto. Um, in the 20th century, privacy concerns were, were relatively uh, small. Okay. You, you publish this stuff in books. It, it was hard for people to, um, you know, sort of re-identify uh, respondents in, in, in those publications that th th those risks are much greater with, with greater, more granular, um, you know, more disaggregated data, and then all this other data that's available out there that people can use to sort of re-identify folks. So, so that's that's a problem that's bigger now than it was in the past. Um, in the past, computation was expensive and, and limited, um, and you know, whereas now we can do all all sorts of great stuff. So, 
Um, you know, that, that sort of comparison between that, and I think, helps explain why we are where we are and why we're trying to move in the, in the direction uh, that we're going. So, so that's why we want to flip the focus. Okay. And, and, and what we, what we really need to do is to pay closer attention to how people are using the data and also closer attention to how people may, might use the data in, in ways that they, they aren't new, doing now, but that, that may be really beneficial um, for, for helping, uh, you know, solve problems going forward. So, so what, what we what we call this flipped focus is is statistical product first, and and it really is it's moving away from managing you know our our, our data collection to managing the the statistics that we that we produce. Um, so instead of managing the American Community Survey, we're managing the estimates that come out of the American Community Survey, and it, you know that's not a huge difference, but I think it's an important difference because it puts the data user first. And so when you think about sort of the value chain of, of producing statistical information, we, we, we put this eliciting purpose and use uh, of the data, we put that up at the top. And, and then we say, you know, when, when, when we know what the use is, then we, then we want to leverage all of the data that's relevant to, to that use. Okay. And so I, I like to use the example of, of uh, understanding the income distribution and its evolution in our country uh, a, 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 as sort of the example here. So, so right now we have questions on the American Community Survey, on the Survey of Income and Program Participation, on the Current Population Survey, and we got great administrative data from, from the IRS that, that all cover income in some way. None of them do the job the, the way researchers on on income would want them to okay but they're all done in these silos and so leveraging all the data means well how would i use all that information um, to produce better estimates and and then how would i then if you go down to the next box identify the gaps that i might need to change the way i measure things so that i can do a better job and then you know then we we inform new data acquisition and stewardship and and then we disseminate the product so so you can kind of see where instead of, you know, right, right now, I think we're, we're, we're sort of, um, you know, the the legacy we brought with us from the 20th century was really the taking care of the hardest thing first, which was collecting the data. Okay. Now I think the hardest thing is, is making sure you get the right data uh, uh, to this greater diversity of, of data users. So, so a, a concrete example here um, uh, would be the work that we've done uh, with the IRS um, on trying to understand um, you know, equity issues around uh, you know, payments in, dur during the, the pandemic and what. So, so what they want, what the IRS has is all the data on, you know, tax information and then the payments that were made to, to, to taxpayers during the pandemic. Um, but what they don't have is is demographic information about taxpayers. So you all know when you fill out your tax form, you're you're not uh, s saying your your age or your your uh, your race or ethnicity or any things like that. But and then the Census Bureau has very good data on that. You know that we collect from the Census, from the American Community Survey, um, and and from some other administrative records. And so, is there is there a way that that we can marry these two things together? Well, there's obviously there's there's big concerns about uh, you know Title 13 census data being being used for uh, uh, law enforcement or non-statistical purposes, and so 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 what we did was we really sat down and and kind of thought about the problem and, and found creative ways that that we could. Um, it's easier for the IRS to share information with us than it is us to share information with the IRS. So, so IRS provided us some data. We estimated some models. Uh, and then the parameters of which, from those models, the IRS was then able to have estimates of, of the demographics of, of, of taxpayers that kind of understand these equity issues. So th this is where you're, you know, you're identifying the gaps. You're using all of the data uh, to 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 solve a problem. Um, and then, you know, maybe we learn something from this that then, that then has other 
uh, impacts for how both census and IRS, uh, you know, gather and curate the data that, that we each have. So again, it's really about trying to understand what the needs are and finding ways of, of using either existing data or, or data that we need to go out and acquire um, uh, to solve these problems. And so um, you know, this is just like a little colorful wheel of the huge diversity uh, of data stakeholders that, that the Census Bureau and other agencies like us, like us have. Um, again, all of this is still guided by the need to adhere to uh, you know, the legal and, and framework and data governance that we have that, that ensures that the, the source data that we get, whether it comes from censuses or surveys or whether it comes from government administrative records or, or whether it comes from private sector organizations is being used as it was intended for statistical purposes without uh, violating any confidentiality or privacy uh, uh, rules. So, so just, you know, let, let me end with a, with a couple of the examples of, of work that's going on that's sort of, you know, using the statistical product first uh, approach. And, and so, you know, we look for some low hanging fruit. Um, and, and in this case, the, with grant applications, you know, a lot of people, you know, especially um, uh, folks working in, in local areas and stuff like that are trying to get a, get a federal grant uh, or a grant from a, from a granting uh, uh, organization have to fill out some information and and they so they have to go on again on data.census.gov and and find the information for their their locality there these are not expert data users um so can we can we find a way to make this easier for them build a build a tool uh, that that helps you know populate the information that they need they need to get and then and then one of the other uh, efforts that we're using is, is really trying to um think about uh, American Indian and Alaska Native information fr from from the perspective of uh, uh, those communities first. Um, you know, so right now, uh, this you know AIAN is just a, is a classification we use um, when we collect data more generally. But you know, we're not really thinking first about about how to produce data for for those communities, and so kind of tipping this on on its head and and thinking about well, what would we do? If, if we were just trying to solve the, the data needs for, for these communities. So again, thank you. Uh, oh, uh, oh, wait, one, one last thing, and this is just to kind of put something in people's head, is you know, how, can, can, how can AI help us here, especially uh, scaling these things? And so um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is to make our data more more legible to to uh, large language models and other uh, AI ML tools out there to so that people can can use those tools to query our data, but in a way that they get a good authoritative uh, answer back. I don't know if you guys there is actually a census GPT. If you try to use it, it doesn't work very well. So you know, can can we actually solve solve that problem as as a way to really make it easier for people? Uh, to to use our data. So with that, uh, uh, thank you, H Haley. I, I guess I'll take any questions that might have before we have to move on. Yeah, thanks so much, Ron. I have to just jump in and say how much I loved the store analogy that you made with Home Depot and Ikea and Amazon. Um, I think that digests really well with a lot of varying, um, you know, capabilities of data users. Um, so just a couple of questions. Um, and again, thanks for all of those remarks. I think actually kind of segueing a little bit from just your last point about the evolution of AI um, and kind of the evolution of a lot of things that are happening with tech nowadays. How do you think that top participants um, can really help with this statistical products first approach, the top methodology, the participants, those from, you know, industry that we partner with? Uh, right. We'd love to hear more on that. Well, I, th I think there's a couple ways. So first of all, is just helping us understand uh, e even more than we already do the the full universe and diversity of of our of how people are using our data. Um, and so the more that we understand that, because because we do need to we we need to know that for how we collect and process the data as well, not just how we disseminate it. So it's. So the last mile is important to solve the last mile thing, but you still have to decide what's getting delivered through the last mile. And so I think 
you know, better understanding of how folks use the data is is critical. Okay. The other thing is, as as top participants in particular are kind of a nice middle ground between a sort of the end user, a person who needs to make a decision um, with 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 some data, and, and a statistical agency. Okay, and so uh, the. These are folks that have a lot of technical capabilities, a, a lot of creativity. Um, and, and so I think that there's there's always going to be a role for this kind of part of the of the value chain, if you will. That that's not a formal part of the statistical agency. It's not a formal part of the end user. It's somebody who helps um, as a connective tissue between somebody who needs needs some information to to take some action, make a decision, and and you know the the just the wealth of data that's out there that might be able to address that question. Um, so, so I think there's kind of that dual role right there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this question also might just kind of expand upon those, um, you know, kind of dual roles. Uh, we spoke to the audience about Stat Ventures yesterday, which launched mm -hmm. this past year, um, which I know you know all about, and of course, love that work. Um, in the same vein, how do you think that stat ventures and the role of kind of working with those outside government to kind of solicit these ideas can contribute to improving the data quality for all of census's data users? Right. So so I, so I'll, the the two things I just mentioned that that counts. Um, and then maybe I'll, I'll add another. And, and that is if, if you go back to my little circular chart where I said use all the data. Um, I, I think it, it's critical that we bring uh, data that might not come from the statistical system, that might not come from a government organization, um, but it could come through some path where may, maybe there's there's data that gets mashed up, but by but by a credible um, source, right? So. You know, one of the concerns that that we have within the statistical community, especially as it as it relates to things like measures of the economy and stuff like that, is is to the to the extent that private sector organizations are now starting to produce things that look a lot like, say, the unemployment rate or the jobs numbers or something like that. You know, wh where where does the public get its um, the public needs to trust a data provider if if you're going to be producing something that's of general interest, right? And so, you know, the census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics have a certain amount of trust when we when we do surveys and produce the unemployment rate. But, you know, ADP, even if they're working with some academics, um, might be viewed by the public as as less trustworthy. And so I think, you know, the types of folks that we've been working with with Stat Ventures might play a, a role in there of this of adding some veracity um, you know, people need to trust the information, you know, not just the, the statistic that's being produced, but the whole chain of how it was produced. And so I think that that the, the more we can have a lot of, um, you know, experts who have the public's trust involved in this enterprise and they're coming at it from different ex, uh, directions and coming up with similar results, then I, I think that that would be that that would be beneficial to the public and being able to understand quantitative information is kind of more generally so yeah excellent um well we had to only just about enough time for those two questions but we are working on some creative ways to make sure that everyone that's tuning in today can still engage with all the speakers so we'll probably come back to you to pick your brain for more um but thank you so much again for your remarks today um, all of this information, all of this collaboration, and just these ideas of breaking down silos has been fantastic. So thank you so much again for joining us. Awesome. And, and thank you for having me. I apologize. I, I can't stay. First, I got to do a retirement <laughs> function, and then I, I got to go to downtown Commerce and chair a boring meeting. So uh, oh, good luck with your travels but, around DC but, today. But, but you guys have a good uh, rest of the summit. Thanks. Bye. Thank you again, Ron, for joining us. You always give us a lot to think about and spur great discussions. I'm Alexandra Barker, Innovation Advisor and Head of Staff Ventures at Census Open Innovation Labs. Now I'm thrilled to announce a very special guest. 
Yesterday, we heard from dozens of entrepreneurs and investors speaking about our day one theme of financial inclusion, economic growth, and supporting businesses nationwide. To pull all those topics together, we are honored to feature someone who has lived the entrepreneurial journey, giving back to the nation and share advice with millions. We are honored to welcome to the virtual stage, Damon John, CEO and founder of FUBU and the Shark Group, Shark Group, Presidential Ambassador for Global Entrepreneurship during the Obama administration and television personality from ABC Shark Tank. Damon John is an entrepreneur, business leader, and a public figure who has built widely recognized global businesses, including FUBU, from the ground up. His incredible journey led him to be one of the most influential people in the venture ecosystem and to be called up for public service by former President Obama. We hope Mr. John Remarks will inspire all the viewers and leave you with practical knowledge to kickstart or advance your entrepreneurial journey, whether in the private sector or in government. Damon, we are grateful to have you address our audience today. Over to you. What's up? It is the People Shark here, Damon John, and I would love to first of all acknowledge Drew and Alexandra of the Census Open Innovation Labs team at the United States Department of Commerce for the invitation to speak at the Census Open Innovation Summit. Now, let me tell you why I became a presidential ambassador of global entrepreneurship. It's because entrepreneurship is key in this country and it is the American dream. It affords us freedom. Freedom to change lives, of course ours, but more importantly, freedom to change everybody else's life. Freedom to employ people, put money back in the communities that we are from. Freedom to mentor people. It fosters innovation, it creates change, and it is the true foundation of why this country is so great. Being an entrepreneur is a lot of responsibility. Being an entrepreneur often is very, very lonely, very tough. And that's why we need people who support these programs because being an entrepreneur is also game changing. Being an entrepreneur crosses all social boundaries. It doesn't care about your race, your color, your creed, your gender, sexual preference, or anything else. All it cares about is the fact that you will get up before everybody, go to sleep after everybody, and you will make sure you will be of service to everybody else out there because no matter what, your customer is first. However, to be an entrepreneur, not only about passion, it is about knowing your numbers. It is about falling and keep getting up. It is about failing and failing fast. It is about overcoming all the adversities because as an entrepreneur, if everybody understood what you were doing, well, now all of a sudden you got the lowest common denominator. People will doubt you when you walk into the room because you're an innovator, because you're somebody that sees something that they don't see, because you're somebody who's trying to solve problems. And so as you walk down this journey and have all these amazing people around you and surrounding you to give you this energy, excitement, and education of the things that they have seen in the past, take full advantage of it. OPM is not always other people's money. It's other people's mind power, manpower, manufacturing, marketing, mentorship. And of course, you're here to fix other people's mistakes. So welcome to this amazing journey of entrepreneurship. Thank you so much for what you are doing. And I promise you, I will see you all at the top. Thank you so much. Peace. A huge thanks again to Damon John and his amazing team for that message. Thank you to Mr. John for giving back to the nation as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship and more. We are grateful that he was willing to share a message with the viewers today, and we hope everyone is feeling inspired for another day of innovation. Now let's dive into the rest of day two. Here's a preview of what we have in store today. We'll start with a discussion with the tech teams from our top sprint on improving data access for local policymakers. Then we'll turn to a discussion with a product advisor and user advocates from the sprint on why this issue persists year after year. Next, we'll dive straight into a session on data quality in Puerto Rico, where we'll hear back from the tech teams across two different 2023 top sprints, including tracking federal funding impact and reducing the literacy gap in Puerto Rico households, followed by a fireside chat with Puerto Rico data experts. At 2.30 p.m. Eastern, we'll host a Summit First, a friendly debate on a hot topic. Is government getting better at customer experience? Then we'll all get a chance to be inspired by the tremendous work accomplished in this year's top university sprints, followed by a deep dive discussion on tribal data sovereignty, featuring U.S. Treasurer Chief Lynn Malerba and other leaders in the tribal data space. 
Don't miss our closing keynote from Census Bureau Director Rob Santos, who will send us off with an inspiring message for the year of innovation ahead. Well, please also post your questions for us in the YouTube chat. For some sessions, your answer, your questions may be answered live. Don't forget to post what you're learning on social media using hashtag Coil Summit 2024 and hashtag Opportunity Project and tag at US Census Bureau. All right, let's get started with our next session. Over to you, Haley. Great, welcome to our next session where we'll showcase the results of a sprint on improving access to data for local policymakers, led by the Office of the Undersecretary for Economic Affairs at the Department of Commerce. Here's a bit of background on this challenge. Local decision makers need high quality data and easily understandable analysis about the places they live to help them make the best decisions about how to serve their communities. This is often described as data-driven decision-making. While both data and analysis about places in the U.S. exist, they are scattered across government websites in different forms and at different le levels of geography. Many communities lack the resources to hire or train professionals to find and use this information. As a result, access to free and user-friendly digital tools that combine data sets about local and regional economies could help more places adopt data-driven decision-making and ultimately help to reduce systemic barriers to economic development that have persisted across generations. Five tech teams and 14 user advocates joined the Department of Commerce to tackle this challenge, resulting in products that they believe can change the outlook of communities struggling to use data today. I'm pleased to welcome these teams to hear about why they decided to engage in the sprint, as well as the amazing products they built. Before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out to Rohan Sandhu, one of the sprints, sprints leaders from Harvard Kennedy School's Reimagining the Economy program, where he serves as co-founder and executive director. Rohan was one of the sprint leaders who helped bring this effort to life and guided teams along the way. Unfortunately, he's out of the country today and couldn't join Summit, but we wanted to step in to thank you, Rohan, for your leadership and look forward to collaborating again. Now I'll pass the mic over to another one of the Sprint leaders, Maria Messick, who currently serves as a senior policy advisor for the White House National Economic Council. Throughout 2023, Maria led this Sprint in her previous role of senior advisor at Commerce. After Maria leads the tech team discussion, stick around to hear from a product advisor and two user advocates from this Sprint on why they think this issue persists year after year. Now let's go ahead and hear from the teams. Hi, thanks Haley so much for the introduction. Everyone, I'm Maria Messick. I was one of the sprint leaders for the Improving Data Access for Local Policymakers top sprint um, as part of my role leading the Commerce Regional Economic Research Initiative. I'm really excited about this sprint because it brings together a lot of amazing uh, technologists with many policymakers and users across the country to develop better data access for people really in need of understanding how their local and regional economies work, both from a day-to-day -day functioning purpose, but where they're going to go over time as they rebuild many of their economies after both the COVID-19 crisis, but in terms of many other disruptions over the last several years. So with that, I'm really excited to welcome all of our great technology participants and leads for this year's sprint. We have Rhea from basis.ai. We have Steven from My Sidewalk. We have Austin from Civic Roundtable, David from Esri, and Allison from Argonne National Laboratory. So I'm going to go around and ask each of these uh, sprint leaders um, and technology leaders for um, their opinions on several key parts of this sprint and to help us understand a little bit more about what motivated them to join and build these great tools. So my first question is, you know, what did make you interested in joining this sprint, especially around the topic we have today, which is improving data access for local policymakers? So I'm going to start with Stephen from my sidewalk. Thanks so much, Maria. Uh, it's great to be participating in this sprint. It's actually the third time that we've done this, and uh, we love uh, this work. We think it's really important, so it's great to be back. Uh, personally, uh, I spent a decade as a city planner, so I've seen firsthand how much better we can all be when we use data for policymaking and to guide those big decisions, rather than just making it up as we go. So I also know that the barrier to finding the right data at the right time and then knowing what to do with it is just too high. 
Uh, that's why we started my sidewalk to try to tackle that challenge uh, to really lower the barrier to using data in communities across the country. And because of that, we couldn't have asked for a better opportunity for us to hone that approach than to be participating in this sprint. And we're just really delighted to be here. Great, thank you. We're very excited to have you. Uh, Austin from Civic Roundtable. Thanks, Maria. Um, so mission was the first reason we were so excited to be a part of this sprint. Um, as Stephen mentioned, um, big kind of um, through line through this group, I can imagine, is building technology that better serves government agencies and the organizations they work with. And that's what Civic Roundtable is all about. Um, we're building a collaboration platform for state, local, and federal agencies. And the idea of, as Stephen said, lowering the barrier to entry and access to better understand the information, the data, the resources that agencies are putting out into the world um, is really what we are trying to do. Uh, and that was the first reason. The second reason was all about the people. Um, and that's not just you know the end users and the advocates on the local side, but also the folks in the Zoom room. Um, government technologists uh, are not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but I really enjoyed working this, with this group and getting to know um, other folks in the room, um, because unlike Stephen, this is our first year in the sprint, um, so we're rookies, and we learned a lot from being a part of this community and um, learning from the end users, advocates, and, and other partners as well. Great. Thank you. Rhea? Yeah, thanks so much, Maria. This has been an amazing experience for us. Um, like Austin, uh, I'm part of an organization that's very new um, and very new to kind of the urban planning space as well. Uh, BASIS is an applied AI research uh, nonprofit. So we have a lot of background in you know math, statistics, computer science, but for a long time, we really wanted to apply the kind of AI research that we're doing to problems of societal importance, including in urban planning and policymaking. Um, but before we discovered the top sprint, we were kind of just like sending cold emails out to people and hoping that they would respond. And they were responding enthusiastically to our efforts, which was nice. But through the top sprint, we kind of just got immediate access to this network of people who were really just very enthusiastic about working with us to identify the problems that we could help them solve. And basically, like without without the top sprint, we would be much farther behind in this kind of mission um, of, of our company. So it's been a super awesome experience for us. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. And um, now I will go to David, who is not a rookie in this process, but um, I know you are new to this specific topic area, so I would love to hear from you. Yeah, and thank you, Maria. Um, uh, my name is, again, uh, David Sollenberger. I'm an account manager. I've uh, been with Esri for 18 years, so I've been around the block uh, a few times. And those who aren't familiar with Esri, we're actually the second largest privately owned uh, software company in America. Next is actually our 55th year uh, in business. And what made us interested in this project uh, specifically was uh, when, when I read the TOPS descriptions, the need for geographic analysis uh, to solve the problem. And uh, Esri's been using maps and geography uh, analysis to better understand communities, using authoritative data to make better decisions, like I said, for uh, over 55 years. And specifically the need to make the data easily accessible to community leaders and end users in one application at a chosen geography in an intuitive matter. It's kind of in our DNA to, uh, these are the types of problems that, that we solve. And uh, as, as many folks know, government needs to make data accessible and usable. And um, data many times is accessible, um, but making it usable for those non-technical end users was really the part that we focused on uh, providing maps and reports uh, allows e uh, data to be easily combined uh, at the local level. And we've done this uh, for many other federal agencies and other applications. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah, totally agree. Usability is the key outcome we're hoping to drive with so much of our data. Um, as you all know, it lives in lots of different pockets. So you can, as you said, access it, but not necessarily get the insights you want. Uh, so with that, Allison, I uh, would love to hear from you. Yeah, I like the um, I like the metaphor of pockets of data because I can rarely find my keys through pockets. And I feel like that's a really common experience with a lot of the users that we talked about. Um, for us here at Argonne, we started uh, the National Economic Research and Resilience Center a few years back in collaboration with the Economic Development Administration. And we're in the process of 
rebuilding our suite of tools. Um, we have the National Economic Resilience Data Explorer or the NERDY tool now as alongside the uh, Economic Development Capacity Index. And we were in the middle of this relaunch and learned about the top sprint and it was just perfect timing for us to really be intentional about the users that we were developing for similar to steven i come from a background of kind of local policy on the ground work and so it's great to uh talk to people to remind ourselves on the technical side that these are really human experiences that technology should tailor to not the other way around um, it was a great experience for us to be able to talk to everybody on the call um, about the difficulties of building human-centered technical projects with federal data that isn't always human accessible, human knowledgeable, uh, and really transforming the narrative to empower local uh, policymakers as, as we can. Great. Thank you all for sharing that. And as I mentioned at the top, I feel very lucky to have had you all in this process and just have that energy and excitement throughout. Um, I'd love to hear now about the tools you actually built uh, and explaining sort of, you know, who their intended end users are, what is the particularly like game changing nature of the product that you developed. So I'm going to start with um, Austin. You said you're uh, a rookie to this process, so I'd love to hear how you're uh, changing the game with your new tool. Happy to share. Um, so like Steven and Allison, um, I'm also coming from government background, uh, worked um, locally at the state level as well as the federal level, and consistently felt the pain of looking through um, pages and pages of resources and lines and lines of code or, or databases to find what I was looking for. Um, and even after I found what I was looking for, um, even harder to find the right group of people to hash it out with because it's in rooms like these where you can really actually get to um, the insight or the aha moment from the information and data that you're ingesting. Um, so after spending the sprint working alongside state departments of commerce, economic development associations, and data providers, um, we came to identify that the core challenge is not finding data sets, but knowing where to start once you actually have them. Um, so the sort of aha moment in, in the tool that we built off of that collaboration platform that's core to Civic Roundtable was translating federal data into insightful analysis where practical decision makers could actually discuss the practical decisions they were making. Um, so what we created is a collaboration space, not just for local policymakers, but also data providers and digital tool creators to access a library of their projects, um, as well as technical assistance for quick questions, um, not just from the technical assistance providers, but also from their peers in the field. The primary goal we had in mind was really just to save time, um, cut down on the amount of minutes or likely hours it takes to translate data into insights and really create a one-stop shop in which they are able to use data sets, not in a vacuum, but really in practice. Um, because um, as you know, Allison said best, um, technology really should be tailored to the needs of those communities and users as opposed to the other way around. Great, thanks so much. Um, Rhea, I know you all focused on the analysis components um, that Austin is trying to sort of drive additional work to with Civic Roundtable's tool. Will you talk about your tool? Yeah, of course. So um, at Basis, we built a tool called Polis, which is a word that means city-state in ancient Greek. Um, and basically, it's a tool that allows users to compute how similar a jurisdiction is to other jurisdictions based on customizable metrics. And then it further combines that similarity analysis uh, with historical policy intervention data in order to automatically compute the likelihood that a particular policy that was effective in achieving some outcome in one jurisdiction will transfer over to another jurisdiction with similar char characteristics. So our kind of intended use case was that if there is a local elected official or a local policymaker that's interested in achieving some kind of outcome in their community, uh, they can use our tool to identify other communities similar to theirs that uh, are kind of, that have managed to achieve this desirable outcome and then use that information to figure out, oh, maybe the same policy intervention that they applied could also be useful to us. Um, so this was a really exciting project because uh, it was really, it really took advantage of kind of the research that we've been building for a few years at BASIS, which is focused on causal inference. And what I think is most exciting about this tool is that 
a lot of the times like this kind of research ends up being siloed in academic papers and doesn't really end up becoming integrated into tools that are actually useful for people on the ground who are using or who need that kind of information to make really important decisions that affect a lot of people. So we kind of view the product as unique in the way that it's bridging academia and practical applications. Um, and this is kind of an intersection that we both hope to explore more within like our company, um, but also would be really excited to see uh, kind of more organizations like ours, like take on this, this kind of space. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Both an awesome tool and a very cool name. Um, David, I'm going to go to you next to hear a little bit more. I know you said maps are Esri's bread and butter, but we'd love to hear about the map and anything else you have developed through this process. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, we went back and forth. Uh, I like to think we came up with a cool name too, but we we came up with EDGE. We had about 10 different names, but uh, it stands for the Economic Development and Geographic Explorer, go, keeping with the map thing there. Uh, and we focused on you know what the TOPS project want and what our user advocates wanted. It's a freely open and publicly available web application that empowers, again, those non-technical users to easily find answers to their economic questions. Uh, they'll be able to analyze, visualize federal data sets uh, through data-driven deliverables, such as intuitive maps uh, and reports. Uh, and again, the web application uh, will help those end users meeting their initiatives of attracting new business. Uh, so to kind of understanding what assets do they have, um, what, what uh, industries should they be going after, um, while also contributing to driving uh, equitable, resilient, and place-based economic uh, decisions. Uh, the intended, in terms of the intended users, the web application has been designed again for the non-technical uh, user who works in local policy roles to leverage uh, in support of uh, answering those economic development-related questions. Uh, the types of personas that would be engaging with this application um, may be split into three different goes. Those um, of which include economic professionals, those working on grant applications, but also policymakers. And uh, what's game changing about it, um, the, the, the application unlocks a wealth of publicly av available federal data in one place so they don't have to scour the internet uh, while also incorporating the power of what we call location intelligence, ultimately enabling, enabling end users to ever, effortlessly overlay uh, a selection of diverse federal data sets and transform them into compelling uh, interactive visualizations. Fantastic. I should say I'm a huge map fan myself, and I find so many people love to sort of zoom in on where they're from, uh, what are the places that they recognize, and having that overlay of data, I think, will be incredibly valuable for all of those users you mentioned. Uh, so thank you. Allison, I'm going to go to you next, and I think you mentioned your nerdy tool, so we're excited to get nerdy with you and hear more about it. So nerdy. I think so. A good transition between David and I, I think we had a very similar mission, right? Make sure that all users are invited to the nerdy suite of tools. While the nerdy environment was initially built as kind of a recovery tool from COVID, looking at impacts to local economies, we wanted to expand the horizons. I am a statistician by training, but worked in local government office for a while. And so I often, I love numbers. I could look at numbers all day long and, and be so happy, but working under a time crunch, working under the fact that you've got five jobs and not enough time and not enough energy and not enough people was really our battle cry as we put the updates to Nerdy together. Um, so really thinking about the suite of technological capacity technological ability within a single person even, right? Is it morning you who is on the top of their game or is it afternoon you who needs a cup of coffee and would like to go home? Um, we did this by starting with a My Community Report, which is kind of a, a two-page document 
that was modeled after, after some exemplary comprehensive economic development strategy annual updates. So using users as our baseline to keep our products um, user-centric. These quick reports give snapshots of the community so that you can quickly view trends or engage with the local community at large, print it out, send it to your board. For a deeper dive into that community data, we updated many of the fields that we have now in the Nerdy Suite, but with kind of a special twist. Um, we initially were Tableau-based and we transferred all of those graphics, all the visualizations to a much more interactive and kind of user-focused space. That data environment is centered more on kind of the mid-level user. You've got a lot of questions. You'd like to look into equity. You'd like to look into labor market trends over time. This is where you can start to ask those questions and really dive in geographically. This is another thing that I applaud Esri for all the time. I love maps too. Um, something that we saw as a common struggle was users wanted to select tracks. They wanted to select their own geography in a more flexible way. And we really heard that loud and clear as we put the, the updates to the nerdy together. And then the last piece is really tailoring to the, the statistician in you who's on their lunch break and just wants to code for a little bit. So all of our um, data that's hosted within the Nerdy is also accessible via API. So similar to, to the other products on deck, there's no more wading through these lists and lists and lists and lists of federal data. It's not going to data.census.gov and BEA and BLS. It's come to us. We already cleaned it. We have it for you call our API and kind of take the, the worry off of your shoulders for just a minute. Um, we're also really hoping that the nerdy suite as it stands now with the data visualization tool, opportunity explorers, research hubs, creates kind of a dialogue, creates a space where people can come to our center at the lab as a resource for their local office to do some local economic impact analysis and, and better inform our research overall. Thanks so much, Allison. That was great. Um, Steven, we're excited to hear about my sidewalk, uh, last but definitely not least. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an exciting time to be just doing the work that we're doing. It's so fun to, it's been so fun to follow along all these with all of these projects. I think just because we have done this a couple of times, the speed to impact has really changed. And uh, it's just been fantastic to see everybody's projects take shape. And it's certainly informed the way that we think about solving problems in our shop too. Uh, so we built a tool that we're calling Sidekick. If it's an acronym, it's too long of an acronym. Uh, so I don't think that it is. Uh, with Sidekick, we set out to do two things, uh, to raise the ceiling for data experts and to lower the floor for accessing data insights. Um, you can kind of think of it as data.gov attached to an LLM with a dash of the ability to create visuals and community information uh, on the fly. So we, we think it's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty young. It's, uh, I was playing around with it at 6.30 this morning. It was better than it was yesterday. So that, that's a, a very good sign. Uh, Sidekick finds the right data when you need it. It makes creating maps and data visualizations a snap. And it makes things like writing a grant or building a program or even looking at where to invest a much, much simpler task. And that's the thing that we think is so transformative about it is that you don't actually have to know how to navigate a technology platform or a federal website to use it. You can just use your own language to ask questions and to get accurate, helpful answers on demand out the other side. So we couldn't be more excited to share it. Uh, we think that it will change the way not just local policymakers, but all of us make community data useful. And uh, we're hoping to get as many people on the platform as possible. So uh, we'll share our we'll share contact information in a minute here. <laughs> Great. Well, I should say I think this is our chance to um, share a little bit about you know. One, what did your team value from the collaborative nature, especially with you know the teams here, but also the many users and user advocates that took their time over the past few months to help give you all insights. Um, and sort of, again, any calls to action that each of you have for the audience with us today, in particular, as you think about you know your answer for the collaborative nature of this sprint, I would love to hear like maybe one 
thing that you heard from a user that really transformed how you thought about your product and its development. I think that like tangibility um, will help people sort of really understand how this came to life. So um, Stephen, I'm actually going to stick on you if you don't mind and to hear a little bit more about that. The user advocates that we got matched up with were fantastic. They had such a big impact on our development. I mean, everybody in this cohort was great, but but that was really transformative for us. One in particular is even a customer now, so that worked out uh, quite well. The the one of the, the transformative thing for us, one thing that we really learned was we were kind of aiming this tool certainly at policymakers, but we weren't as acutely focused on small not-for-profits that really do the, the groundwork uh, at the local level for that kind of policy change. And so that shift happened in our user advocate conversations and really thinking about the use case of grant applications too and the importance of federal data in those applications is something that we learned from our advocate. That's great. And yes, please drop your contact information and tool link in, and I will um, go to David next to tell us about how this sprint was really transformative for you and anything you have for the audience today. Sure. I only had a few simple things. Uh, I guess uh, having done many different projects like this over the years, I first just like to say the, the structure of the project had all the ingredients for success. So, so uh, set up by the commerce team. So I'd first like to say that, but also uh, working collaboratively with the user advocates, um, we are able to leverage all of our individual strengths and expertise. Like we know, you know, mapping analysis uh, uh, really well, but also there is a lot we don't know about economic development and how does a, a local policymaker think. So uh, leveraging everybody's strengths was um, and, and also everybody willing to, cause everybody has other jobs that they do. That was really valuable. Um, and just the opportunity for knowledge sharing, um, and also just the overall collaborative nature and structure of the project, uh, helped enhance, um, the, you know, the outcome and, uh, and we hope to continue to, to improve it. Um, and I guess lastly, um, you know, I, the only call to action that I have is, you know, I, I encourage folks to go to the edge application. There's actually a tab in the application to provide feedback, uh, which I, I personally would love to, to hear. Um, and do, don't hesitate to contact uh, Esri if you have any questions. My, uh, my name, you can just contact me at dsollenberger at esri.com. Um, and, and letting folks know this can be reconfigured, re, uh, you know, repurposed in many other different ways. So um, always happy to have those conversations, and that's what that's what I'm here for. Great, thank you, um, Allison. I'll turn it to you next. I think um, first and foremost, I really liked the top sprint because it was so fast. Uh, it kept us on some deadlines that I don't think we would have made otherwise, which was really exciting. We had a pretty accelerated timeline internally, but having you all to hold us accountable was actually really important for our development. And in addition to that accountability, having the, the conversations with user advocates about not just being another data dashboard. The world is full of data dashboards. And one of my biggest fears was to just create another one. Um, I think I'd like to especially shout out Brookings and the National Association of Development Organizations for really helping us to voice their frustrations about the dashboard environments and help us to be really intentional about not falling into those pitfalls. I think a lot of the, the most common um, errors are made because they're easy. Um, and when you have someone coming to you and saying, please don't do this, don't create another data dashboard that puts these together. It was just, I loved it. I absolutely adore those kinds of conversations that are kind of built on this frustration. So um, both personally and kind of professionally speaking for the nerdy environment itself, I think it was really helpful for us to work alongside you all, especially for kind of informing some of our research. We think about economic development day in and day out from the data side to program evaluation to research at its baseline. And so having conversations with basis.ai, thinking about machine learning, think about thinking about large language models was really 
exciting as we put together not only this suite of data tools, but also potential research for the future. Great, thank you, Allison. Uh, Rhea, I'll have you go next. Yeah, so I think similar to, or actually kind of different from everyone else, uh, I think unlike everyone else, uh, basis, we didn't have anything, we didn't have any existing platform, any website, like related to urban planning, like policy making, applying our research to that beforehand. We kind of just really started from scratch. And since we, our expertise is in causal inference, I'll say that in the counterfactual scenario that I hadn't stumbled upon the top website, like four months ago, I would say that we still would have nothing now. And that's just like the kinds of causal analyses that we're very capable of doing. But basically the user advocates, the other tech teams, all of them have just provided so much useful insight to us as we've kind of entered this process. I think if we kind of started with this problem statement and didn't have all of these collaborators, we probably would have produced a tool that did really cool things, but would not have been accessible to the kind of target audience that we cared about just because we're a bunch of scientists who write like really fancy papers with really big words and that's not going to work you know like if you really want to get something that people use and find easy to use and you know it doesn't require reading a bunch of math in order to understand so I think that's probably the most uh, kind of beneficial thing that we've gained from talking to all of the user advocates just learning about how to make something like UX friendly like learning about like what uh, this audience really needs and yeah I think it's been a really fun experience for me I think personally, just to go from like the research mindset to this kind of UX UI, um, like useful product development mindset. Um, so for that, I'm super, super grateful to the top, the top experience. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. And so excited you guys decided to choose this problem statement to work on. Um, Austin, I'll have you close us out with your um, sort of insights about the process, call to action for anyone on this. Um, go for it. Sure. Um, I think the the biggest insight for us throughout this process was understanding the diversity of perspectives that exist among local policymakers and even economic development practitioners in the field. Uh, Civic Roundtable is not only dedicated to serving folks in this arena, but also election officials and homelessness service providers. And the idea of understanding how the challenges of interpreting information and data among different groups that are tackling similar challenges in different places, I think really resonated in that as a public servant, you've got, you know, more in common with other public servants than you, um, than you don't. Um, and I think that translates to the coordination challenge that we've seen emerge, not just within the user advocates we talk to here, but the folks that we're serving in, in other arenas too. Um, what that's translated to in terms of how we're looking to build on the top sprint is actually getting to learn from um, user groups, for example, like the state data centers out of um, the data dissemination um, group at, at Census, as well as um, the data user group um, over at IRS. Um, so the call to action for us is really just getting to hear from folks that have either found their community and their tribe in the form of these state data center groups or these data user groups. Um, and those that feel maybe a bit isolated or underserved. Um, I think that's where we're really looking to move the needle in terms of making sure that not just those well-resourced jurisdictions or well-connected cohorts have access to the support that organizations like um, the EDA and Commerce more broadly provide to constituents. And um, it's really hearing those voices that first we get a lot of energy out of, but also a lot of really important insight and feedback on how we're building technology um, really for all public servants as opposed to just a few. Fantastic. That's a great way to end. Uh, I think, you know, getting to hear from all different people of all shapes and sizes really make sure we can have tools that work for everyone. And I think you all have done an amazing job trying to hear from various uh, points of view to help build your tools. So I just want to say thank you for being part of this process. I'm so excited about all of your tools and I'm so excited for the users that get a chance to benefit from them. Uh, so great to have you all here. Uh, looking forward to more. Haley, I think we are done. Thank you, Maria, and to all of the teams that participated in this important sprint. I'm excited now to transition into the second half of this session, where we will hear from a few of our longtime collaborators on why we think data access for local policymakers persists year after year as a large scale challenge. Moderating this discussion is Brian Lane, Assistant Director for Business Intelligence at the FDIC. 
but here today is a longtime collaborator with Top who helped to launch the product advisor role back in 2018. He was the product advisor this year for the Basis AI in this sprint. David Park is the director of data and business analysis at the National League of Cities. He was a user advocate in this sprint and has been involved in Top over the past few years. NLC has also been leading a sprint on community social cohesion. You can catch a workshop on that sprint Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Finally, we are joined by Maria Filippelli, who is data director at Southern Economic Advancement Project, SEEP. In this role, she helps communities secure and advocate for funding and is now in her fourth year of collaborating with TOP. Brian, I'm pleased to hand the virtual microphone over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Haley, for that introduction. Um, Maria and David, I'm very excited to have you here to talk about um, this very exciting, uh, very exciting topic on what's going wrong and right with data access for local leaders. But before we jump into that topic, why don't you just take a few minutes and uh, tell me a little bit about your role in the Sprint and how you work with communities to, uh, to use data. I can kick us off. Um, so thanks, Brian, and thanks, Haley, for that intro. Uh, I'm Maria Filippelli, Data Director for the Southern Economic Advancement Project, or SEEP for short. Uh, so SEEP works across um, three different issue areas, environmental justice, healthcare access, and economic security. And we do that across 12 Southern states. Um, and so we use data in a number of different ways. Uh, and one of them has been to really look at federal funding opportunities. Uh, so uh, it, during the pandemic, we uh, helped a lot of communities um, understand uses for the state and local fiscal recovery funds. So that was a program where federal funding was going directly to local communities. And so a lot of local communities, especially smaller ones like the ones we work with, communities under 100,000 or even under 50,000 people, um, they don't have data directors, they don't necessarily have even have full time staff so they needed a lot of support and technical assistance. Um, and we're gearing up to do that again uh, with the EPA Community Change Grant, which is one of the bipartisan infrastructure law programs. Um, so data is needed for a number of different reasons. Uh, it's needed for for grant uh, applications to understand to be able to talk about your community and talk about why your community is competitive for a grant, um, to understand the grant programs and how effective they are, to uh, create communities of practice and talk to your peer, um, your peer governments, your your peer counties or cities, and to really know how they're accessing and using and evaluating those funds. So that's why I was super excited to be a user advocate on this sprint because it encompassed that that was one of many use cases that it encompassed. And so when I talked to the um, groups a lot, you know, I really did use federal funding as a use case because it is there is so much money available now and um, so much of policy is is data driven, is evidence driven. And so um, they really need support and tools. And I mean, <laughs> even me, right, I'm one person. So I can I know, you know, I've been in this work a lot, so I know where to find a lot of data, but having more hands in this space, more help in this space is really um, can help those underserved communities get funds that they need. So I was really excited about this sprint. Yeah, awesome, awesome, Maria. And the, and the user advocate role is incredibly important, and I think one of the key features of uh, the Opportunity Project and the work that uh, that the Coil team does, because they realized very early on there are people like you out there that are, um, you know, in a lot of ways a part of the community, but also uh, kind of speak the language of government and can help uh, product teams and and community leaders kind of navigate a space that can be um, kind of kind of uh, uh, foreign to outsiders. So uh, thank you so much for that. And David, can you tell us a little bit about your role in the sprint and how uh, how your communities use data? Sure. Um, thanks, Haley, Brian, for having me, um, and Maria, great to see you. Um, so I'm David Park, Director of Data Business Analytics at the National League of Cities. Um, we're a membership association um, celebrating our centennial in 2024, uh, representing uh, cities, towns, and villages across the country. So the likes of New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, down to small uh, former mining communities and coal mining communities, West Virginia, farm towns uh, in Iowa, Nebraska. Um, a lot of uh, my role as related to the top was informing um, 
I guess the companies and the partners, uh, some of the challenges local governments face, whether it's um, skill set based hiring, um, retention, um, that how the data is packaged. Um, and, and then in terms of my day to day roles, it's helping cities unlock data. So using data to drive or inform decision and policy making. I mean, the best example I have is a good chunk of the last three, four years, we worked with a lot of communities on COVID related issues, right? Whether it's tracking infections, uh, vaccination sites, identifying places that would be ideal um, locations for um, those sites, and then identifying which communities um, were affected the most, disaggregation by race of infections and fatalities, uh, for instance. Uh, but I'm excited to delve into some of these questions. And I, I know we're supposed to disagree, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, I know we'll, we'll find some common ground somehow. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, thank you, David. And uh, just a really quick background uh, on, on me and, and to explain a little bit further on my introduction. Um, so, so I help pilot the product advisor role uh, for the Opportunity Project a, a few years back. Um, and data is my full-time job uh, and and also my side hustle and my hobby. So um, the you know, when I was a private citizen, I was writing uh, comments to the federal the Federal Register on the data strategy before it was even published. And so, um, you know, these topics are very, very near and dear to my heart. And so I'm interested to talk about a you know a topic that is, um, you know, is something that we revisit over and over and over again. It seems like um, we we run this top sprint on uh, connecting community leaders and uh, and local governments and user advocate communities uh, with data, federal open data, uh, and application teams to develop applications for uh, 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 for analytics and decision support and for workflows. Um, you know, at the community and local level, uh, and then when the when the top sprint ends, um, you know, and that team of of user advocates and product advisors and federal government and uh, and the rest, when they all dissipate, it seems like there's a there's a struggle then to to keep the effort going, and then we revisit the same topic the next year or six months later. And so, um, can you all share your thoughts? on why, why this is something that we always go back to on how to make innovation stick uh, with open data when the top summit is over or the top sprint is over rather. I think just sharing a lot of, you know, the lessons learned, right? There's a lot of common themes. I think it's just continually trying to make connections with others. I mean, in, in my line of work, it's just connecting, say, with new city staff or elected officials and letting them know the resources that are out there. Um, you know, they might catch a data set in the news, they might not come to us with questions. And I think if, where I said is just knowing the right people to connect them with or talk to and ask the right questions to get them the answers they need for interpretation or to even validate the data that they see. Sure. So, so relationships, c continuous and relentless relationship building. Yep. Um, yeah, that that's a that's a full time job for sure. Maria, any thoughts? Yeah, and I think we can go expand on that, and then and say there's a very human element to technology and data, and um, you know, one of the issues I find a lot with data is just awareness of what's available, and so if just because the data set is published online doesn't mean people know how to access it or know how to use it for their needs. And so, um, you know, there are, uh, there are some challenges with that. And then me being a practitioner and a data professional, I've found with federal data sets, sometimes the link will change without notice. And so I'll have something bookmarked or, you know, I start typing like the search terms I've used to find it in the past. And I'm like, wait a second, like, I swear it was here, it was here. And suddenly it's not there. So, you know, things change and there's not a lot of notification about that. So, you know, there's a bit of a bit of awareness of what's out there. Some of that is, like I said, a very human element. Like I think the Fed federal government needs to talk about it a little bit more, advertise what data sets are available, what's there. Then there's folks, you know, like David and NLC and like the work that I do. And we kind of act as intermediaries to just try to connect people constantly because 
you know, elected officials turn over, staff turns over, like you just really have to stay on top of it. So trying to, um, you know, match potentially just a, a, a nascent or a new kind of product to, to these very human things, to um, processes that have been going on in, in governments for years, if not decades, you know, it it takes a while to in, entrench that in in the thought process, in the actual you know government process, and the different works and and um, things that happen. So you know, there are that's why you have to stay at it. So I you know I as right. Haley mentioned in the introduction, this is my my fourth top sprint, and it's this is the first time or. I find each time I work with more and more groups afterwards, because yes, we kind of talk about the same thing, but you need to keep, you know, reiterating and building on what was done in the past and, you know, just kind of keep, keep that going and keep matching it to what's happening, you know, with, with these government processes to kind of have, have successful innovation. Yeah. And, and I think, so I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back and you know, the role of government here, I think, is important, right? Because they're ultimately, the government and the public are benefactors for for how this data is used, right? But the advice that I give to application developers throughout the top sprint process is you got to find the intersection of where your current development roadmap and your IP portfolio is and the problem statements that government customers are providing you, they have to marry up. And ideally, they'll marry up in a way that, um, you know, that aligns with enduring requirements that your application is going to have anyways. And so essentially, the work that you do in a, in a 12 weeks sprint is not throwaway work, it's building, you know, it's building onto your current IP portfolio, which is the value proposition of top, you get you get problem statements, you get data, and then you get to keep the keep the IP. And so, um, you know, I would ask, is this, you know, is this too much of an ask for developers and you know and 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 application builders to go through this twelve? You know, it's it's very short. It's a twelve week process. You're meeting a lot of new people. You're learning a lot of new uh, terminology. You're working with data that maybe you've never seen before. Um, is it too much of an of an ask to uh, to to get those application developers to to find a way to integrate that roadmap in such a short period of time? I think the short answer is no. I, I think I mean I would imagine they would tell you otherwise, right? I mean, it's they're they're giving their time or in essence volunteering their time. Um, sure. But I think they're getting like an intense focus group of, you know, users, uh, potential users, use cases, um, and opportunities to engage and learn. Um, and so, I mean, I don't want to speak for the developers. This is just me serving as kind of advisor to them. Um, but I feel like they get a lot of value out of the, the whole experience. Yeah. Maria, yeah. any thoughts there? <laughs> My short answer is is also, um, you know, it's not too much of an ask because yes, it is a short time and plus one to everything that David said. Um, and also we're still out there doing the work. <laughs> Practitioners are still doing it even after the sprint yeah. ends. Like there is still a need, you know, and, and like David said, the sprint is a very concentrated learning experience. And also, you know, we, we are still doing the work after the sprint ends. So yes, there is a, a need for it and a, a use case for it. I I like the I like the perspective of, you know, you're getting an intense focus group, right? And I think I think that's interesting. But you, you know, you um, you know, you will hear those on the other side saying, well, it takes time and money to to build this and to learn, you know, the, to learn the problem statements. Um, and so I think, you know, maybe perhaps the, you know, the 12 week commitment and the flurry of activity that happens there, maybe it's not too much of, of an ask to complete and to add value, 
But then, then we're back in this enduring question though, which is well, what happens next and how do we maximize the use of the data, but also maximize um, the impact that the products uh, have as they, as they come out into the market. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the hard thing to say to application developers is you haven't found product market fit yet. Right. If you, you know, you build a thing and, and you haven't, you know, you haven't acquired your first government customer or your first customer in a new agency, um, you know, at, at any level, federal, state, local, um, you know, and this gets back to the relentless relationship building, right? Relentless, continuous relationship building, where you literally, uh, you got to show someone something a lot of times before they start to imagine it in their decision making process. Um, but let me let me ask a question about about the data, right? And so we have things like the Open Data Act and the Evidence Act that have requirements for the federal government uh, to publish data. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I think in some circles, there's an argument happening about authoritative data versus accurate data. And the example that I'll give is like, I can go knock down the mailbox in my yard today and go to OpenStreetMap and say, I knocked down the mailbox in my yard. It's not there anymore. Uh, and millions of users all across the world can use that in in their uh, you know in their landmarks and their feature sets, but the government will not accept it because it's not authoritative, right? And so the government has a view of what is authoritative, regardless of if it's accurate or if it's helpful and useful. And I think we're seeing some you know some some domains where we're really questioning is is the data that we're publishing is it useful? Um, and uh, it, you know, I, I would put this to, to you both as serving communities that are end users of the data. Is, is it useful? Um, and if yes or no, is there also a feedback loop for you to tell the government that it's useful? So that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Love to take out a part and pieces there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the earlier part of the question as well, you know, around costs and, and budget timelines and procurement processes. So it's perhaps a conversation for another day. But thinking of this question of authoritative versus accurate data, I mean, you're correct. That is a tension that's experienced everywhere. The the value that I find in government data and why it's useful is, you know usually, and I don't know every government data set, but ones that I use, like census and others, are typically very systematic. They have um, a proven mythology for how they're trying to, to count people, to get their information, um, to clean their information, you know, to, to produce it, wrangle the data, and then push it out publicly. Some of these open source um, types of data and other data sets can be potential complements, but I have always struggled, I mean, for almost two decades now with this idea of open data because it does not represent everybody and everybody's not in there talking about their mailboxes, right? I would never <laughs> even think to put that on a map until you, you mentioned it right now. And so, you know, that's they can provide some insight, but they're, you know, they're should be used with a little more caution because they're not, like I said, they're not really looking to capture everybody. You, you have to be able to access the internet, know how to use the site, all that kind of stuff to put the information out there. So they really are, you know, a, a subset. Um, and then, you know, when you get to real granular locations and potentially some demographics or whatever project work you're using. I mean, we often supplement government data sources with surveys and, and other data that we're curating. So, you know, it's not just government data. Like, yes, it's very good. And yes, it's often like a, ba a baseline, but there's other ways to build upon that and kind of piece together um, information that's that's needed for a particular community. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing a lot of things here. I'm hearing um, 
accessibility of the data, um, which I think one of the core assumptions in government is we publish the data on our website, people are going to go and get it, um, which without a feedback loop, and, and I'll say, you know, being on all sides of the um, the use of government open data, both inside and outside of government, I, I would say like federal government can do much better at understanding who is using their data for, for what purposes. And they could, you know, you can talk about this in terms of business impact of data or usage or, or whatever, but, you know, the assumption that because the data is out on a website and the right people are going to find it and get to it and know how to use it, I think is, is a, um, you know, is, is, a, a is a flawed assumption, but it's something that, you know, we're trying, I think we're trying to address with, um, you know, with, with innovation efforts like the Opportunity Project and others. Um, the, the other, uh, the other observation I have is government data, especially federal open data can be used as a baseline kind of a foundational baseline to measure differences. Um, and it sounds like, Maria, you're you're kind of using government data as a baseline, and then you do supplemental surveys that um, will provide more, uh, more granular detail. David, any of this resonate with you? Is, does government just publish the, the best, most high quality data that is immediately useful? I have to disagree with you there, Brian. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, I mean, just echoing kind of the what you already said, I mean, when, when you kind of uh, laid out that problem statement or question for us, I wrote down accuracy, utility, availability, frequency, purpose, objective, goals, and impact. And at and, and a high level, at a meta level, let's put it this way, the data on the data, um, you know, utility is one, right? How easy is it? to use accessibility in addition to availability, uh, frequency. So like, you know, we're talking about surveys. Is it annual? Is it, you know, decennial? You know, and, and that'll inform how useful it is. And then the purpose, objective, goals, and impact. And so, I mean, th those are easy things to measure, right? But I think those are things that need to be talked about. Like once you publish something, how effectively are people able to access the data? And, and to what you said earlier, are there feedback loops? And to what Maria said earlier, like, are there intermediaries? Are there formalized relationships with those intermediaries? I'll add that. And that, that's like part of my role. It's just building these formalized relationships. So it doesn't seem like, you know, my constituents, whether it's the city staff or the elected officials themselves, they call someone at a federal agency, they get back an answer. They just want someone to be able to validate it, right? And then also mm -hmm. help connect the dots if that's not the right source, who, who they should be talking to. Yeah, and I think that goes back, David, to um, the the human element that we discussed b before, right? And there is, um, a, you know, having a feedback loop and and having a a touch point where you can reach out and validate, um, you know, the, uh, qu questions or um, questions or. Uh, the, just general thinking about about data sets that are out there and are, are available. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about bias. We talked a little bit about accessibility and data quality, and I think this is a good way for us to pivot to um, um, to to artificial intelligence. Um, you know, I I, I think. With improvements in artificial intelligence today, there there are discussions on can we use AI tools to support uh, gov government leaders at all at all levels. Um, there's no question that this is being used in in very wide, uh, very wide range out in the commercial marketplace. Um, I expect that uh, you know people that are responding to proposals, vendors that are responding to proposals, are using AI. In their proposal writing process, um, I expect that you know AI tools for decision making and decision support are becoming more popular, um, and so 
you know, I, I would put this question out there to you all. Is AI in a position to start taking away responsibilities from local decision makers, um, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, what kind of impacts AI powered tools might have in your specific communities? I'm happy to go first, David, if you want. Okay. Um, so it depends. I, I don't think AI is taking anything away. It's just potentially shifting what you have to focus on. So yeah. um, I'm still in touch with a couple of groups from the sprint, <laughs> groups that were using AI-based solutions that, that I'm interested in using more. And so, you know, in some ways it's, it's very good. It can help increase my capacity right? um, to get more work done, reach more people, do more analyses. But there are some fundamental things about AI that I think a lot of people, you know, need to know. And, you know, you know, there's a little bit of an education curve because a lot of times AI and admittedly, I haven't looked at it in a few weeks, but it, it lacks citations oftentimes, right, if you're using one of those more sort of generic or, or big tools. So you're not necessarily knowing the source of your data. Um, and it doesn't know, you know, AI is based on, on generalities. So it doesn't know the specifics of your situation and your community. So yeah. you still need to understand, you know, as a decision maker, as a community leader, like what problems are you trying to solve? You know, is this the right data? If an AI tool is giving you something like maybe what data is missing or how biased could this, is this, you know, and you, you still need to put the rest of the pieces of the solution and, and, and puzzle together. So, you know, AI can be helpful and there are ways that we can guide its development to be more beneficial and, and less biased, but um, there's still, you know, there's there's still a need to, to have data professionals and, and technology professionals in the conversation. All right, David, AI? Um, yeah, will it take away decision-making? I mean, if we let it, I think the challenge is gonna be, <laughs> what do we train it on, right? I mean, obviously yeah. we need to educate ourselves and you know the constituents we work with on how it works. But I think where I've kind of landed is the use cases. So how can and should we be using it, right? Now, if we're feeding a data with uh, unconscious biases, right? Say for hiring or, uh, mm -hmm. image selection or, you know, whatever it is, th there clearly needs to be safeguards in there. So we can, sure. number one, discern it, and number two, figure out a way to rectify it. I mean, it's just like anything, we, any new thing we see in society. Um, and then also sharing that. I think fundamentally, like sharing what we learn. I mean, at, uh, at a small level, those are the common questions I get is like, you know, sure. I'm a, I'm an elected official, I'm working, or I'm an advocacy organization, and I've seen it being used this way. Do you think that's an effective way of using it? And I have to tell them, I have no idea. You know, we'll, <laughs> still out. we'll, we'll all have to kind of wait and see. Um, and then come together, like, clearly, if, there, if there's cases where it's, like, causing harm to society, then sure. we need to come together and figure that out, too, in terms of yeah. uh, regulating it, uh, but also not stifling the innovation, either. Yeah, and so I I am I am hardcore team accelerate for artificial intelligence use right now with with some caveats, right? And I think the first one is, and and Maria, I think you touched on this a little bit in in your your perspective. We're not really automating decisions when you're trying out AI, right? You're automating the space in between decisions, right? So if I'm using AI to write a document. I may use it to write the first draft. And then I go, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. I throw it out. I, you know, do my own research. I look at, you know, some of the facts that were cited. And then, and then the decision point then is like, what, what do I want to accept as a as a draft? Um, you know, and and the first organization and the outline and the first word jumble that you spit out um is the part that we automate up front. I think there's some caveats to to um you know, to, to widespread AI use in many domains, not just government, but also industry and in schools and the education system and everything. And the first one is it follows, it follows all the vowels. So this will be easy to remember. 
Uh, the first one is AI a should be accessible. It should be accessible to everyone. Uh, and we already talked about accessibility challenges with the assumption that, you know, that all Americans have access to the internet, which is not true. So the accessibility challenge is, is going to be hard, but I think it should be accessible to everyone, regardless of, um, you know, your level of familiarity with the tools. The second thing is uh, there should be significant education about the strengths and weaknesses, shortcomings of the tools, right? The third is, is uh, an AI tool should be open. I heavily favor open source here, um, but there should at least be an open discussion about methods, processes, procedures, data sets, et cetera. Um, and, it, and it should be uh, uh, inclusive. Uh, it should take it's, takes into account, into account um, specific activities required to address biases in the data that we know already exist because of how it was collected or who had access to the collection mechanism or the types of people that, that you know, the data is about or the sources where the data comes from, uh, right? And then the, the, the final one is AI should be understandable and you should understand why it makes mistakes, when it makes mistakes, um, you know, and this goes back to the strengths and weaknesses of, of the methods and techniques, which in many ways are statistical models that are, that are built up over time from, from data sets. Um, so that's, that's all I'm going to say on AI. Um, I thank you all so, so much for, for your perspective uh, on this very important topic and, and why we keep coming back to how to make, uh, data useful to to local communities and how we can continue to improve our processes. Uh, Maria, David, th thank you once again, um, and I really enjoyed the discussion. With that, I will pass it over to uh, Lorena, who will bring us into the next part of today's programming. So thank you again. Thank you, Brian. And next, we'll turn to a session on data quality and accessibility challenges and opportunities in Puerto Rico. Data is an asset to any community. However, the lack of timely, granular, and accessible data hinders economic progress, growth, and mobility. From economic indicators to GDP data, impact data on federal funding, reading literacy data in the education space, and even geospatial data, we value the opportunities for multi-sector collaboration in building better data infrastructure in Puerto Rico. To kick off this topic today, I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage, Juan Carlos Blanco, Director of the Puerto Rico Office of Management and Budget or Oficina de Gerencia y Presupuesto. In this role, he provides the governor and the Puerto Rico legislature advice on the development and administration of the government's budget and its dependencies. Mr. Blanco is an attorney and business advisor with over 20 years of experience in the public and private sector. Previously, he worked in private law firms focusing on areas such as financing, investment funds, and financial regulation. And in Puerto Rico, he worked in commercial banking and as an advisor to financial institutions and private clients. We're honored to welcome you to our Innovation Summit. So, Director Blanco, over to you. Thank you, Lorena, and uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to participate in these activities. Uh, uh, thank you to everyone who, who said present today to this uh, U.S. Census Open Innovation Summit to hear about the story in Puerto Rico, how we've, uh, we're coming from, from, a, uh, from a, a place of, of need, a place uh, that requires recovery, and how we've, we're becoming now a, a more a resilient, a, a more progressive, and, and a more successful uh, territory. Uh, from the Office of Management and Budget has been tasked by Governor Pierluisi to lead efforts to improve data governance and architecture across Puerto Rico. We know enough to know that without good data, we cannot make good decisions. We need uh, data to support not only what the government does every day, but also to support our economy, support our private institutions, and to better deliver, uh, deliver services to our citizens. In that regards, our office is working in collaboration with pr uh, private institutions, nonprofit organizations, academia, 
looking for different projects and uh, trying to be the center of gravity in creating this change in Puerto Rico. Today, we're going to be talking about two, you're going to be hearing about two very important initiatives that are occurring in Puerto Rico. One that addresses a need that has been uh, persistent in our market for many years. That is tracking the use and the, the um, results from the use of federal funds across Puerto Rico. We've uh, had challenges in terms of data and how it's been fragmented. Across, uh, across different institutions, across different entities. And that creates gaps in, in opportunities and gaps in achieving maximum utilization of the funds that we have available. With that regards, we've been working on a very interesting project to track specifically the impact of federal funds across the island, working together with a private institution to achieve these results. We also know that education is the cornerstone of development on the island. And amongst different projects that we have been working on, we're working in collaboration with a nonprofit organization to address literacy, in especially in early education. We know that our children deserve the best service and the best opportunity to move forward. And that the lack of proper uh, literacy be, is one of the biggest factors in terms of uh, uh, staying in school and being able to achieve success later in life. That's why we're focusing resources to reduce this literacy gap because that's part of a the path forward to ensure that not only what we're doing today benefits Puerto Rico, but we're helping to contribute to the next generations. All these projects are based on data and all these projects put us in a, in a much better position, not only to understand what we're doing today, but creating the citizens that will lead the Puerto Rico of tomorrow. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce these two initiatives. I thank again the, the team, the U.S. Census, for their uh, support, collaboration with us uh, at the Oficina de Gerencia y Presupuesto, the government of Puerto Rico, and everything that's going on in the island. We're all part, we're a team, and we're all part of a success story. And I thank you for your interest and I look forward to seeing you on the island soon to continue working on behalf of the people of Puerto Rico. Thank you so much, Director Blanco. It has been a pleasure and an honor to collaborate with the OMB of Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico Department of Education and all the collaborators that were part of the sprint. So now let's hear it from the participating teams and leading us in the conversation today is Axel Santana from PolicyLink who served as a sprint leader for the challenge on tracking federal funding impact in Puerto Rico. Axel, over to you. Thank you, Lorena, and hello, everyone. My name is Axel Santana. I'm an associate at PulseLink, which is an equity research and action institute based out of Oakland, California. Last year, we had the pleasure of co-hosting an opportunity sprint along with the Office of Management and Budget of Puerto Rico, um, OGP. We were super excited to partner with organizations in Puerto Rico to increase data transparency across the island, which will help advance equity, accountability, and access to federal funds. And we're super thrilled to be highlighting some of that work here today. We're joined with representatives across two top problem statements from 2023 that focus on different areas of data equity in Puerto Rico. From the Tracking Federal Funding Impact of Puerto Rico Problem Statement, we are joined by Isel Masas from Sembrando Sentido. And from the Reducing the Literacy Gap in Puerto Rico Problem Statement, we're joined by Seth Racine from Open Architects and Jake Gable from Ad Astra Media. And so with that, we'll go ahead and start with our first question. Thank you, panelists, for joining us. Um, starting with Jake, what made you interested in this sprint, specifically around the topic of uh, reducing the literacy gap in Puerto Rico? Yes, um, <clears throat> we at Ad Astra became interested in um, this particular um, top sprint as we were thinking about how we might, um, you know, use our skills to to help. Um, and be able to to do something hopefully that that is helpful and and matters to for for Puerto Rico. We found ourselves um, most particularly interested in this um, issue around literacy, as we thought that was where we were best suited to to address 
um, the needs that that were being requested to be addressed. So at Ad Astra Media, we're very much interested in um, improving educational experiences, particularly for underserved populations. We thought this was a great opportunity um, to do work that is aligned with our with our interests, and um, hopefully, you know, we we've gotten a chance to work with. Um, incredible data stewards and and uh, user advocates and a whole series of of wonderful um, folks who've really helped us um, understand the the issues and and how we might be able to to address them. So um, it was a great opportunity for us to to bring our um, expertise from from uh, you know education to to try to uh, help and participate um, in the sprint. Thanks, Jake. And the same question for you, Seth. Thanks, Axel. Uh, so at Open Architects, our purpose is to equip public service leaders with best-in-class data tools that bring clarity to their challenges and opportunities so they can improve the lives of those they serve. It's hard to think of a better opportunity than something like this to be able to support and improve literacy in Puerto Rico. So we jumped at that opportunity. Um, it also helped the fact that we've worked for decades within school districts um, in many different states. And so uh, it was such a great opportunity to be able to work with, talk with, um, and hear from educators, teachers, uh, principals, district leaders, both current and former, uh, to find out how can we create uh, customized tools that give them data at their fingertips to allow them to better serve their students. Uh, and so it was an absolute pleasure uh, to work on this opportunity. Thanks, Seth. And he said, what excited you and interest you in the uh, tracking federal funding impact on Puerto Rico Spring? Thank you, Axel, and thank you, U.S. Census, for the invitation. Um, well, um, here at Sembrano Sentido, we've been around for over a few years now, and what we do really focuses around combining technology with research and advocacy tools to make government spending easy to understand so that our communities can participate more effectively of the decisions and the funding decisions that affect them. And so this was a no-brainer. Uh, when we started our work, we started in public contracting um, because it's the biggest expenditure within the government of Puerto Rico and it's one of the areas with the highest risk of misuse and mismanagement of funds. Um, and we've been able in a short amount of time to increase transparency of public procurement and public contracting by over 350% and to establish what we call now red flex mechanisms, which really raise preventively and in real time, potential risks for misuse or mismanagement of funds. Um, but as we do more of our work and we, you know, we focus a lot of our work around research um, in regards to government spending as a whole, the federal spending side of the house is critical and very important for the reconstruction um, and the rebuilding and the emergency response processes for Puerto Rico in particular. We've, uh, we've had over $127 billion that have been assigned to Puerto Rico. A big portion of that is rebuilding and reconstruction focused um, and climate crisis response as well. And so we want to make sure that the money is being used well, effectively, and a just and equitable um, and sustainable way. And so in order to do that, though, we need to track the money and we need to understand how you know, how it's connected to results and outcomes. What outcomes does that spending actually leads to? And what needs might still be unaddressed? And that's um, essentially why when this top sprint uh, problem statement was presented, we couldn't say no. Thank you, so So maybe you can start us off by describing the tool that you built, uh, you and the team and the intended end users and share a little bit about how you hope this can advance the mission of improved data representing Puerto Rico. Great. Um, when we started, we started by recognizing that we had a pretty ambitious project ahead. Um, we needed to first understand the universe of the data that is out there that has anything to do with federal spending, federal money allocation, and then results, outcomes, right? Um, and in order to do that, we quickly recognize that we we're talking about just publicly over a hundred different portals with different data sources and information, both at the federal, at the state, and even at the local level. And so 
um, what we needed to do was to understand the data and also understand our users, what it is that our communities actually need to answer um, and how does it need to look like for them to be able to use this type of technology and to answer those questions that are most prominent, most priority for them. Um, and so we, we embarked on two different you know, sort of work streams um, during the sprint. One is user research and the other is the data research, which is typically for top, but in this case, we'll continue on for the next couple of months. And we developed a toolbox that is based off of those exercises that, that continue on. The toolbox has three key components. Uh, the first map, the first one is the roadmap, um, and the roadmap is essentially a path, a very straw man base of a path towards the what will become the tracker, the federal funding and impact tracker. Um, the idea here is that we have delineated the basic phases um, and the timeline, the tentative timeline that it will take to develop that tracker in its different versions and releases but also delineating clearly the different work streams that will entail that type of work, right? So from user, user research to user design, from data standardization to data insights and data analysis uh, to the actual development of the database and the tool that will be used and the multi-stakeholder collaboration component of it, which is extremely critical in this type of effort, right? We need to work with government in order to address some of the limitations of the data, in order to connect some of the data sources that are around there and that have a lot of possibilities when, you know, when connecting with each other. Um, and we also need to work with academia and other organizations that, that can help us and want to help us build this tracker. The second tool that we developed is the data catalog. And this is really about that data research part of the house, right, or, or the work streams that we embarked on. The data catalog has two critical tables. Uh, the first table is a more general table that maps the each of the data sources that we have of those critical data sources uh, like USA spending, like fiscal data, the federal register, among many others, that um, then we talk, we go into table two, which has the information on the variables, right? So it's not just about an overview of the data source, but it's actually about the each and every single variable that has to do with spending and impact and understanding how it's being presented, what does it mean to this data source specifically, how can we extract it? What limitations might there be that we need to be aware of as we're connecting the dots or extracting the information, et cetera. And so in doing that, it provides a much bigger picture of what we could centralize in the short, in the medium, and in the long term. Um, and then last but not least, we developed a how-to guide. We recognized early on that this wasn't just challenging, but that many of us um, want and use constantly all of the data that is out there to answer different questions, whether they're research questions, community questions, government related questions. Um, and so we recognize that the data catalog could also fast track um, other folks efforts into understanding what data they could use to answer their own questions. And so we also developed that guiding, you know, that guidelines to, um, to help them understand how to use the catalog to get that moving faster and to understand where and what type of data they could use to, to address their own needs. Thanks, you said, and super excited to have been uh, a part of that process as well. Um, I'll pass it to Seth to describe your tool and um, intended end users and how you think it'll improve um, data in Puerto Rico. Thanks, Axel. Uh, so we spoke with a number of uh, educators, uh, school leaders, and the big need that we heard that we thought we could help on was understanding um, both where their students are in terms of literacy and other related information like attendance and behavior and other assessments and then to be able to quickly uh, assign interventions monitor progress uh, and then share key insights with their fellow team members we also heard a very common thread which is but how do you make it very easy for me uh, that I can get it right away and with very little work on my end because I'm uh, incredibly busy. Uh, so that's what we we're able to create. Um, so we created a system here where uh, our team would be able to set up the data connectors to any system uh, that they want to look at from their student information system to their assessments to other related information. We would 
export that data on a nightly basis, and then bring it into a data warehouse, where from then there, we're going to use that to create a map where they can easily they can log into our system and then go to a map where they can see their students and key information about their community, uh, as well as the students, and then go into a dashboard to be able to see how their students are doing across key information like assessments, attendance, behavior, other uh, information. But then from there, with just another click, uh, be able to assign an intervention, monitor their progress, uh, add notes that they could then go back and share with their team so that over the course of the year, they don't need to wait um, for some big update or some one-off data analysis, but they're seeing key insights every day as they work with their, their students uh, and their fellow team members to improve their literacy. Thanks, uh, Jake. Same question. Tell us about your tool. Yes, thank you so much. Um, we at at Astra decided to make um, an app, uh, a reading interactive reading app for families. We were wondering how how we would best um, interact with with folks, and we thought that um, trying to connect with parents and and um, bring this issue around the literacy uh, to um, to parents' knowledge, make parents aware of this issue, and and hopefully um, encourage reading at home um, within the family. So our app is is um, designed to be used by by parents, and and they will there they will see very um, simple figures and data that we have gathered um, that helps uh, will hopefully help parents understand um, issues around literacy, the importance of literacy. And and the risks um, later in life for students who who don't learn to read and um, you know hopefully encourage more um, engagement with this issue and more engagement with with reading within the families. So um, and then along with that we we are providing um, a free digital library and um, some simple um, word and language games um, and reading games to help kids. Uh, engage with with reading and vocabulary and and hopefully you know also um engage the children with with um reading as well uh and we hope that that all of this together will will make families more aware of of issues surrounding surrounding literacy um data that that is out there and also hopefully uh help push um public interest in in continuing efforts of understanding literacy by grade level in in Puerto Rico or or you know um promote continued interest in in this issue and and also hopefully generate public interest in in data around literacy as well thanks Jake so something unique about these sprints is the focus on generating new data or improved data quality um, Seth, let's start with you. How is your product or organization working to improve data quality on these topics? Sure, it's a real common issue with school districts. I mean, they're using a variety of different data sources um, that's changing every day. And oftentimes, the most common way that they're able to sort of reconcile and see what's accurate uh, is doing sort of a one off pretty long-term analysis that may happen once, twice, three times a year. For us, um, we've just found that the way to improve data is to make it easy uh, and give it to them at their fingertips and, and make sure it's really timely. So for us, by creating data exports and connectors to all the different systems they have, updating that data on a nightly basis, um, mapping it across the different systems, so in essence, they're almost talking, and then giving it back in a really user-friendly way to uh, those on the front lines, teachers and educators and principals, uh, with just a click of a button, uh, they're going to be able to go in and see immediately what's wrong. And they can flag that say, okay, how do I fix this? Something's wrong with this. This needs to change. Uh, and so that's the most effective approach for us that we found when we partner with school districts. That's great. Um... Issa, can you tell us how your product and organization are um, working to improve data quality? Yes, um, absolutely. So I think our the uniqueness within our work is 
um, that we decided not to touch data just yet, right? That we we needed to really understand it first and that um, in order to avoid, you know, creating insights or data analytics that, you know, had some profound foundational issues, um, we needed to really understand the data first and the users as well. There's a big technology adoption gap in Puerto Rico, um, especially within our communities. Um, so we need to understand that too. Um, and like Seth talked, described briefly, you know, we need to we need to really understand how to how to protect project the information, the right information, um, in front ultimately to to our users um, at the end of the road, right? And so really understanding what it is that they want um, and how to present it the best way so that it's useful for them has been a critical part of the process that we've embarked on in this last uh, couple of months and, and we'll continue to embark on as we um, continue to work on this. Jake, how are you all improving data quality? Yes, um, sort of as, as uh, briefly mentioned before, we're hoping that by um, we're hoping to generate some public interest in in these issues and how data can help us understand and address these issues. Um, so we hope by by engaging parents um, and having it be this issue that that has to do with families, um, that that will will also help drive some of that that public interest in in this data, um, so that uh, you know hopefully. Uh, folks can continue to to fund projects that that provide helpful data and and fund projects that use that data to try to um, address address uh, further issues. So sort of trying to generate that that public interest and and um, also you know be an example of of um, how data can can um, interface with with public. Thanks, Jake. So we're going to um, close out with the last question and, and turn it right back to you, Jake, starting uh, with you. If you could please share any sort of next steps or action items our viewers can take around your product tool or, you know, your broader work um, or any final takeaways of your experience with the top sprint. Definitely. Um, first of all, the, the the top sprint has been um, an incredible opportunity and and such such a, a great program to to really um, you know, bring uh, folks together who who understand these issues from different perspectives, um, and and hear from from folks on the ground and educators and everyone. So that the the organization around around this sprint has has really been um, a terrific uh, uh, endeavor, and and I've been very pleased to be a part of that. As far as our next steps for for our our app is, we we think there's a lot of potential. Um, as for this as a resource for families in, in Puerto Rico. So we hope to continue expanding and building on, on our product. And so, you know, we're looking for continued um, interest and, and opportunities around uh, funding and financial support so that we can continue to grow and build this product. Um, you know, we think there's, there's opportunity to greatly expand the digital library and resources available to students, teachers, and fam uh, teachers and students and families and parents, everyone um, across the board, and as well as build out our our games to be for different age ranges and and even perhaps reflect um, material from their coursework in the games and the readings um, in this app and sort of expand it to this really immersive and and interactive app that that students and and um, parents and teachers alike can can utilize. Thank you, Jake. I'll pass it to Seth. Thank you. Yeah, I would echo again that uh, it was a real pleasure uh, for our team to be able to be part of something like this and to work with a really passionate group of educators and advocates uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, so in terms of next steps, uh, Actually, we're ready to start to work with schools uh, next week, um, as soon as next week. And um, we just need to find districts and schools that are interested in partnering with us. And then uh, once we do, within just a few weeks after that, they would have the ability to uh, have these data tools uh, to be able to support their work with students. So we're really looking forward to an opportunity um, if people are interested. So if they are interested in wanting to do this, they just need to go to our website, openarchitects.com and uh, they can sign up and we can talk about next steps. Thank you, Seth, and we'll close out with what he said. 
Um, yes, so I will say that one of the more exciting things that has have happened throughout this sprint is um, not only the opportunity to actually, you know, be part of the sprint and begin doing this work, but also the collaborations that are forming um, day after day. Um, we've we've received not only, you know, support from groups like uh, People Center Internet and, you know, interest from USA Treasury and USA Spending specifically to figure out how we can work together um, to improve and work on opportunities within the data that they present, um, but also receiving support from groups like 1.5 Climate Strategies and obviously the partnership with Policy Link. Um, the reality is that every day we get, you know, we get interest from different groups um, in different spaces to, to, you know, to continue to work on this beyond the sprint. And that for us is, is the ultimate outcome, um, a, a collaboration that really helps us uh, develop this tracker into what we hope becomes uh, uh, the tracker that we were hoping to build. And so um, this would be the first uh, next step. Um, we are working alongside government to figure out how we can best support um, the next steps to addressing some of the potential opportunities and some of the existing limitations that we see within the data as well. Um, and we see a lot of interest at the federal level in making that happen and in helping us not only with the Puerto Rican tracker, but also learning um, and, and figuring out how we can replicate this process um, for other states and other jurisdictions that are facing similar challenges um, to track spending and track impact um, as well. And so this is also um, very exciting next step um, that we look forward to embracing and continue to work in. Thank you, Isel, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for spending this time with us today uh, and sharing a bit about all the great work you've been leading. We really look forward to keeping in touch and seeing how all the tools continue to progress, improve, and get implemented. And as they mentioned, as, as if viewers are interested in learning more or collaborating, please reach out to our speakers or visit their websites. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Alexandra Barker from Census to host a reactions panel on further exploring data quality in Puerto Rico. Thank you, Axel. Now I am excited to introduce a bigger picture discussion focused on the challenges of improving data quality. If you have been tuning into the summit so far, you may have heard a few of our community reaction discussions yesterday, where we invited sprint participants data experts and community members to share their thoughts and reactions to the problems at hand, the developed solutions, and the future of these challenge areas. In this discussion, we'll ask our speakers to share some of their thoughts on the current state of data quality in Puerto Rico. So let's dive right in to meet our speakers. Linton Wells, Executive Advisor for the Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities at George Mason University. Justin Cole, Senior Advisor for Data Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and Kevin gonzalez Toro, Chief Executive Officer and Chief Economist at Abexus, a Puerto Rico-based data analytics company. I will now hand it over to my colleague, Lorena, to moderate this great chat. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and thanks uh, to all of our panelists uh, for joining our summit today. I'm so excited to dive right in. Uh, before we start, and so that the audience gets uh, to know you a little bit better, can each of you please take just one minute and share a bit more about your role and how it connects to the topic of data quality and accessibility? And Justin, let's start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Lorena. And uh, first, I'd just like to thank all of the teams for their participation in the top sprint uh, this year. As mentioned, my name is Justin Cole, and for the last seven months, I have had the distinct pleasure of serving as the co-chair of the Fast Track Action Committee on Data Infrastructure for, for Puerto Rico at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. Um, our mission at OSTP is to provide advice to the president and the executive office of the president on matters related to science and technology and ensuring equity, inclusion, and integrity are embedded into all aspects of science and technology. In January 2021, one of the Biden-Harris administration's first actions was to issue executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government, which emphasized the need for gathering data to measure and inform efforts to advance equity. Additionally, in July 2021, the White House chaired the inaugural meeting of the White House Working Group on Puerto Rico to provide Puerto Rico the resources and technical assistance it needs to recover and prosper. 
uh, those are the two efforts that uh, sort of chartered our work. And uh, that's how I've uh, gotten involved in this work. Excellent. Thank you so much, Justin, and for, for all the work that you've done over the last uh, year on this effort. Uh, so, Linton, over to you. Thanks, Lorena. I'm Lynn Wells with the George Mason Center for Resilient and Sustainable Communities and also the People-Centered Internet. I've been involved in Puerto Rican issues since about 2018 with ECI, uh, working first on uh, data uh, regarding uh, the, the role of uh, digital and data in Puerto Rican recovery after Maria and Irma. Uh, and then uh, lately with People Sound Internet, which looks, uh, sorry, with um, uh, CRASP, which looks at resilient and sustainable communities kind of at the bottom up community level. So how can you take advantage of the data that's out there, the information flows that are out there, the money flows that are out there, and apply them at the community level to build a capacity in the archipelago? Excellent, thank you. And we look forward to hear more and what you've learned um, and some of the challenges and opportunities there. Uh, and last but not least, Kevin, welcome to stage. Over to you. Thank you, Lorena. Hi, uh, hi again, my name is Kevin Gonzalez and I work for a local company called Abexis Analytics. We are a young company who developed around 2019 and we have worked with several companies business organizations, NGOs, and even government institutions on building up capacity in terms of their data availability. Availability Also, we call ourself, ourselves more like simplifiers of uh, data since there's sometimes there are, just, there are a lot of data, but it's hard to get to. So um, we work with government institutions also help, helping them basically get that data available to different communities or different sectors within the island. Excellent, thank you. I'm so excited to uh, this for this conversation today and what we've learned thus far. So let's start with Justin. Um, you know, you've been specifically working on this effort around Puerto Rico and have seen uh, some of the products and tools that actually uh, provide a little bit of a snapshot around Puerto Rico data when it comes to funding and this big question around impact. Um, so can you speak a little bit more about your experience with platforms like USA Spending Data, um, that outlines the federal funding that's going to Puerto Rico and what have been your main learnings during the sprint and working with collaborators and, and in that, what do you think could be improved? Yeah, absolutely. So as I as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, the work uh, that I've been doing and, and as a part of a much larger t team um, of interagency partners over the last seven months or so is really grounded in that day one equity executive order. And then of course, um, all of the work that has uh, gone on under the economic dialogues and under dis other discussions at Department of Commerce and elsewhere on the White House Working Group on Puerto Rico. Um, and I think really uh, grounding first, I uh, wanted to start with some language directly from the e equity executive order, which acknowledges that, and I quote, lack of data has cascading effects and impedes effort to measure and advance equity. A first step to promoting equity in government action is to gather the data necessary to inform that effort, uh, end quote. And that really, uh, that section of the, the executive order, while it was only a couple of sentences, I think really speaks volumes to the opportunities that we have and really um, thinking about this uh, in a much more meaningful way. And so the FTAC work um, has allowed us to really work with agencies, as I mentioned, across the federal government to gather and communicate data related to Puerto Rico's recovery from Hurricane Maria, as well as the recent funding, as Isam mentioned um, in the previous discussion, um, uh, from the administration's Investing in America agenda, whether through the Infrastructure Law, Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we found funding data such as the kind that's available on usaspending.gov extremely useful for understanding spending along various dimensions, including looking at it from an equitable distribution standpoint. Um, however, as other reports and previous top sprints have found, there are additional data necessary to assess the impact of that federal spending, including equity, on individuals' uh, experience and lives. Therefore, really, um, what, I, what I think is any discussion about improving the quality and availability of data must be centered around the contribution to the development of more equitable policies and programs in our ability to assess them, maybe more importantly. Federal data is a key tool to build and maintain strong connections between the aims and impacts of federal programs and the lived experiences of residents. 
a key learning is a theme that, again, we've heard throughout the day, including uh, from Isel in the previous panel, uh, which is that to cement the role of data in policymaking and evaluation, it's important for data practitioners to be at the table from the very beginning. Decisions at the inception of the policymaking process can radically alter our ability to measure outcomes after the programs have been delivered, as we're seeing now. Unleashing the possibilities to advance equity through data requires all of us to have a voice in the policy process because the local contextual data joined with federal data sets is necessary to tell the complete and often complex and deeply situated story of outcomes. Thanks. Thanks so much, Justin. Um, so now, Linton, you you served as a product advisor and as a user advocate on the Tracking Federal Fund um, Impact in Puerto Rico Sprint. In this role, you work closely with some of the tech teams and interact and often with the data sets that exist and did your you know own research throughout the last year or two um, on the challenges of connecting uh, federal data with local government or Puerto Rico data and really what's out there in the communities. Can you explain to us a little bit about what you ran into interacting with the data sets and where you think are some areas of opportunity? Thanks very much, <clears throat> Lorena. So when I first uh, was down in Puerto Rico last February with Deputy Secretary Graves, uh, a number that was uh, thrown around or used often was $120 billion. Uh, and the question is fine, where did that come from? How uh, was any of it sunsetted? Uh, what were the targets and that? So uh, a, a fair amount of my work this past year has been trying to understand that better. And for me, the sprint was really valuable in getting a little bit closer to the uh, to the answer. But even uh, working uh, behind the government firewall and working with the task force, there are a number of uh, databases, a number of dashboards that are... Uh, not necessarily consistent and are, are hard to make sense of just where all the data is coming from. So I really look forward to seeing how this comes together and understanding more about the, the uh, efforts of the task force as they bring it to completion. The other point uh, that, um, uh, that uh, Justin just made on understanding the impact at the community level, I think is just really, really important. And I was a great privilege of spending some time down in, Puerto Rico in December with uh, Christina from the Liga de Ciudades and with you and talking with yourself about uh, just seeing how hard it is to track the funds from the federal level through the government of Puerto Rico down to uh, municipalities. I think the effort that the, uh, the work that Sembrano Santito has done and others to understand that impact and make more clarity in that data is going to be just enormously valuable. Uh, the last part is George Mason actually has a very strong data analytic engineering program. Uh, and there are a number of students there who just love to get their hands on the public data that comes out of the task force's efforts. And I think uh, this would be at no cost to uh, the user uh, and should be something we can take advantage of in the coming months. So. Excellent, thank you. And we definitely look forward to continue that collaboration and, and continue to explore how we can better serve the communities and the people that actually need to make sense of the data and understanding how they're directly impacted and personally impacted um, uh, in, in Puerto Rico. Exactly. Um, so Kevin, on this, on, on this same vein, um, we are talking about challenges and opportunities. You know, we understand that capacity building and multi-sector collaboration is extremely important, um, but you definitely seen firsthand the challenges that the government of Puerto Rico agencies face with data, but also how the community organizations, the NGOs, uh, the public at large, um, you know, face with data, especially when we think about a huge data gap in knowledge. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about um, why is it important to improve this, but also you've seen, you know, the lack of data standards or data quality, data governance in Puerto Rico. How can we move the needle in this front? Definitely. There are plenty of uh, probably case studies on different examples that ha have happened in the island over the past years. But I think it's very important to also discuss uh, what is the roots of some of these issues. I mean, the fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico didn't allow for that much space to have data at the center of the agenda because the island was embarked in a different situation. However, uh, given the opportunity provided by the disaster recovery, also the fiscal recovery process, the island has been uh, provided with multiple data sets that over the past year didn't exist. So there's 
now a gap, let's say, of users that used to have some uh, particular data, but now they have a bunch of new data that uh, communities or even potential data users haven't used over the past year. So we need to make sure that all that data that is available gets to the people in the right way. So that was, that's why we always like to uh, use a phrase that like, we are like data simplifiers, uh, providing people allow uh, and allow them to have a lot more access. In terms of the challenges and opportunities, uh, there, there are plenty. In, in terms of the data, a lot of the data is fragmented and people say, well, there's data, but some of the, most of the data, even at the highest levels at the government agenda, some of the data is maintained at spreadsheets level. So we need to embark in a definitely more robust data system. So we need to transition from uh, human-centric spreadsheets to uh, system-centric uh, processes all, all the way uh, within the government. Also, we need to recognize that users vary substantially. Uh, there are uh, potential uses within government agencies, as, as the previous panel discussed, uh, having a, an adequate system or processes to actually allow people to use the data the right way is key in all these processes. And we have the potential need from communities that they vary substantially in terms of their needs or their local capacity. So we need to bridge the gap between the data ecosystem and the capacity within state agencies. Nowadays, I think there's plenty more opportunities to actually move the needle a lot in terms of providing funding for those uh, civil ser servants within state agencies to actually allow and provide a lot more data. Excellent. I want to uh, put a question out to all of you, and, and we understand the continuum of education is extremely important in understanding data as an asset, and that Puerto Rico needs to double down on understanding why data infrastructure is relevant and important, um, why having data standards and data governance, but that starts also from understanding data science and how to apply these skill sets, um, whether it is within the government or outside of the government. Um, just question to all, what do you think can be um, helpful for Puerto Rico in bridging the gap around educating about the importance of, of data as an asset and that the economy of Puerto Rico can only move forward if we actually hold that as a value? So let's start with Lynn. So, in addition to uh, having data as a priority for the government of Puerto Rico, uh, the issue, and you point to education, just for human capital development is going to be absolutely crucial here. So it's not only going to be enough that the government of Puerto Rico or the federal government understand it, but that the not only the governments in the, the, in the communities understand it, but the people who are going to be using it and measuring the impacts and things like that have an understanding for what these weird, strange numbers actually mean as an integrated picture for them. Um, and if we think about kind of design thinking uh, as a way to approach this, the first part of that, you know, five phases, empathize, uh, define, ideate, prototype, test. But the empathize is just understand what the problem is. Work with the people, understand what kind of problem they're trying to solve. In one community, it may be restoring flooding. Another, it may be um, improving agriculture. Another may be something different. So not try to apply one solution fits all. Uh, so the mix of the working at the lower level, educating them as to what data can bring, and then having that happen, I think is important. Excellent. Thank you. And I love that you bring the human-centered approach to this because we definitely have to start with the problem and understanding how data applies to it to make it better. So thank you for that. Uh, Justin, what are your thoughts on that front? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Lorena. Um, so I I really believe that as a general principle, when people who use and analyze data have regular opportunities to share those insights out with you know stakeholders, with decision makers, it initiates this sort of virtuous cycle that both improves the policymaking and implementation processes, which can be tweaked in response to new knowledge. So this sort of iterative process uh, we've seen this um, play out many times with the Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act implementation of sort of uh, implementing, uh, doing a program, and then building in that evaluation process to actually see um, how well it's achieving some of its uh, desired impacts. Um, and so, though, you know, as we've mentioned, the data collection and analysis process 
um, as limitations and gaps in data and analysis are identified can be improved. Um, I think that, again, it takes all of us, so Kevin, Lynn, myself, uh, and uh, you know what we represent in terms of the different uh, organizations, different levels, both having that local contextual data along with some of the uh, government-wide federal data sets, um, and being able to better create joins and linkages across the two. I firmly believe that the best sort of situational awareness and picture that we can get comes from some intersection of those two worlds because um, federal data does provide for, uh, in a lot of cases, um, such a, a broad look at, um, at, at uh, different geographies. Um, but obviously without that local contextual data is, um, you know, and not as useful and helpful um, as a part of the as a part of the process. So I I do hope, and I sort of want to make a challenge to anybody who might be out there listening today that, um, you know, I hope that you're uh, inspired uh, to check out some of the various data sets that that are available for Puerto Rico, including um, I know Census's community resilience estimates. Um, USAspending.gov, which I've mentioned, just to name a few, um, and also to think about how they might be able to be overlaid with um, frameworks like the Equitable Long-Term Recovery and Resilience Framework, which is um, a set of uh, well-being indicators that looks at the um, sort of uh, vital uh, indicators that are needed in order for a community to fully recover uh, from uh, a, a disaster or other event. Um, and continue to push sort of the envelope to find ways to measure the impact. And, you know, when we come up against data limitations and data um, gaps, using that as an opportunity to educate and using that as an opportunity to sort of show the why, the why that data missingness matters, I think is a really critical and a really important piece. I think it's hard sometimes in the abstract to really conceptualize it, but when you see a, a grayed out section of a map or when you see a um, a, you know, not able to be calculated for, you know, various reasons. I think that's a really compelling proof point of the need for better quality, more disaggregated data. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing those two points together because it really needs to connect to the why for, for them and the, for, for the community. Um, so Kevin, any last thoughts around how do we connect the capacity building part of Puerto Rico needing this data quality, accessibility infrastructure, with really being educated about data being an asset um, for economic recovery and everything in between. Definitely. Well, I think uh, I need to use my hat as an economist. I've been working as an economist in the island for the past 15 years. And definitely the data gap that we have experienced over the last decades have pushed a lot of uh, organizations and private institutions to depend on intuition rather than on data. So we have a culture uh, or some cultural aspect in terms of how we feel comfortable using data along the day-to-day -day processes within the island. That has provided, let's say, the use of many averages. And we tend to basically see the island as a singular entity where we do the granular approach and we, we use the right data. We can see that Puerto Rico, there are plenty or multiple Puerto Ricos within the island. That's what is so important to embed uh, granular data into day-to-day -day processes. Definitely the federal government, as well as the census and many other uh, federal government institutions have provided a lot of that data, but we need to combine that with the data that is available from local entities, local NGOs, and even, or even government entities. When we mix those, then there's a lot of power to actually provide a lot of guidance to the economy or the economic actors within the island or potential investors to actually make use of this data as, a, as was mentioned in the previous panel if we don't measure what we're doing there's, there's definitely no uh, move, uh, a path forward in terms of progressing or, or changing some of the aspects also it's important to keep in mind that puerto rico has changed radically in the past 10 years there are demographics have changed substantially there's the, some barriers in terms of accessibility more than 20 percent of the island is probably 65 or and up and that varies also substantially within municipalities. So we need to recognize those differences and make sure that the data, we have a consistent amount of data and with the, enough frequency to allow to see those changes along the way and, and also change our tools to that particular population or the businesses that we see constantly. Excellent, thank you so much. So uh, this was an amazing conversation. I wish we had more time 
Uh, but with that, thank you to all of you for participating in some way or another, either in the sprint or in this conversation and your insights of data quality and accessibility in Puerto Rico. Uh, so now stay tuned for a customer experience friendly debate session and over to you, Drew. Thank you, Lorena and the speakers from the panel. We're grateful for your commitment to improving data quality and we're eager to partner with you more on that in the future. Next, we continue our theme of human-centered data with a session that brings together experts for a friendly debate on whether federal agencies are improving in customer experience, or CX. Recently, uh, many customer experience policies have made headlines, including the 2021 Executive Order on Transforming Federal Customer Experience and the 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act and more. At COIL, CX is critical to our mission. We aim to serve all our external partners as customers. The Opportunity Project provides a feedback loop for data users. And we also facilitate conversations with the public to gain continuous feedback and improve overall census data usability. But as a result, we know how hard it is to get changes made to improve CX based on customer feedback. So in this next session, we're hosting a friendly but candid debate at Summit in which we'll hear some of the best in CX from industry and government about how they think government agencies are really faring on this topic. Now, before I turn it over to them, I'd like to briefly introduce the speakers. They're all far too humble in their bios. So we'd like to share a bit more about their impressive backgrounds to help our view viewers understand the incredible perspectives that they bring to this topic. So first I'll introduce Greg Gershman, who will moderate. He is co-founder, CEO, and board chair at Ad Hoc, a digital services company that works with government agencies to better serve their customers. He's worked in industry and government, including as one of the small handful of experts brought in by the White House to help fix healthcare.gov and ultimately launch a massive surge in digital government efforts. He's also served as a presidential innovation fellow, a private sector executive, and worked with many federal agencies to improve in digital services and CX. Second, we have Sean Modi, who's the founder and CEO of Capital AI, a venture-backed technology company that empowers anyone to create creative content with AI. He's been named one of Business Insider's top 75 designers in technology. He's one of the founding designers of Airbnb, where he worked side-by-side -side with CEO Brian Chesky at the start to articulate and design Airbnb's full customer journey and user experience. He's designed software products for Google, the White House, the Department of Defense, NASA, Motorola, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, and more. And finally, we have Camille Tucker, who is Acting Chief Customer Officer at the General Services Administration, or GSA, where she leads the agency's Office of Customer Experience, focusing solely on improving CX and fostering a customer-first mentality. Previously, she led OCE's Customer Insights and Voice of the Customer Program, responsible for customer research governance and working with GSA teams to generate insights about customer sentiment. So a huge welcome to this impressive group, and I will now pass it over to Greg, who will moderate our friendly debate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Drew, and thanks to everyone at the uh, Census uh, Open Innovation Labs for having us here today. Uh, really, really exciting. I've been a big fan of uh, the Opportunity Project and uh, the various different events over the years, and it's a real honor uh, to be here and to be a part uh, of, uh, of today's summit. Um, we're going to jump right in. Uh, we've got a half an hour. We've got a lot of topics to discuss. So uh, we're going to open things up with the, with the big question that we are here today to talk about. Are we delivering? Is the federal government getting better at CX uh, to kick off? Uh, can everyone share their initial thoughts? And and before we do that, you know, uh, it, it, there's there's you know, when we talk about customer experience, I think it does help a little bit to give definition. So um, as you talk about, you know, are we doing are we getting better uh, or not uh, as a federal government? It might help to talk a little bit about, you know, what aspect of CX you're uh, or what perspective on it you're you're talking about. Um, uh, Camille, do you want to start us off? Sure, happy to. Um, so at GSA, we define customer experience as the sum of all of a customer's uh, interactions with an agency, an organization, a business, um, whatever, wherever you're coming from. Um, and so I think uh, with my acting CCO hat on, I think a resounding yes. Uh, I think we have gotten better at CX. Are we perfect? No, of course not. I think it would be uh, 
a total falsehood to say that we're perfect at it. But I do think we have made a lot of strides in the last several years in institutionalizing CX uh, and institutionalizing that customer first mindset um, across the federal government. I have a lot more to say, but I'll let uh, I'll let Sean give his uh, first thoughts. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And uh, honored to be here. Um, yeah, I agree with Camille. There is has been so much progress. I did a bunch of work on CX uh, with previous administration and and as in the bio with the DOD. And, you know, we were teaching people what CX as a concept was. You know, we led with the term design, but that didn't really land with policymakers and agency heads and, and, and generals. So we changed to customer experience. But what's wonderful is that there's CX talent across the federal government. So that's a huge, a huge step forward. However, the quality of the customer experience is still abysmal. The federal government is not delivering a great experience to citizens, whether it's from get, renewing your passport or trying to get a COVID test. I just did that uh, yesterday or two days ago to test it. And uh, on the USPS alert, it says that the COVID test will be expired, but don't worry about it. It's just expired. So there's these things that like, huh, what's going on here? But at least designers and the voice of the customer is in the room. Now the question is, how do we empower these professionals who are doing, who, are, who could go get a job in industry any day? Um, how do we empower them to be more effective? That's, that's what I'm hoping we can discuss today. Yeah, I, I'll I'll just agree with both of you. I think you know, obviously, there's been a lot of progress. Um, you know, the the I'll call it you know ten or twelve years that I've been working in government, um, uh, starting with my PIF project, which the title was or the charge of our project was to reimagine how people interact with government online. You know, uh, just I, I think we've seen a lot of progress. At the same time, I think there are just there are a lot of challenges. Uh, you know, large organizations, um, especially ones that, uh, you know, ha have very specific and silo silos within their organizations um, that that we just sort of inherently expose to the outside world and 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 burden people with navigating in order to accomplish things with government. Um, that was a problem. That was kind of like the, the main problem we identified. Uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, when we when we started addressing that problem of, you know, how do people experience working, uh, interacting with government? Um, and still today, I think those that remains challenges uh, that people, you know, view, uh, they view government as one holistic entity, uh, and yet they're forced to uh, interact with it based on how it's structured bureaucratically. Uh, and so I think there's still a lot of challenges there for us to, uh, to think about and overcome um, but, you know, I think it starts at the agency level and, and that's been uh, that's been where I think we've seen a lot of progress. Um, so I sort of answered uh, uh, that the next question uh, there with my with my answer. But what experiences have you had in government uh, that shape your opinion on this? You know, what are some things that you have seen uh, where you have seen progress in CX or, you know, maybe challenges where you've seen it uh, not not uh, progressing? I'll let Camille take that first. Happy to. Um, so I, I started working with the Office of Customer Experience seven years ago this month. So over the last seven years, um, Sean, you touched on this a little bit, but I have more peers now than I had seven years ago, people who are working full time in the CX space. Um, and that's one of the big changes I've seen. And I think that in some agencies, that is sort of that bottom up approach where it's folks who have been doing this type of work for a really long time. They just haven't had like the customer experience vocabulary to use. Um, and so it's folks like now having those words, those tools at their fingertips where they can start doing this or continue to do this work, but in like a more visible way. Um, I think in some places too, we've seen a lot more um, authority granted to CX teams. I'd love to see a lot more. And I, I would love to talk about that later today too. Um, but we see more authority with CX teams where they can lead initiatives. CX isn't just like an add on something that's like nice to have that's easy to cut when budgets are tight, but CX is like an integrated part of initiatives or CX initiatives are being led out of dedicated teams. Um, and so I think we see a lot more of that in the federal government. Um, and that's really I, exciting. I'd love to hear more about that just from the perspective of, you know, where you're situated in the agency yeah. and, you know, uh, how you how you have how are you empowered or not um, to interact with other parts of the agency? Uh, that's one of the most fascinating things for me. You know, when I look at different agencies and their initiatives around CX, every agency is different in the way that they're structured. 
Um, and so, you know, what, something that works at one place doesn't necessarily work at other agencies. Um, so it's definitely has to be bespoke to the agency, but I, it's something that's fascinating to me. Um, so maybe we'll get a chance to dig in on that a little bit more. I'll let Sean share some of his experiences. Yeah, well, my, I guess my um, real boots on the ground training was when COVID broke out. And, you know, I volunteered to help out with the uh, White House's response. So launching FAQ.coronavirus.gov, uh, working on supply chain tools for Northcom NORAD to understand the impact of, of COVID uh, on North America and U.S. interests, as well as National Guard, uh, and bringing a user-centered mindset to developing these tools. So what we saw with FAQ.coronavirus.gov was the agencies did not know how to share data properly. So across HHS, you know, there was a lot of smart doctors and professionals, but they didn't have the infrastructure set up to load information to a CMS where and we could build a front end on top of it to make that queryable for, for citizens. So there was a lot of um, like structural challenges for customer experience professionals to be able to deliver and do their job. But then there was also like, hey, what is this designer doing in the room? Uh, and especially in a military context, like who is this person? Why are they here? What's their authority to operate? And so there was a lot of explaining and communicating of, hey, to build a product that's useful and has commercial viability in the private sector, design is compulsory, user customer experience is compulsory, otherwise you'll go out of business. And for a DOD use case, it would be, what is the training time? What is the ability to interoperate and actually lower your costs so you can bring in newer AI models or new data sets um, and allow more people to touch the same digital artifacts? So there was a lot of that explaining that that happened. Another thing we did do is put the foundations down for this CX executive order. So I'm glad to see that carry on regardless of the politics. This is a non-political issue, obviously. Um, the challenge I still see though across the government, there's this, there's all these like wonderful design uh, uh, artifacts and human resources across, across the gov. You have the United States digital web system, which is this really great UI system that's not being adopted by federal agencies. For what reason? I do not know. If you go to NOAA.gov, it looks like it's out of 1992. Yeah, I'm clicking around on CDC site now. A lot of the links don't work. Um, so the agency heads should be accountable for adopting these wonderful design assets that we've already built. So that's the first thing. Uh, so having some type of enforcement mechanism, it should be a carrot, not a stick, but Folks need to be accountable to deliver a consistent UX across agencies. Citizens don't think in terms of uh, agencies, they think in terms of an experience. Uh, and what we saw with COVID, more and more agencies need to work together. That's the first thing. The second thing is there should be a head of customer experience across every federal agency, and there should be uh, a head of customer experience in, in the White House that coordinates and works collaboratively across these agencies. And until that leader is there, and until enforcement mechanisms uh, that hold agency head, heads accountable for their quality of customer experience, I'm not optimistic about seeing great design across the federal government. Yeah, Sean, you make some really good points there. I think um, one thing I, I will double click on, um, I think the CX executive order was fantastic. Um, it's And, you know, just going around government and talking to folks, you know, it's clear that it has really empowered a lot of folks to have a seat at the table. Um, and for agencies to start thinking about how to incorporate that into, uh, you know, into what it is that they do. Um, but like with, uh, you know, I will say just to kind of echo your thoughts. Uh, one thing that we also hear a lot of is that there's there's not necessarily the funding that comes with it. Right. And so um, that's that's an important thing. I think an executive order is really powerful. Um, but maybe there's uh, opportunities to push for some kind of congressional action. Um, that will result in, you know, these things being funded. If they're important, um, that's probably the right mechanism um, to bolster uh, the great, uh, you know, kind of support that we've gotten through those executive orders uh, as well. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit of, of the experiences I've had um, and, you know, kind of uh, echoes a little bit of, uh, of what you've uh, talked about, Sean. Uh, you know, when I was a PIF, when we did that project, we had a lot of the same, you know, the same kind of conclusions um, around design and centralized services. Um, you know, we prototyped what became login.gov as like, there should be a consistent experience when you're logging into any government website, um, you know, that that you shouldn't have to have 15 different passwords uh, across different, different agencies, let alone, uh, you know, within the same agency. Um, the experience that I've had, which has given me a lot of hope, um, we kind of took that model 
Um, and then uh, found, uh, you know, we're able to work with great partners at VA, um, the chief technology officers, uh, uh, Marina Martin, NHTSA, and uh, followed up by Charles Worthington. You know, we worked with them to conceive of Vets.gov, which was, uh, you know, kind of reimagining VA's, VA's online presence from the perspective of veterans, like what would be important to veterans um, instead of it being a web page where it's, you know, the latest policy notes or message from the secretary it's it it you know it's like start straight off with apply for benefits you know check your claim status things like that um we took that from a proof of concept um all the way up to it is now if you go to va.gov it's on va.gov and so um that that has been uh, i'd say for us you know one of the big uh the big proof points you know now we're doing a mobile app for them um that that is also uh something that has gotten great uh great reviews you know that their idea that um uh, that that was a, a new way in which you know people relied upon for experiences the mobile the mobile avenue um really i think uh really made a big difference and i think it all comes back to you know finding a way to get in between the bureaucracy exposing itself direct directly and thinking about that experience primarily um, and helping orient things around that so um, those have been things i think that have pushed that forward um we talked a little bit, Sean, you you addressed a little bit of this, so maybe we'll go over to Camille, but what is your vision for the near future of government CX and how can we get there? Um, Sean, you talked about the design, you know, cohesiveness and things like that, which I think there's kind of like two things. There's within the agency and then there's, you know, more broadly as, as a single entity. Uh, but Camille, I'd love to get your thoughts on what you see as kind of the next steps. Yeah, I think I, I did want to go back to something that Sean yeah, said, sure. um, especially about like, the U.S. web design system. That is that is by law agencies need to implement the U.S. web design system. That was the 21st Century Idea Act of a few years ago. And agencies are making progress there. Greg, you touched on funding as a limitation, I think. And this is where I'm getting into like the vision for the future. I think there is a disconnect between digital experience and customer experience and how we think about those two things. Um, in my mind, and the way we treat it at GSA, the customer experience is sort of the umbrella and like digital is part yeah. of what plays into that experience. But there are all kinds of like processes, procedures, infrastructure, personnel limitations that influence how we come across in our digital space. And so that like kind of like, it's almost like a cultural difference where program teams that own a service, they own a product, don't think about their digital presence as that service or product. It's an expression of their service or product, but it's not the thing that they offer. And so given the choice and funding between continuing to fund a, a specific aspect of the service or making improvements to the website, they're going to fund that service because that's their primary objective. Yeah. So I think like as we move into the future of CX in the government, I'd like to see more cohesiveness across customer experience and then how digital supports that overall customer experience, because digital is not the only channel through which we provide services. Um, I fully agree with Sean. I would love to see a federal chief customer officer. I'd also love to see a, a chief customer officer council. Um, you know, the, the White House sponsors CIO council, the chief human capital officer council, CFO council. And I think we need a way to, um, to elevate CX and give CX more authority, more visibility, and then more opportunities for customer experience folks to work across agencies. Um, I think in a lot of places, CX is still bucketed under IT. We need to pull CX out of IT and make it standalone. At GSA, we're, we're standalone. We're a mission support function, like at the same table as HR and IT and budget and finance. Um, and I think that's the best practice um, for, for elevating CX and really giving CX professionals and chief customer officers the authority um, to lead and to run these types of initiatives. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd like to see in the near term. Yeah. I think I think the point you make uh, and is a really important one. I think it you know the digital experience is one that we, uh, especially my background as a software engineer, and I think Sean's as a designer. Um, you know we tend to think a lot in terms of the digital experience, but it really is much more, um, and it's important that it's much more because of you know uh, making government accessible to uh, as broad uh, an audience as possible through various different means. Um, you know, and so uh, I think uh, I really appreciate you you uh, 
you know, noting that. And, and, you know, I think that helps you, that helps, helps you see CX as something that is uh, discrete and, and needs to be in a different place within an agency in order to really have its full effect and impact. Um, yeah, Sean, one, one example. Anything you want I'll, to add? Yeah. Yeah. I'll jump in on the, the re this is a recent experience I had with, with the uh, state department uh, of renewing my son's passport. So uh, it, we, I, you know, did all the steps uh, that I was instructed to do. I went to the post office and uh, I guess we used a broker to help move it along faster. One of these third party services that are recommended. Uh, and then I was instructed by the, the uh, clerk at the post office to, okay, ship away my son's passport. And I found out from the company you shouldn't have shipped the passport and we were going on a trip. And so we tried calling State Department, uh, the passport services, and we stayed online for hours. I'm not kidding, hours on, on the phone. Um, so one, that's like disrespectful to the customer, right? You're, you're not respecting the customer's time by making her, the, your family. My wife did it. I did it. We had our assistant do it. Assistants try. Didn't, no pickup. Then we finally got through and said, nope, you need to call within this window. And uh, I ended up emailing our local Congress representative in Washington, D.C., to expedite it, because that was what I was told, the only thing that could get things moving. Luckily, and then they said, call us back when it gets closer. We did it. Finally got a passport. Uh, but the original passport's MIA. We never got it back. We have no idea where it is. Um, and and State Department, I'm not calling again. So when we, when we talk about customer experience, I completely agree. It's not just digital. But we need customer experience professionals to not just like be the emergency band-aid after the system is already so like, hey, laser fix. We'll just, login.gov is amazing. I think it's one of the most innovative things because it's so high leverage. And it's like, it's like, it's so obvious. It's right. It's incredible. Um, but the question is like, how do you rework from a first principles perspective, the entire passport application renewal process? And how do you measure what success looks like? And customer experience professionals, whether it be service designers, you know, uh, behavioral scientists, researchers, UX, UI designers, um, they should all be working in a multidisciplinary uh, fashion to, to create an experience and then be measured uh, measure the performance of what they create. So that's an example of of something where I I I'd like to see radically improved because it's just miserable um, yeah. <laughs> from a citizen perspective. Yeah, I think I think you touch on a really important point there, which is that you know a lot of government uh, historically, um, you know, despite like I, I think we kind of think of it as like you know the individual's role in government is you know you go to the polls, you 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 vote in an election, and then it's representative government and you know, everything is going to kind of flow from there. But there's this like really direct interaction that people have where, you know, in order to make changes, it feels like it has to go through this massive machinery. So much of interacting with government, you know, uh, if a veteran doesn't get, you know, applies for benefits and is denied, you know, it's almost like a legal process that they have to go through, right? Like, and and it, it's it's very impersonal. It's very lengthy. It's very, you know, uh, arcane, uh, and, you know, sometimes even costly and expensive. Um, I think there's, you know, there, there is there is a culture in government, which is very much that I think, you know, and, and you know, we're entering a world where, you know, I can reserve a car, have a car, meet me wherever I am by clicking, a, you know, an app on my phone, um, you know, never speaking to a to a person or having to certainly, you know, if the car doesn't pick me up, I don't have to, like, go get a lawyer to get a refund or something like that. Right. So there's just we 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 have these big disparities between what we've become accustomed to in our everyday lives and the way that government is kind of traditionally used to functioning. And I think it's going to take it's going to take a concerted effort to kind of catch up um, and to uh, to to instill that more more deeply within the culture, uh, you know, and, and and have that permeate down into the levels of, you know, again, like to me, it's just so much of the organization uh, you know, the way the government is structured um, and uh, and those kinds of things. So um, great, great discussion there. Um, we kind of touched on. So the next question was around pain points or issues. We kind of touched on that. Um, uh, I'm looking through the questions because we've got about, you know, maybe four minutes left. Um, and I want to hit some uh, some good questions here. Uh, let's go down to. Uh, there was a question here about something and I'm not seeing it now. So let's, let's do this one. Um, how do your experiences in industry and government 
compare in terms of responsiveness to customer needs? So maybe this is kind of going back to a little bit of what I had just talked about. But, you know, Sean, I'd love to hear maybe some of your experiences from, you know, Airbnb and, you know, Camille, I'd be really interested, you know, every government agency is essentially a business that, you know, it's a business that's operating inside government and be curious to hear where you've, uh, you know, if you've had the opportunity to draw inspiration from, you know, any of any commercial, you know, kinds of par uh, parallels to the kinds of things that GSA does. Yeah, well, I'll just quickly touch on Airbnb. Uh, I'll, I'll let Camille go. Um, so Airbnb is a fascinating company. It, it you know, started as you know startup in a in a in a spare bedroom or with an air mattress, and now operates in every country in the world except for North Korea and Iran. Uh, uh, last time I checked, um, and uh, that and it's an online offline experience. You you you, you search for your, your uh, destination. You you see if it's the right price, the right accommodations, uh, the right uh, you know, hospitality bar. And uh, then you you transact, and then you trust that when you show up, uh, the actual listing is representative of what you purchased, and you trust that it'll be safe. So that's a that's a that's a, a human in real life experience, and that's a digital experience. So there's a lot of overlap between government, whether you're a farmer, you know, trying to get crop insurance, uh, or you're getting food food assist, assistance through SNAP program. These things are really important, and uh, I, I thought you know thinking online and offline. Uh, from a design with a capital D, when I say like being a big design, not just aesthetics, uh, that, uh, that, that the huge, huge le lessons learned there. The second thing I just will touch on, you know, generative AI is the most transformative technological development in computing in our lifetimes. Uh, I believe, on our, you know, everyone who's alive today, this will this will transform how we interact with machines. And you know, we're just trying to catch up on CX as is. Let's not forget this wave that's here. And that is going to the government is going to fundamentally have to rework how uh, human computer interaction, citizen computer interaction uh, transpires over the next you know decade. Uh, Camille, I'll pass to you. Yeah, I, I agree. In, in both cases, you know, I think with the recent AI executive order, there's a, there's an impetus for agencies to take action on AI. Um, and and on the design piece, like we we have a service design program within the office customer experience at GSA. And so we're trying to like push forward that like big D design. It's not just aesthetics. It's not just what a website looks like. It's how we how we organize ourselves, what our processes look like, um, how we get to like from this point to this point. Um, but I and I so I think yes, we can take inspiration there. Where I'll I'll throw in the caution is that the government the government can't operate like a business because there are a lot of things that the private sector won't do that the government has to do. Um, and so I think like as long as we as long as that's the case, where I think it's always going to be the case, um, the motivation for customer experience is going to be different in the federal government. Um, and I think like this is where like I'll throw in like my favorite plug for like employee empowerment, right? Like the employees who are working in the federal government, they want to be there. They want to work for the greater good. And so I think like that's the motivation that I see really fueling CX moving forward. Um, and I think like that's a great uh, inspiration. Awesome. Yeah. I Agree with all that and appreciate you sharing those perspectives. Um, I think we're kind of at time. I don't know if we have much time left, uh, but before Drew cuts uh, cuts me off, I'll I'll just end off on um, you know maybe real quick just to put you on the spot. If you happen to have a, a have you had an interaction with government which has delighted you uh, recently or you know that kind of thing? Let's end on a good note uh, on 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 some of the positive things that are that are going on. Uh, I live in the the city of Spokane, and I got a in Spokane, Washington. And I got a notification last night about a missing vulnerable adult, and they called me and texted me and emailed me. And I think like that was a really successful notification system. It's not delightful that someone was in crisis, but I think it's great that um, that I as just like you know Jane Citizen got that notification um, in through many different channels. Sean, any uh, any highlights? Um, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, I haven't seen anything great. I think it's uh, the best, the best part, as I said earlier, is th there's now the people are in the room, which is awesome, but I still think the, the user experiences is, is, would not meet the bar of, of any company I would run. So we got, we got work to do. All right. Fair enough. Uh, I'll just give a quick plug again for the VA mobile app. Uh, which uh, I think, uh, you know, 
really uh it, it has been uh really uh, uh a real boon for veterans uh uh if you're out there and you're a veteran uh i i'd encourage you to give it uh give it a uh give it a try um and uh it's got very good ratings in the app store so we're very proud of that and uh, so um uh i think that's uh that's all we'll have time for drew thank you so much for having us Well, thank you all so, so much. Um, absolutely loved to hear that discussion. And thank you for the candor. Um, I just want to say, you know, we we really appreciate you joining and sharing your experience very candidly, because like Sean said, you know, all of this work is not political. It cuts across administrations and so does transparency and the, you know, the importance of having these kinds of candid conversations with the public about how we're doing and really assessing that are so important and should transcend administration. So thank you for being a part of that. And I, I also think, you know, we've all either currently or maybe in the past or future have or will do our part to come into government for a tour of duty. And part of that is working to make things better. It's not, you know, pretending that things are rosy when they're not. So um, very, very grateful for all that you you guys have done. And, and thank you so much again for joining us today. So I will now turn it back over to Thera Naiman, who will take us into our next session, spotlighting student and university contributions to top this year. Hi, everyone. I'm Thera Naiman, Innovation Program Manager at COIL. This fall, we were thrilled to host the largest top university cohort to date, with over 70 students from 13 different universities joining us for this year's sprints. Over the course of the fall semester, the talented student teams tackled two different challenges, improving access to electrical power for climate resilience, led by the Department of Energy, and promoting competition in the credit card market, led by the CFPB. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Anna to kick off the first panel. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Valuev, and I served as Deputy Director of the Opportunity Project before heading off to business school last year. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, back in 2020, um, we launched the first ever university program, which works with university computer and data science, engineering, and other courses to invite groups of students to develop data-driven digital products in collaboration with government agencies and potential users, all aligned to the fall semester. Through this program, we wanted to create opportunities for students to gain hands-on technical experience and learn about ways they could use these skills to positively impact the world. It's incredible to see the program has just completed its fourth year, and I'm always blown away by the entrepreneurial and innovative spirit the students bring to these challenges. Um, today, I'm very excited to um, host this panel with two of our participants and um, leaders in the university sprint um, of fall 2023. So without further ado, do, I'll turn it over first um, to Deborah to introduce herself and then um, over to Scott to introduce himself. And then we'll dive into some of these wonderful questions um, that we'll discuss over the next 20 minutes. Over to you, Deborah. Hello, I'm Deborah Center. I currently serve as the Senior Advisor of Energy Justice Policy and Analysis at the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Energy Justice and Equity. Our office conducts research and analysis to support a clean and just energy transition. It's important to recognize that historically, our country's energy systems have not been particularly just. For example, nearly 70% of African Americans live within 30 miles of coal-fired power plants. This is where the health impacts from air pollution are most prevalent. Grid reliability has also been unjust, with low-income and renting households suffering longer duration outages. The injustice in energy reliability was the motivation for this year's top sprint. Through partnership with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Oak Ridge National Lab Laboratory, we were able to amass several data sets from across the federal government, which became the basis for the sprints. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm really excited to, to dig into a lot more of that. And now I'll turn it over to Scott to introduce himself before we dive into the conversation. Thank you so much, Anna, for the chance to join this important panel. So I'm Scott Auerbach. I'm a chemistry professor and a chemical engineering professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I've been here since 1995, and I've also am also am the founder and the uh, executive director of the UMass Icons program since 2009. 
So ICON stands for Integrated Concentration in STEM, and it's a 20 credit uh, 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 certificate program for all undergrads majoring in some field of business or STEM to work on real world problems and problems of the of the choosing of our students. Uh, to date, ICONS is focused on areas in health, health of people, health of the planet, as well as clean energy and uh, uh, equitable access to energy. And it's that last area that um, uh, overlapped really perfectly with this sprint. Um, so given all that, the fact that the university sprint uh, it was a perfect fit because ICOMS is all about diverse teams of students working on today's big problems. And it seems like the uh, opportunity project in the sprint is about the same thing. So it's a perfect fit, match made in, match made in heaven. Thank you so much, Scott. And we were so happy um, that the students from UMass were able to participate um, in the sprint uh, and really excited that you're both here to join us for this conversation. So my first question is for Deborah. Um, the top university sprint that you led this year was actually the first ever top sprint to choose only to work with student teams. Could you tell us a little bit about how this sprint came about and why it was important for you to prioritize working with university students specifically? Absolutely. The road to justice is long, and it's important that we invite the youth to travel on this road with us. They are the future leaders of energy justice. So prior to my current role with the federal government, I was an assistant professor at Tufts University, and I've had the privilege to work with college students. They are some of the most optimistic and creative people I know, and they're not afraid to ask questions. When developing the Sprint data sets, we really want to get feedback on the public usability of the data, for example, one of the data sets lab labeled a column meters, which was supposed to stand for electrical meters to indicate the number of electricity customers. However, several students interpret this as meters of distance and couldn't make sense of the data. So this led to improved labeling of the federal data sets and more detailed supporting documentation. Wonderful. I'm so glad that the students were able to help with that data accuracy and um, and that we could see the data continue to be improved. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned that you are also um, an assistant professor at Tufts and um, it's in the departments of civil and environmental engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. So it's, it's quite um, multidisciplinary. I'm curious what made you come into government in the per first place and how your academic background has informed your approach working in government and what you might say to other university faculty thinking about a tour of duty in government? Yeah, well, the first time I came to the government was as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. It was right after I completed my PhD, and I wanted to better understand the role of the federal government in moving research out of the laboratory and into widespread adoption to reach national goals, such as fighting climate change. And I used what I learned from that experience to shape my academic research to apply data science and exploring how technology innovation and policy can impact clean and just energy transitions. As for my current role with the Office of Energy Justice and Equity, I was personally invited to this position by Shalanda Baker, the nation's first ever Deputy Director for Energy Justice and the current Director of the Office of Energy Justice and Equity. She was familiar with my work using data analytics to quantify racial disparities in U.S. rooftop solar adoption. These racial and ethnic disparities existed even after correcting for income and home ownership. And she wanted to bring my data science expertise into the office to facilitate data-driven decision-making. Now for the last part of your question was, what would I say to other university faculty about a tour of duty in the government? So first, I really like your use of the word tour of duty as I do see my role as a service to my country. If other faculty are asked to serve our country, I hope they will. Faculty members are experts in their fields and the government may need your expertise to make national decisions. Academia and government are very different sectors, so the faculty member will likely be challenged, but ultimately grow in this experience. And this growth will make them better faculty members when they return to the university. One of the challenges of traditional academic pipelines is that many of the professors have only ever worked in academia Yet many of the students they are teaching will pursue careers in other sectors. So you'll be able to better advise and mentor students interested in working in the government after you yourself have some experience in that arena. So for your country and for your students, I would encourage all faculty who are called to serve in the government to give it great consideration. 
Thanks so much for that perspective and for bringing that wonderful expertise into government and then and then back into academia afterwards. It's wonderful to hear about. Um, I now have a question for Scott. I'm curious mm -hmm. if you could tell us your impressions about the student products that came out of the sprint and whether there was anything that surprised you about the projects and where you hope to see the tools going in the future. I'm happy to hear about any examples um, that you'd like to mm -hmm. highlight of the products as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Anna. So the the thing that immediately struck me was the diversity of the missions of the various teams, all under the umbrella that uh, Dr. Sunter had laid out in the sprint. But um, this is one of, and, and it wasn't at all planned. It's sort of an organic result of the crowdsourcing approach that the Opportunity Project is using. I mean, for example, there were, you, you know, the focus is what happens if there's a huge storm electrical outage, but inequity in the restoration time. So the time it takes to get back the power, some areas may get it back quickly, some areas may not. And is there uh, inequity in that? So um, some teams made uh, pre-emergency tools to guide policy like dashboards that easily display tons of information. Um, the ICONS team made a during emergency tool to guide emergency you know responses to more vulnerable populations and then there were pre and post emergency tools to help social service uh, uh, organizations obtain funding and this was not at all uh, arranged or you know scripted it just is uh, came out of it um, and I think that that's an awesome feature of the way that this works I also think of students themselves as products of this experience. And I can tell you that the icons, but the not, the, the all the students seem totally engaged. And I think a key feature is the freedom for students and student teams to choose the mission that was important to them. You know, psychologists have been telling us that freedom in education, so students having the freedom to choose the, the problems they wanna solve and the ways they think it's important to solve them is essential for them to be a hundred percent in, and I think that we saw that. That's so wonderful to hear about the diversity of projects and just how um, how excited the students were to to lend their perspectives and their expertise, which I'm sure were entirely different than had we brought in um, private sector technology companies or another group of of individuals. So that's and wonder just wonderful to hear how great of an experience it was. Um, and Deborah, I'm curious your impressions of the student projects and where you hope to see them going in the future. Sure. So I've participated in several hackathons, which typically last only one to three days. And so many of these hackathons conclude with only a few working demos, and the demos that are working are often for a small case study or subset of the data. And I was really impressed how all the teams had working demos by the end of the sprint, and many had coverage for the entire United States. And just echoing what Scott said, I was really impressed by the diversity of the solutions that the different university teams were able to create from interactive dashboards and apps to insightful regressions and optimization models to natural language processing and clustering algorithms. So the, the solutions were incredibly diverse. I was also really impressed to see how the projects changed over time. It wasn't that long ago that the students showcased their project ideas at the Department of Energy's Justice Week. And it was great to see how much the projects were refined based on feedback that they received see both from uh, top sprint user advocates and, and subject matter experts, as well as participants at Justice Week. And I'm very excited to see where the students take these projects in the future. And I hope these projects will continue to get refined and be made public. Some student teams have already partnered, um, set up partnerships for piloting their tools. Um, one of the participating data stewards asked if they could show their sponsors the recordings of the student demos as a way to improve utility awareness and increase participation in open and transparent data sharing. So there's a lot of different avenues of uh, ways that the projects can continue to impact um, the country's electrical grid and energy justice. So I'm excited to see where it goes. It's great to hear how iterative the the projects really were, and that's the intention for them to to really represent um, the user advocates and um, experts and folks on the ground. So I'm so happy to hear that uh, that that really came to fruition, and so wonderful to hear about the pilots and um, all the further kind of work and highlighting that's happening from these products. It sounds like a really fantastic um, experience. Um, 
And so I'm curious, Scott, um, having kind of participated in the program and, and led the group of students through the sprint, what are you hoping that the students gained from participating in the sprint? Yeah, that's a great question. And the funny thing is my hopes are almost always underestimating what ends up happening. So I'd like to actually emphasize more on what the students got. And the reason why I can say that is that in all of our uh, ICONS projects, there's always sort of a post project you know, reflection where students basically say, answer two prompts. Uh, what did I, what was a big thing that I learned? And if I had to do it over again, what would I do differently? And there's so much wisdom gained there. Um, so I, I, I sort of uh, stole a couple excerpts from them. And I can share with you that, for example, being able to speak concisely and essentialize a message was critical, not only for making the briefings. I mean, it's exciting. Every three weeks, the students are making a briefing to the federal government. You know, it's very different from like turning in a quiz. <laughs> so um, so they, they realized that, wow, communication in such a setting, um, being able to get my message across, essentialize it is key, but also working within the teams because uh, there's a lot of communication that has to happen behind the scenes within the teams to move the needle on these projects. Another one was not getting too siloed too soon. So how do you manage a diverse team towards uh, a product, you know, a product solution with a serious deadline. Uh, so they really learned about, uh, you know, management and problem solving, project management. Um, and then one that I loved is the confidence to know that I can do hard things. So it's not only skills, but it's also attitudes. Attitudes, you know, we say attitudes are the... Um, fertile ground for new skills and skills are the fertile ground for gaining knowledge. So they're gaining attitudes that they're going to take with them for the rest of their lives. Super important and exciting. That's great. And so interesting to hear that actually a lot of those takeaways aren't about the technical skills, but rather about the collaboration and kind of soft skills of working in a team, working with external stakeholders, and that's relevant to any field or or discipline that they go into afterwards. For sure. Um, and over to you, Deborah. I actually want to ask you, um, as you reflect back on this experience, we'd love to hear what guidance you have for other agencies who might be looking to engage with universities, what words of advice or thoughts you have for them as they look forward to those sorts of partnerships. Yeah, definitely. Um, so first, I'd say it's important to recognize that universities and the government can work on very different timescales. Uh, university classes are typically taught at defined periods, such as semesters, and these are pretty rigid. Um, professors often determine which classes they'll be teaching months and sometimes even years in advance. In contrast, the government is responsive to the changing national needs and changes in leadership. And I think it's important for federal agencies interested in doing a university top sprint to advertise to universities early, very early, so that the opportunities can be integrated into the academic structure. I would also encourage encourage the agencies to advertise broadly to public, private, and minority serving institutions, and recognize that the available resources at different institutions vary substantially. So not all institutions will have access to data servers, for example. And ideally, agencies would provide funding to support the less resourced institutions so that they'd be able to participate fully. Absolutely. Those are some of the insights that we've been learning along the way as well. So thanks so much for highlighting those. Um, and I really hope that other agencies also consider engaging with students in the future, either through opportunity project sprints or other partnerships or programs. Um, and Scott, in your view, why is it important for institutions of higher education to embrace programs like TOP that allow students to tackle real world problems in such a collaborative manner? You know, and I love that question. Thank you so much for asking that. That's the kind of thing that gets me up in the morning. Um, so to me, it's really about the central mission of higher education, which is, I think there's a twofold aspect. It's preparing our students to succeed in the real world and equipping our students to change the real world for the better. And notice those two things are kind of different, but they both have a, a very common theme, which is the real world. And that means that our students need experiential learning, giving students practice at solving real world problems. It's like if you want to be able to run a race, but all you ever do is swim, how are you going to be ready for the game, for the race? 
And so these kinds of opportunities are so engaging for our students. Like I said, it's it's not turning in a quiz at the end of the week. It's briefing the federal government on the progress that you made. Um, uh, some of the feedback that I've gotten from the icons, the UMass icon students, is that this was the most exciting project they've worked on in college. So from the standpoint of the needs of our students, they absolutely need this to be able to gain the skills. From the standpoint of what the world needs, the world needs students who had experience in solving real world problems. So it's a win-win for sure. That's so great to hear. And I saw Deborah's face light up when you said that it was their favorite um, mm -hmm. project of, of their university experience. So I'm so glad to hear that. Um, and really just kind of a testament to um, to the wonderful experience that all of the students had. So now in our last two minutes, I'd like to ask each of you what kind of advice you would give to students in the sprint or otherwise who are interested in continuing to work in the energy justice field. Um, I'll start with you, Deborah. So first I'd like to say there are many different pathways that you can take to work in energy justice. Uh, you can work in academia for nonprofit organizations, also for the government at local, state, or federal levels. Since I've already had a couple students in the sprint ask me how to find a position in the federal government, I'll focus my answer on that. So I'd like to start with the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education, or ORISE for short. ORISE oh. offers a variety of internships and fellowships for students and graduates at all levels, so undergraduate, graduate, postdoc. ORISE can place students in the Department of Energy, but also other federal agencies. Another fellowship program I would like to mention is the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. So you, rem you might remember that this is the fellowship program I mentioned earlier um, as what first brought me to DC. This fellowship program provides opportunities for scientists and engineers to learn firsthand about policymaking and contribute their knowledge and analytical skills in the policy realm. So fellows serve a year-long assignment in the federal government and represent a broad range of backgrounds, disciplines, and career stages. So lastly, there are many openings in the federal government, and these can be found on usajobs.gov. Um, and this website has a lot of jobs, so it can be a little a bit overwhelming, but there is a filter for students and recent graduates that can help uh, focus your search. And a lot of students, especially in STEM, can be hesitant to apply to the federal government jobs. And I would tell them, just go for it. The government is working increasingly on making data-driven decisions, and your STEM education has trained you in these analytical skills. Thanks so much for those words of wisdom, Deborah. So helpful. Um, and now over to you, Scott. Curious what advice you would give to students who are interested in continuing in this in this field. Yeah, so thank you so much. My advice is definitely complementary to what uh, Dr. Sunter had to offer because mine is super general. And that is, um, look for a good opportunity, but don't wait for the perfect opportunity. This is something that I'm seeing. Uh, students who are looking for jobs or internships um, are have this idea, this image of what the perfect opportunity is. And it will, and an and amazing opportunity will come, but don't wait for that. Instead, take a good opportunity, get some experience, build a network, because that will lead to your next very good opportunity. And that will lead to the next, maybe a great opportunity and so on. Bottom line is the first job you get is not your last job. So stay open, stay open-minded, open-hearted, and wonderful things will come your way. Great advice and such a wonderful note to end uh, today's panel on. I'd just like to thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation and for the incredible collaboration and partnership this fall. I'm so excited to continue following the trajectories of the students and the products um, that came out of this sprint. And we're really looking forward to the rest of today's agenda um, in the top, uh, top summit. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to Anna, Deborah, and Scott. Your support and leadership have been crucial in making this sprint a success. Now, let's hear from some of the students that participated in the top university program this fall, working on the other problem statement, promoting competition in the credit card market. Nat, please feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. For those who recently tuned in, my name is Nat Weber, Program Manager in the CFPB's Office of Competition and Innovation. Our problem statement focused on promoting competition in the credit card market. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank each of our panelists, your teammates, and schools for participating in the tech sprint. Um, 
To start, I'm going to ask each member of the panel to introduce themselves and their teams and answer our first question. What did your team design and why? How did it respond to our problem statement? Start us off, I'll ask the Suffix team to go. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Mose, uh, along with uh, Unique Scott and uh, Caitlin uh, McNey. We uh, developed knowyourcards.org, which is an online portal for comparing credit cards, learning about credit card and fin personal finance information, being able to connect to uh, social media influencers and content creators that are reputable and trusted sources of information. And through that, uh, through that platform, we've been able to uh, hit all of the core requirements of the project, as well as uh, some things that we've decided uh, would be interesting avenues of exploration for new features and functions for any individual uh, consumer looking for future credit products as they go about the beginning stages of their financial journey. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Nick from Columbia to, to introduce his team and, and product. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick. I'm the product lead for the Columbia Tech team. So to kind of, before I dive into the solution, maybe I'll start off with the problem. So one of the biggest problems we realized during our customer research process was that U.S. consumers, especially college students, have a lack of awareness in terms of the credit card options out there in the market, as well as the terms and conditions. So even if students do know about the uh, credit cards out there, it's mainly through word of mouth. And so what happens is becomes, it becomes a really a self-selecting pool of cards that are being applied for. So what the Columbia Tech team has done is really to build this solution called Card Genius, which is a web-based app that does three main things. One, it introduces consumers to a whole array of cards out there. Second, it recommends consumers credit cards that fit their needs. And finally, it educates consumers on the credit card terms and conditions. Finally, a really quick shout out to my amazing teammates, Ray, Ellen, Emma, and Luna, as well as our mentors, Megan, Charlie, and Derek, who helped make this product come to life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jason from Rutgers. All right, hello everybody. My name is Jason Lee, and I'm the team lead for the Rutgers team. I wanna shout out um, our amazing advisor and mentor, Veronica and Nicole, as well as the rest of our teammates, Monica, Rachel, Sandeep, Alex, Adrian, Vinny, and Andrew. So we just decided to create a product called Limit, which is a web app that is designed to provide users with their ideal credit card match. We noticed that a lot of college age students, our peers, have trouble with the jargon, the legal terms, and we really wanted to remove all of that and to match them with their ideal credit card match based on user personalities, which we've kind of designed a quiz to separate users into three groups, um, savers, neutral, and avid spenders. And from that, we would match these students with credit cards and help them throughout their credit journey. Thank you. Uh, Trent from Morehouse. Hello, everyone. My name is Trent Gila. I'll be presenting for Team Morehouse. Um, just a quick shout out for my team members, Elijah Truer um, and Tasia Sykes, um, our postdoc advisor, um, Dr. John Porter, and our corporate sponsor, um, Palantir. So as a part of TOP, we built a um, interactive credit um, dashboard um, to provide built off of Palantir's Foundry um, to basically provide credit card requirements and recommendations for individual users based on their situation. From there, a launch promote long-term credit growth and predict their credit over the long term while also educating the user about this credit. Now, obviously users um, have a variety of different use, use cases. So a paycheck to paycheck user will have a lot of different needs for their cards than a travel-based user. That's what we're going to solve. Thank you. Um, Ololua from uh, Philander Smith. Hey everyone, my name is James Ololua from Philander Smith University sub team. And basically what Philander Smith University designed this year for the sub sprint was um, a credit boost. It's an app, it's a, it's a mobile application. Um, so what we what we did in relation to our problem statement was to develop an app that um, gives you credit card recommendations because at the beginning of the sprint program, we noticed that most of these, um, our end users that students don't have good understanding of these credit card technologies. So we made sure we incorporated that into our app by adding financial wellness tools and um, other things about interest rates and educating our users about things like APRs 
And our app also provides um, credit card recommendations to our users for the one with the credit card that are good for consumers, the ones that are good for beginners, the ones that are good for um, people looking for good interest rates and other um, things like that. So um, a quick shout out to my teammates, also Emanuela Torsin and Francis, and also our advisor, um, Dr. Anwar, Dr. Susan Anwar. Um, yeah, so that's what the Permitless University can add. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had I had a blast working with all of you on all of these, and I was really impressed with with what y'all created. So I'm I'm particularly uh, excited about this panel. So so let's jump in. Um, first question, um, Nick. I'm going to ask you to start with this first question. But uh, how do you think the top process helped you create something you may not have created otherwise? Cool. Thanks, Ned. So I think the biggest benefit of the top process is really in three main areas. Um, the first area is really scoping out the problem. And together with CFPB, we managed to scope out a problem that was relevant, um, something that is intuitive and something that actually needs to be solved. Secondly, I think it introduced us to relevant stakeholders. Speaking to user advocates like yourself, that was really, really helpful in terms of giving us the advice as well as the um, fortitude to understand how we can approach the, the problem. And thirdly, it's kind of structuring the product development cycle process. It was really structured. And so what this really helped was making it really easy from the get-go. Um, and that starts off with the ideation, ideation, understanding the problem, and then building out the product from scratch. And so essentially, I think there were a lot of systems in place that allowed us or, or allowed our team basically to stay on track and build something that I think uh, is really impactful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jason, how about yourself? How, how did you find the process? I thoroughly enjoyed the entire process. I think that it was um, really amazing because, you know, when you design products, you don't really design them in a vacuum. There's all these moving parts. And so, you know, special thank you to you and I for all your expertise, um, to our mentors who, you know, have donated their time. Um, Grant, thank you. And, you know, being able to work hands-on with federal open data, being able to, you know, have the structure, but then also have the creativity. I think it's, it's really important because we're designing products that are really within our demographic college age students, 18 to 22, but then also having the support of, you know, a government agency, having their data. Um, I think that's really what makes this really unique. Thank you. Uh Trent, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, how did you think the top process helped you create something that you may not have created otherwise? Well, really, top really helped shift the way we were looking at the question. When we first got the idea of looking into the credit card industry, and we looked at it from a broad area, but from our perspective as what's useful for me right now as a student, um, top and especially talking to the user advocates helped us shift that basic premise to look at credit cards from a societal lens. How can we improve this for not just us now, us going into the future. In our case, it turned into how can we promote long-term growth um, for credit journeys. Thank you. And uh, I think we've got time for for one more. So, so Lucas, I'd love to hear uh, love to hear your experience and how you think Top helped you create something that that y'all might not have thought of otherwise. Well, I think that, and as as Nick and Jason and Trent have all mentioned, right? There's the process has changed how we would normally have approached the product creation. But I think if you take the step even further back and look at a more macro, the vast majority of us will end up working in the private sector. And this was a very public sector, public benefit project on helping consumers using government data, using things that the credit card companies may not want there to be all out there. Uh, I think the reference I made early on when I started learning about the project is we're looking at nerdwallet.com but we're making it with unbiased data to really help people and not be an extension of a marketing effort for a credit card company. And so, and I work in the private sector now, and as I said, most of us all will go into the private sector who have competed in this in the sprint. And so being able to say, no, we're gonna take this step back and we're gonna do something that's really gonna try to help people in a way that's not looking for the return on investment and that return really being how many people have we helped, how many consumers have we steered in the right direction of, of a stable and successful and healthy uh, finan personal financial and credit journey. I think that's really where the top process 
is different than any other competition. I've done other competitions where we have to develop a product in, in a 16 week window, but that's all for how do you commercialize this? How are you going to get the return? Who's going to buy this, right? It's, it's all about the consumer not being a person. It's being the consumer being a buyer. And this is very different. And I think that's probably the most beneficial aspect of the whole thing is everyone's being told, let's look at how do we help people instead of how do we solve this problem and sell you something. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, I appreciate all those insights and kind of the views that, that all of y'all had. Um, let's hop to the next question. Um, Trent, so you know, I'm going to start with you. But what surprised you about the credit card shopping process? What do you think other students might benefit from knowing about credit cards and how might CFPB or better data uh, help that process? Well, one of the things that was really surprising to me was how easily it is to get into a hole with credit, even if you're doing the right thing with trying to build a credit score. Um, one of the most important pieces of data we found outside the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau um, was an FDIC report um, that they said that detailed how the first type of credit you get influences your credit score up to the age of 30. So starting from 18 going to 30. So for example, if you got like a retail card from um, Nordstrom, your credit is going to be wildly different than somebody who got their first credit card from a Navy Federal or a different institution like that. Um, so showcasing those sort of potential pitfalls, even when somebody's trying to build up their credit score, I think can be really helpful and sort of help people sort of have a long term journey. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, Jason, would you like to, to answer that question? Yeah, you know, like Lucas said, this is really a consumer facing product. Um, you know, there's nothing that we want to sell. There's nothing that we have to benefit off of other than, you know, just educating our peers and helping them with just the whole journey of, you know, you know, maybe it's just a credit card to some people, but to other people, it's how they finance, you know, maybe their careers, how they want to eventually buy a car, buy a job, um, and buy a house. You know, we, um, you know, we had a representative from Chase come in to help us, and you know, one of the things that we learned from that was just how far, again, um, what Chen said, how far your credit can influence your entire life's journey, not just, oh, you know, you're fresh in college, you know, you want to buy some, a new laptop. Um, so knowing that, knowing that the government, the CFPB, I remember you mentioned that the credit card act, that was something that we incorporated into our product. Um, something like that, that there are protections, but then these protections, um, you know, and on the credit card company side, all of these things are there, the terms are there, the APR is there, but people might not necessarily know what those mean. How is that going to affect you? Um, being able to learn all of that and then incorporate it into our products that is both for the people and also by the people is really important. Thank you. Um, Nick, uh, would you like to, and I'm going to repeat the question just because just I think hearing the question over and over is helpful, but it's, what surprised you about the credit card shopping process? What do you think other uh, students might benefit from knowing about credit cards and how might CFPB or other data sets help in that process? Cool. Thanks, Matt. So I think um, what really surprised me is the diversity of credit card options out there in the market, actually. So especially for me, um, I come in as an international student here. I only came in here like four or five months ago. Um, and very much like our target users, I only knew about the big names like Chase. Um, and that's mainly true, you know, friends telling me like, hey, you should apply for a credit card from Chase because that's what everyone does. So you don't actually realize how extensive the list of or the number of options there are out there. And there are many really good options from smaller credit card issuers uh, that we just don't know. And I really like what Jason said as well about um, for the people, by the people. I think a lot of us, I think all of us actually, um, we built products or rather we built this product um, to help our peers, right? Um, we understand that there's a problem out there in terms of the knowledge and awareness of our credit cards. Um, and that's what we're trying to solve. We're trying to help make it more transparent, uh, make it more equitable, um, make sure people actually understand um, the options and the terms out there. And so I think also just kind of tying it with CF, 
PB's data. I think that was super useful because it basically centralizes all that key information from you know application restrictions, fees, benefits, things that someone like myself would love to know right from the get-go. Um, and that makes things a lot easier. Thank you so much. Um, actually, we are we are at time with this question, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have us move on. And uh, Olulua, um, I'm gonna just ask you, what was your favorite part about the sprint process? Um, actually, my favorite part about the sprint process was getting to meet with my user advocates and my teammates. Um, another another part that I really enjoyed during the sprint process was. I was getting my teammates together, I was um, brainstorming ideas, putting ideas together, working with the data and speaking with our user advocates also, uh, where we go to talk about our product um, success rate, our process probability rate, and things like that. Um, another favorite part of the sprint was um, when we had the opportunity to turn our um, thinking into creativity, where we we'll put our hands to work in designing our app, um, using the data that was being provided to us. So I think that was my favorite part of the sprint process and um, getting advice from um, user advocates. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Nick, what was your favorite part? So I think for me, it's probably um, building up the beta product. Um, and so and, and actually conducting the beta demo. And the reason for that, I think it's really the first time where you kind of see your ideas um, the considerations you have put through, your user research, um, the tough data wrangling process all come together. Um, and that's when you get a first chance at playing with your product and understanding how um, it fits your the problem state. Thank you. Um, Jason, I'm going to go to you. And then after Jason, I'd like to hear from Lucas. The same questions. Uh, what was the favorite part of the sprint process? Yeah, so... Hearing from the other teams, um, I kind of noticed that our records is kind of unique in the sense that we're not really part of a club. It's kind of like half program, um, so with freshmen, and then other half, me included, are more upperclassmen. Um, so it was really interesting to be able to work with, you know, our freshmen, Alex, Andrew, Monica, Sandeep, and Rachel, um, who are you know, I am a senior, they're freshmen in the business school. It was, it was, well, first it was nice to be able to like sort of mentor, be able to guide them in what I was interested in, user research, being able to reach out, talk to um, experts, data stewards, user advocates, but then also interview other people in collecting that data. Um, and then also being able to sort of help them on you know, their, their journey as freshmen um, in the business school. And then with the upperclassmen, um, as well as Nicole, Veronica, and our mentor Grant, um, so Vinny, Andrew, and Adrian, it was really interesting because it was kind of a, a volunteer put together team, multifaceted. I was really able to, you know, piece together um, Figma mockups to back end to front end, uh, the whole process of putting everything together, being able to work with such talented people, um, multi, like multi-talented, um, was really enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, I wish I had uh, known someone like you when I was a freshman. Uh, Lucas. I think my favorite part really is something that kind of permeated across all the major stages and is what we internally refer to as the scaling of the project. Um, so Nick, a question ago mentioned that when he started looking at the data, he goes, oh, there's so many uh, credit card options. And I think I had, I felt the inverse. I was like, oh, there's only 600 something of these. The U.S. is pretty big. There's a lot of people. There's only 600 options. But then it flipped when we start talking about the scaling of building the tool. And we're like, oh my God, there's 600 of these we've got to ingest properly. Um, but it's it's all the different facets of the project where you have to scale up or scale down in order to be achievable within 16 weeks. Um, on our project, our product, we had uh, the written content. And so you're scaling down how much written content you're generating in order for there to be in the 16 week uh, time period. But you're also scaling up tools that you need to work, have working for the minimum viable, uh, minimum viable product uh, pitch uh, point at the end of the pop uh, sprint, but 
but then at the same time, it's, well, what tool is most important to have working 100% and what's nice to be able to say, we've got this mostly working, but if we had another 16 weeks, we would have it done. Um, and it's that strategic decision making as you look through what actually has to happen in that timeline. Um, but then again, uh, as, as people have already uh, iterated uh, currently, I think the hands-on aspect is the most fun. It's the actually talking to somebody, learning about what they really need from credit cards and from their credit card journey and really working hands-on with the, the actual product that you're developing and being able to say, no, we've made this. We've, we're now developing a tool that could help somebody if we took it one or two or three steps further and we actually put this into full deployment. And I think that's the, it's these big questions that really are the most fun to think about because if you're sitting there deciding, oh, well, you know, what's the best way in HTML to code this, that, that's fun for some people. But I think everybody can sit and enjoy the big question conversation of how are we going to do this? Why are we doing this? And what's the impact we want to try to have in our niche focus with our product? Because no product solves every problem, but it's what are we going to do and how are we going to help people with what we have? I think that's the most fun part of this. And I think it's also the most impactful takeaway that any of us can get. Thank you so much. Let's uh, let's change questions here. Let's change directions a little bit. Um, I, I'm going to want to hear from, from the panelists about, did your participation change your understanding of the, of the government's work in any way? Um, let's start with uh, Olua. Oh, um, yes, hey, thank you, um, um, Matt. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start. First of all, I just want to say the, the topic, the sprint program totally changed my understanding of the government role because even before the sprint program, I, I didn't have an idea that things like this were in place to um, improve the state of credit card shopping for consumers generally. But um, into the sprint program, I come to like, appreciate the work of a governmental organization like the consumer financial protection bureau just trying to make sure that things are like stable for credit card shoppers out there trying to put programs in place trying to put meetings in place that ensure that everything runs smoothly trying to, to make things better by putting students together that can develop apps develop websites just improve the state of the credit card um, market and improve competition so i also see that is a really good thing that i've come to understand so it has also given me a good understanding of how government works and how it um, tries to put these things in place to make sure everything runs smoothly. So yeah, that would be a really significant thing and I don't take it for granted that I, um, I come to really appreciate it. I, my team, I come to really appreciate the efforts of the government in trying to make things better for students and credit card users generally. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Trent, same question. Uh, did participation change your understanding of the government's work in any way? I can definitely say it is. Um, my base perception at the start of this project was that government work was slow, really segmented, like between departments and sort of like divorced from the private sector. Um, I'll blame like the Pennsylvania Department of Transport for that. Um, but sort of top showed me how far those assumptions were, um, especially with sort of how fast paced we were moving week by week in sprints um, that easily matched how I, uh, my experience in the private sector. Um, then I really enjoy, especially like how we were really encouraged to pull from data sources, not just the FDIC one, um, and how really open top was to discussing things that weren't necessarily just the basic part of our process of our project. Um, like one memory for me that stands out was I brought this um, data set was talking about the missing middle, basically people from age 18 to 30 um, who had no history of credit to one of our user advocates, and we just talked about it for. Um, good 30 minutes discussing how that would impact government work um, versus that didn't really have anything to do with what my project was going towards. So I just sort of that sort of openness and curiosity, see like, how can this be useful to our society? Not just how is this good for this specific project, I think was really interesting and definitely changed sort of my view of what government can, work can look like. Thank you so much. So we've got time for one last question. Uh, let's make this one a lightning round. I'm going to ask everyone to respond, but maybe be uh, a little more pithy in, in the response or shorter in the response. So, so this question is, how do you think federal agencies can help more students learn about and use federal open data to foster innovation and develop new tech solutions? Um, let's start with, uh, Lucas, let's start with you. Um, well, I mean, 
Nate, you when you introduced yourself, you you hit the nail on the head, right? You work on as a team to be able to use these government tools and government data to try to, to help people. And I think if every agency had that kind of that uh, that sort of internal team that's trying to say, hey, we've collected all this data, we've got it all. All the information you could possibly need is is here behind me in this in these uh, filing cabinets. How do we use it? I think that can change a lot of things from the Department of Transport, where we they know how the transport network works. Now, how do we optimize the system with that data? Uh, the NIH, we have the healthcare data. We, we have data in so many facets because in 21st century, it's the information age, it's the information economy. We, we collect all this. It's all generated every day. Um, and so the more we use it to develop true understandings and to have data-driven solutions developed, the better life is going to get for a lot of people. And I think that's uh, that's really important. Thank you. Uh, Ololua, I'll, I'll change to you for the same question. Um, so um, how I think the federal agencies in general can make sure uh, make this data accessible to um, developers out there is by just like, there are, there are lots of hackathons nowadays and app developing programs. So I think that federal agencies like the CFPB can put this data out there for, you know, for um, developers to create innovative solutions and solutions that can improve the state of the credit card market in general. And I also think that schools can, uh, federal agencies can partner with schools to like make this data available to students, um, data scientists in general. Um, there are a lot of data scientists in most of these schools, like my school, for example, we take, do a lot of data science courses. And this just makes sure that um, these data scientists are aware of this data. And also the, um, when in the future, maybe like they want to create an app or like anything, then they remember that, okay, I have access to this data. I can always like put this into my work like make a better solution for myself. But uh, my main take would just be um, federal agencies investing uh, in innovative programs like hackathons, where the students be able to build apps and like build better solutions for to, um, problems like what we are trying to address like um, improving competition in the credit card market. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jason. So, you know, like I said earlier, you know, when we're creating things, um, oftentimes it's within a vacuum, but, you know, design sprints like this, you realize that um, you have, you know, a government agency willing to share their data. You know, as Lucas said, um, they're collecting all this data. You might not necessarily know what to do with it, even if it's open, even if it's out there, people get overwhelmed, people, you know, um, so, for example, like myself, low income student, um, being able to have the structure of this program, have support of the university, um, my teammates, um, same could be said for other um, students, people of color, international students, um, being able to be in this space where, yes, things are fast moving, but then things are fast moving because they're created by the very people that they're intended to help um, is really interesting. Um, be able to access all this data, access this mentorship, and it being done by the people that you know the government agencies really want to focus on and target, um, and really help foster and develop new tech solutions that are again made by the people for the people, very consumer facing and people like centered. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick, I'm going to go to you and then Trent, I'm going to let you let us close us with the same question about how do you think federal agencies can help more students learn about the uh, about the use of federal open source data to foster innovation and develop new tech solutions. So, so Nick. So I think building upon what all of my other panelists have already mentioned, um, I think federal agencies do a good job as long as you have sufficiently high data quality um, and engaging pretty much in pro uh, projects like this, um, where there's partnerships between the public sector uh, and academia, where you can leverage you know, um, you know, resources in schools to, to help ideate and you know, build new, new tech products um, with a different slant right, um, from government itself. 
So I think these kind of collaborations are where perhaps some even of the better or the best ideas might even occur with through these uh, partnerships. Thank you. And Trent, you get the last word. Sure. So program it's like this definitely exists and it top needs to be expanded aggressively. That's how I think um, it would be a good solution until it's like a national hackathon. Um, and then we'll see what make people make. Um, back when I was in high school, I participated in a program called the Congressional App Challenge and then helped run it, um, where teams from every congressional district could compete to submit iOS applications. And then the winning team would be invited to DC to meet their house representative. Programs like that really helps inject a lot of iOS knowledge into high schoolers. And something like that at the same scale at the collegiate level could introduce a lot more people to um, federal open data and who knows what they will make. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining this conversation, for participating in the challenge. I was really impressed with some of the ingenuity and how we talked about competition and everybody uh, kind of went towards education as, as a means of uh, promoting competition in the marketplace. So, so thank you all, wonderful job. And uh, I hope to work with you all in the future. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for this fantastic discussion. We are grateful to have a brilliant group of students participate in the top university program this fall, and we can't wait to see what kinds of challenges you all decide to tackle next in your careers. Now uh, we'll shift gears and turn to another important discussion, tribal data sovereignty. Dominica, over to you. Thank you, Thera. Hello and welcome to our final session for the day, The Importance of Tribal Data Sovereignty, a discussion with Indigenous communities leaders featuring four panelists, Chief Lynn Malerba, Treasurer of the United States, Alicia Murphy, Economist at the Navajo Nation Division of Economic Development, Lakota Vogel, Executive Director of Four Bands Community Fund, and Amber Buger, CEO of Totem. This next discussion will be moderated by the brilliant Carol Lee Wendell Roth, Tribal Engagement Coordinator for the U.S. Economic Development Administration. The conversations around data equity, data-centered solutions, and human-centered data would not be complete without centering tribal data sovereignty in conversations as it pertains to Indigenous communities. This session is a much-anticipated discussion amongst respected tribal members who have worked for decades to empower their communities helping address challenges encompassing data, technology, access to capital, human rights, and much more. These panelists deserve to be acknowledged and celebrated in their own right, carrying out service to their communities with the utmost dedication and resilience. We thank all four of these leaders. I will now turn it over to Chief Malerba for a blessing and introduction from the rest of the speakers. Please join us in welcoming our panelists. Thank you. Now we kachi yi wokanch, kwatayam kwat sota, nashpi katuakwa iyo yuak. Wa kakota wotaman yokiskia ya katayo tawa wokano nash, wa kamai wotaman wachi katayo nanona iach. Great spirit, we thank you for this beautiful day and all the days to follow. We thank you for Mother Earth and all that she gives us. We thank you for our friends who stand beside us. We thank you for their spirits, the ancestors who gather to guide us. Let us be honorable through word and deed. Bless us, we ask of you while we discuss important matters. May we listen closely to one another as we share our thoughts today. And may we love one another for the sake of our people. May it be so. We kiss Inuak, Natu, we sung Squamatan, Motahash, Lynn Malerba, Wachi, Mohikanawak. Good day, everyone. I am Chief Lynn Malerba, Many Hearts of the Mohegan Tribe. I follow in the footsteps of many great tribal leaders. As a tribal leader, I think about tribal data sovereignty both in the historical as well as the modern day context. 
As tribal people began to experience contact with non-Native people, our tribal governments have continually expressed their sovereignty in all interactions with colonial, international, and eventually the United States government, including that of maintaining sovereignty over our data. A seminal court case heard in London in 1705, Mohegan Indians by their guardians versus the governor and company of Connecticut, recognized our sovereignty over our lands, people, and our body politic. During the early years of contact with European immigrants, the Mohegan tribe protected its data by not sharing our sacred practices, herbal medicines, and ceremony. Our language, however, was taken from us. Two very important Mohegan speakers, Samson Ockham, a Mohegan minister, herbalist, and teacher in the 1700s, whose work is the oldest recorded version of our language, and medicine woman Fidelia Fielding, the last fluent speaker of Mohegan, documented our language only to have their work housed at Dartmouth College and Cornell University, lost to our Mohegan people. Fidelia Fielding wrote her diaries in English and Mohegan in the 1900s when speaking our language was forbidden. In the 1800s, Mohegan experienced grave desecration with funereal objects looted from graves by archaeologists. We experienced discrimination, sometimes in the form of physical abuse for speaking our language and practicing our culture. This effectively moved our culture underground, creating a closely held custom to withhold tribal information from non-tribal people to protect our way of life. Recently, Dartmouth and Cornell returned these documents and we are now reconstructing our language using our indigenous writers. Data sovereignty in modern times presented itself to me when the All of Us Research Project wished to enroll Indigenous people to share their DNA and medical records into a large database for medical research. Indigenous people have always been researchers, observing the ways of nature and employing information gained into our life ways and healing practices, first in the form of oral history, now in written form. Indigenous people, however, are not necessarily trusting of medical research by non-Indigenous people given past unethical practices. For example, the Habai Supai Nation consented to give blood for the purpose of studying the epidemic of diabetes in their community, only to find that their blood was used for numerous stigmatizing studies without their further consent or knowledge. A central question for the All of Us program addressed was whether the consent of the tribe was required if a tribal participant wished to identify their tribe of origin given the sensitivity of DNA research. Guidelines were established that would protect the sovereignty of tribes but also respect an individual's right to participate. This experience led my tribe to establish a data sovereignty review board. When approached by a researcher, we now have a consistent process of evaluating the proposal to ensure there is benefit to our community without compromising our ownership of the data. All too often, the interpretation of data has been the domain of non-Indigenous people who would not necessarily the nuances of a particular tribal community. For example, Roger Williams traveled throughout New England tribes and wrote a book chronicling his travels in the languages he encountered. He attended many feasts and as people were served their food, they would say tabatni, which he translated as thank you. As Native scholars in present day New England have uncovered what tabatni really means is that is enough. Because of course, during times of scarcity and in the interest of communal good, you would not want to be served more than you can eat. So this is a perfect example of an observation that could reasonably be made, but was culturally incorrect. Data collection for the sake of data collection is never the goal. For example, the Substance Abuse Prevention, Treatment and Aftercare Report requires recipients to submit 895 total data elements. There can be no real tangible use for collecting all that information. Respecting data sovereignty requires a strong partnership with tribes. It is essential to tribes to ensure that when data is being collected, that confidentiality is respected, strong data sharing agreements articulate who has control over the data, who is interpreting the data, and what it will be used for, what the disposition of the data will be, and that the data is only used for its express goals. When conducting research, tribal utilize tribal experts to ensure that data is interpreted through an indigenous lens that the analysis properly reflects tribal culture and that it benefits the people it is intended to. When funding agencies are used for data compliance or when they're using data for compliance, data sovereignty can be respected but while still achieving the goals of full compliance by consulting with tribes prior to developing the metrics for evaluation to ensure that reporting requirements are not burdensome or intrusive. In closing, the goal for data collection should be to enhance our community's well-being and our own knowledge while participating in the two worlds that we walk in. 
And so now I welcome Amber Buecher for her remarks. Thank you. Halitou, sahochifo, ya Amber Bucher, chata siahoki, Tulsa amitili. Hello, my name is Amber Bucher. I'm Choctaw. I'm from Tulsa. And I'm going to share my screen just briefly to show you all uh, just a few slides that tell you a little bit about who I am um, and the work that I do, just as a quick introduction. And then I'll pass it on to Alicia. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Chief Malerba, for those remarks. Those were incredible. And um, I, I've already taken some notes. Um, I love being on panels like this because it allows us just to learn also from such other strong, amazing leaders. Um, but I'm honored to be in this group. Um, I'm here because of some work that I've been doing with my company called Totem. We are the only digital bank by and for indigenous people. So we're trying to get more of our people banked, to help them access tribal benefits uh, and also tons of education about how, uh, how to access those benefits and financial literacy and things like that. And so data shows up in a lot of different ways in our work. Um, this is just a little bit about where I come from. I am an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation, raised here in Oklahoma my whole life, um, which is where we're based here in Totem now. Um, and this is just a couple of press clippings that we've had from Tribal Business News and others covering our work in Indian country. Um, so not only are we providing uh, digital bank accounts to Native folks that have no monthly fees, no minimum balance, um, free ATMs, two-day early paycheck access, a ton of other great features, um, we're actually sort of the other part of what we do is partnering with tribes to help them streamline the disbursement of tribal benefits. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit more about discussing our work with uh, with the tribes in particular with regard to data sovereignty. Um, but just to, to give you a little bit about how data kind of has really influenced my journey as a native entrepreneur. Um, I thought I'd tell you guys a little bit about our journey to raising the funds that we needed to build this company very quickly. Um, so last September of 2022, we raised a $2.2 million pre-seed funding round to build Totem. And uh, that was a very difficult journey in large part because of the lack of data uh, about Indian country and native folks in particular. Um, when you go out to raise money for from investors, you have to be able to very clearly show uh, the size of the of the group that you're looking to benefit and the funds that are flowing through that group and all sorts of different pieces of data that show that this is an investable company, that you're worth the investment because you're going to be able to grow and serve a, a significant market size with a unique product. Um, but it is very, very difficult to provide information that investors need, for example, about how to size the market for tribal benefits because we don't have um, sort of like standard requirements for reporting because our tribes are sovereign nations. And so what I ran up against a lot um, in fundraising, and I know that lots of other native owned businesses and even tribes themselves when they're seeking capital um, also have issues with accessing that capital just because of the lack of data that's present um, about our people and, and our situations and, and our resources um, and the things that we contribute to our local economy. Economies. And so for me, the lack of data uh, made things very difficult. And I would love to see a world where our, our tribal nations can, can work together to kind of find some solutions for how we might leverage data in ways that are aligned with, with their individual tribal values, but also allow us to participate in the modern economy, because there is so much to do. Um, this is just a quick look at a little bit of our app and some of our benefits, which we don't need to go into for, for this audience. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context for the work that I do, because I'm going to talk about some weird um, fintechy stuff and, and things like that and come at this from a little bit different angle than uh, than the other esteemed panelists. And I'm really excited to introduce one of them now, um, who would be Miss Alicia. So I will let you take it away. Thank you, thank you, Amber. And thank you, Chief Miller, for, for your remarks as well. Um, hello, Yate, everyone. My name is Alicia Murphy. She Alicia Murphy Nishiaki Ani Nishla Hanagahni Bashish Chin Tohoglini Dasha Chade Zai Skidni Dasha Nellet. I'm originally from Crown Point, New Mexico, uh, which is on the eastern side of the Navajo Nation Reservation. I was born and raised on the reservation with my parents and my older sister. Um, so, uh, 
in my journey to to the position I hold right now, it's it's I draw a lot of inspiration from my family, from um, my my parents and my sister first and foremost, and then I also draw a lot of inspiration in terms of the data work that I I've I'm in now uh, with from my community and from the the network of indigenous voices that are are doing the work to make to create change and are asking the difficult or uncomfortable questions to get to solutions that could potentially put us in this position to foster that change for, for generations to come. So instead of um, staying in this mindset of, of, of being or trying to fit into a system that isn't made for indigenous people or indigenous voices, uh, maybe we can change those systems to fit indigenous people's lives and existence today in modern society. So that's those those uh those questions and being in the uncomfortable space of of challenging what nor what is normal that's that's me where I I feel like I'm 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 thriving or at least I'm finding myself in those positions more and more because the the question about data is is out there the question about how and and who is protecting and what are the the measurements that we're using and and how is it going to be legitimized in terms of a um operating in a mainstream society so. Um, I do a little bit about my background. I have a background in um, in, um, in social work. I got my master's in social work from the Washington University in St. Louis um, and then pivoted and got my master's in economics from New Mexico State University in Las Cruces. Uh, from there, I was just intrigued by that by that one question, by that probably similar and common frustration is where is the data for indigenous people? Where is the data for, for Navajo Nation? In all of my studies and research projects, it was very frustrating to, to, to come to that sort of stopping point where there's not access to information for my own communities. Um, there's not enough or there's not up to date. There's not consistent information for Navajo. Um, and I'm sure, and, I'm, and we know for other tribal nations as well. So, um, after finishing my, my master's in econ, I went into the doctorate program. Uh, I'm, I'm currently finishing my doctorate degree with uh, NMSU and I'm focusing on tribal economic development, tribal um, and so data sovereignty and, and the ways we approach that question of how do we achieve data sovereignty? What does that mean for Navajo Nation specifically? So um, currently I am uh, the economist with the Navajo Nation Division of Economic Development. I've been working with my nation since November of 2021 and spent so much time learning about the nuances of the tribal government, uh, of the needs and the focus points of each of the offices that operate to bring uh, our, our Navajo business community to the forefront and how can we provide these services and streamline a lot of, of activity on the nation, as you know, working with, as a sovereign nation, working with the federal and county um, and the states in terms of, of development projects, whether that's infrastructure or, or t talking about the dual taxation issues um, or talking about our, our essential uh, elements of, of survival, water, land, um, air, and housing and safety. All of those conversations involve including and should include data and how Navajo Nation interprets that information to better make decisions for for all of the all of the um, um, building and strengthening our communities and all of the factors that uh, incorporate you know what makes Navajo different from states and counties and and even the border towns just beyond the reservation boundaries um uh so, Additionally, as a student, and, and what I think I bring into this job uh, for the for the Navajo Nation Division of Economic Development is is from a student's perspective, I was I was like the outside looking in. So I experienced the the um, the challenge of lack of access to data for Navajo Nation. I experienced that frustration, and I experienced still wanting to figure it out wanting to figure out this puzzle of how do we provide more data about our own communities, not just Navajo, but of course all the tribal nations, indigenous communities um, that, that do also lack that information. Um, so when I, as a student, and then I was, give, I was uh, excited to take this job in November, 2021, um, I am working with my nation and I'm seeing the same conversations on the other side of the coin, as they say, um, where we have the same questions, but the urgency is 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 
is more um, real as we go through legislation changes, as we talk to Navajo leadership who are um, responding to the constituents and to the communities at the on the ground who are who are coming out of what we all we all experienced in the global pandemic. So in that space too, um, I find this a really a really great opportunity to to start those conversations and 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 spend time in that uncomfortable or that um, unfamiliar territory and asking what does Navajo think data um, data is? What is the measurement? What is the um, the key points that we should be per portraying or reporting on or analyzing? Um, because the global pandemic did did shock the world. It 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 also forced us to think about data differently, ask the questions differently. Um, and and we want to and we want to um, continue to ask those questions. Um, I'm here for for uh, including that in all of the conversations of uh, when we talk about federal dollars being spent on Navajo, um, where we're talking about uh, programs like SSBCI, um, working with EDA and working with other tribal nations in the states uh, that surround Navajo Nation to um, on this collective um, effort to to improve our con economy after a, a global pandemic. Um, so I am really grateful to be here on this panel. I have um, uh, been listening for the last day day and, and a half. I'm grateful to learn, grateful to Coil for inviting me to join this awesome panel. And and um, as a nerd, I'm just I'm just really inspired to learn from this network of of the innovation um, summit that that that's that we are here today. So thank you so much for for having me. And I'm looking forward to the questions coming up. And I'm going to turn it now to Lakota Vogel. Thank you. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Lakota Vogel. I am a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. I was born and raised on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, which is located in North Central South Dakota. Um, so like Alicia, I didn't know this, but uh, I'm an alum of George Washington or Washington University in St. Louis as well. So hello, hello. But I think, you know, my story <clears throat> with data sovereignty is very similar to all the panelists that came before me of just seeing and hearing um, Native American societal positioning. And through all the research, you read about all the suicide rates, credit rates, all the rates that are thrown at us um, and realizing as a member of this nation who live and breathe here, grew up here, I didn't feel it reflected my reality very well. It was like putting on clothes that didn't fit and continued to ask questions about what is going on here. And fortunately through education and different schooling mechanisms realized that Data itself it doesn't create itself. It takes people and perspectives to create it. And that's where I wanted to play a role. And so currently at the position that I hold, I um, <clears throat> am working at a native CDFI community development financial institution, which is located on the Shrine River Sioux Reservation. And so I wanted to share a little bit about the impacts of what that narrative does and how we incorporate our own, we, how we incorporate data into that. I'm just going to leave it on this so I don't get into it, it's not that big a deal, but um, let me see if I can do it quickly. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is the reservation that I represent and I like to always put an inlaid on the state of South Dakota to show the geographic expansion of it. This is where I was born and raised. This is my home community. On this space, it's about the size of Connecticut. There's only about 12,000 people. So we actually have a lot of land, a lot of resources, very beautiful. Um, and we have a lot of infrastructure issues with the decline and how to use that. So we have to have the same police force that polices the entire area of Connecticut, the same water system, right? And all of that leads, we need data to determine need and demand and things like that. So the CDFI that I work for um, actually serves this entire area. Um, one thing that we're very proud of because people don't understand the demand and need for capital within native communities is since 2002, you can see the incline of the amount of capital we've been able to place into communities, native communities specifically throughout the years. It's, it's incredible. And a lot of the work that we do at Four Bands is using this data set to sort of broaden people's perspective about native economies across the nation and see what the opportunity in these markets really is. 
um, the four bands mission of the organization that I work at is really to shift these paradigms that people have and innovate equitable systems to create opportunities for people in the areas of small business, home ownership, and financial security. So using data, we really just like to broaden people's perspective of our communities. For example, in the small business space, like as, as Alicia sort of mentioned with COVID and all of the things that impacted small businesses, we wanted to show that that was also impacting our communities. And there's quite a bit of demand and innovation in this space. And oftentimes when we show the amount of money in just my tribal nation in South Dakota with that amount of people, imagine what the, the scope of this opportunity is across the nation for Native Americans, which we fully don't grasp quite yet because we don't have the, a data set to cover all of this, right? But we like to show the amount of opportunity that we have in our community um, <clears throat> using this. And then people always ask, well, they, they try to imagine like, well, what are Native Americans doing? Like, what kind of businesses are they starting? And so we have just a sector diversification chart, you know, that gets updated as different loans go out the door. But focusing on like, we do everything, right? Like don't sort of pinpoint us into one market and tell us that this is where we should be doing business. We really are like the rest of America and have lots of great ideas. Um, so we have a diversification of, of sectors, as you can see all over the place. Um, and our average business loan size, you know, is $145,000. So I think as Amber mentioned, when we're trying to fundraise and talk about our communities, and fundraise for different nonprofits or causes that we're a part of, it's hard to share this information when you don't have the data to back it up. And so each of us on this panel are trying to, to do that, bring our own data to this conversation and, and begin a new conversation with America about investing in growing native economies. So I will hand off and get ready for the panel and, and do some questions. Let me stop share. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Carolee Winderoff, and I am an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe from Montana. See, we have a dynamic group of professionals on our panel, so let's dive right in. All of you have positions where data is critical to your work. Um, Amber, I'm gonna start with you on this first question. Experts in the tribal data sovereignty space have acknowledged the tension between protecting indigenous rights and interest in data supporting open data. How do you navigate that tension in your own line of work? Thanks for the question, Carolee. I didn't realize I was starting, so <laughs> no pressure. Um, you know, it's really, it's really interesting. Like I said, we touch data in a lot of different ways at Totem. Um, you know, being a, a, a digital bank, we see a lot of pieces of information. And one of the stories that I think highlights the tension between wanting this openness and all of the promise that I think open data and things have for us, but also coming from that perspective that Chief Malerbo described, where we have a, a custom of withholding information and wanting to keep that private for good reason, that comes from a good place. Um, I think for me, that tension is really beautifully illustrated with something that we went through at Totem, where um, whenever you sign up for a new bank account, you have to show typically some form of ID so that we can confirm that you are who you say you are and run what's called a KYC or a know your customer check to confirm your identity. Um, most places require that you have like a driver's license, like a normal state driver's license. Um, and that's, you know, that a passport are kind of the only things that you can use to, to onboard. And one of the things that we were interested in right off the bat was allowing people to use their tribal IDs to onboard with us. Because from our perspective, this is an amazing opportunity to assert tribal sovereignty. And to do so in a highly regulated system like the financial system. And so we started to have conversations with our, our provider, our technology provider that does the sort of KYC checks for us and say, what would it take to sort of train your systems to be able to recognize a tribal ID? And we kind of went down this road and we went through a ton of different discussions about, you know, the actual how it would work and how we would pass information back and forth and this and that. And the whole goal was, again, to, to affirm sovereignty for our customers who are Native people coming to us for a Native account that's built by us for us, and to allow them to say, 
hey, you, we're going to allow you to onboard authentically too. And, and as your full native self and as a citizen of your sovereign nation. So we went down this path. We did all of this work back and forth. And one of the things that we kept finding as a sticking point, there was a couple of things. Um, you know, the agreements are really difficult in the world of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and algorithms and things like that. One of the ways that we were supposed to be undertaking this project would be to get a certain number of IDs from a particular tribe and then use those IDs to kind of feed that model so that the, the AI, the machine learning could visibly recognize what a tribal ID looks like. Um, and the idea was that we could start with like really large tribes and work our way down so that we could cover a large percentage of the population. Um, but it was really difficult to pinpoint once that data is in a model, where it goes, what it's used for next how that information lives on in ways that we can't predict today. And how even if the agreement says that you're only supposed to be looking at X, Y, and Z fields and not storing them, what guarantees do we have on the back end that that's actually happening? And so it got really complicated from a technical perspective very quickly. And then the second issue was also something that um, one of the, I think it was Chief Malerba also raised uh, about tribal consent. And, you know, if you've got tribal members that have their own identity and their own tribal ID and their, their personal stake in that identity um, and authorization, but then, you know, you have the tribe too, and those are their IDs that they print and authorize. And so where do we bring the tribe into having that conversation and getting their permission to allow their customers to give us these sample IDs? And it just kind of snowballed um to where we we pulled back from the project ultimately it's still you know kind of in the works we still have that relationship it's still something that both uh, all of us are very excited about the prospect of being able to assert sovereignty in this big meaningful way i think the other thing i'll say about that quickly is just that if we were able to pull this off it would have created an opportunity for every other bank that uses that technology to also allow people to onboard with tribal IDs, right? So then you're, it's not just us that's doing it. It's now every bank potentially that has the ability to, and it's your call whether or not you're going to take a stand and make that, embrace that. So it was a really big opportunity that um, for a startup, we just didn't quite, we realized that we were a little bit, we needed a little bit more time to create our place and our relationships with tribes so that we could have those those conversations um, and continue them in a responsible, respectful manner. Um, but it just goes to show the exact tension of like, we have this great opportunity to assert our sovereignty, but it requires giving up a lot. And in this day and age where technology is moving so fast, you really have to have a, a strong hold on what it is you're agreeing to. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Alicia, I'm going to ask you the same question um, about how you navigate that tension in your line of work. Wow. Um, I think we have a couple of examples. Uh, the one I would like to talk about is the the work that I started when I first joined the team here at the Division of Economic Development was the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. That's uh, a document or a report sent to EDA for uh, to become eligible for a lot of grant funding. And it's been published for Navajo Nation, not consistently, but it's been published and it's been helpful to a lot of our division uh, programs and departments in order to um, get access to federal funding. Um, every time I've read the document, whether that's from 2018 or, or before, it was it was highlighting a lot of uh, big picture or snapshots of the community um, that was uh, provided by data uh, that was easily accessible from third party. My question was, how did Nav how does Navajo feel about these measurements or these indicators of, of economic development or the situation that we're currently in as an economy? And um, I don't think, it, it, and again, it's a difficult question. It's an uncomfortable question. Um, it's a new question that that um, I I go with every single day. How do how does Navajo Nation specifically see and identify and define its own economy? Um, what not as not as a materialistic or a uh, a money uh, mm -hmm. indicator of success, but how does Navajo culturally take in that their own its own identity um, and an existence of 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 being an active and participating economy in modern society? How do they define it, and how can we work those definitions with with federal agencies, with state 
agencies with other partnering organizations to also recognize that this is the definition of success for an economy for from an indigenous perspective and that is as valid as as what we use every single day to report on an economy um, so the defining the the, the terms defining economic development um, giving a snapshot to our regional economies our partners um, surrounding areas um, how do we communicate that uh, in terms of from our own perspective, our own voice. Um, mm -hmm. So in part of the work in this new publication that I've been working on with uh, uh, one of our Navajo owned businesses is tr translating some of those indicators into Navajo words. That's one step we could take in, 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 in taking back that, or at least owning, you know, how, how Navajo nation is, is operating as, a, as a, a, an economy in the state of New Mexico, Arizona and Utah. Um, Taking those terms uh, like wealth and and prosperity and um, uh, um, impact into a definition um, it, within the Navajo language. So that's one example of of not really tension, but like starting this this new approach to to reporting on Navajo economic development opportunities and and how we analyze our communities. Um, so. That's one example. I can go into more, but that's great. Thank panels. you. I, I appreciate it. And obviously, we want to definitely get into more, but in the interest of time, um, I appreciate the one example. Look forward to the second example at, at another time. Um, and I know, uh, Chief Malarba, you did cover some of this in your introduction. You covered it very eloquently, but I did want to give you an opportunity to answer the same question in case there's more you would like to add on to that. I, there is more that I always have more that I'd love to add on to things. Um, but I, I would say in my role here at Treasury, I've been uh, blessed to have a very active uh, Treasury Tribal Advisory Team or a, a Office of Tribal and Native Affairs who started with the um, ARPA programs, the American Recovery Plan Act. And that's a great example about how you need to partner with tribes because what that um, that office did was when they were looking at how they would provide funding back out uh, from the from the American Recovery Program to tribes, they consulted with tribes to say what would a good formula look like to you? What are the metrics that we should be using to identify how the funding will be distributed? And they asked the question, should there be a floor for funding? Should there be a cap on funding? What are the things that will help us use um, as a proxy for what the need is in your tribal community? And I think they did a really great job at that. Um, but I do think that asking the question and making sure that you're understanding what the whole of Indian country needs is really important. So that I think is one really good example of how we're dealing with data. But you know, along with that comes that very, very serious responsibility of protecting that data and keeping it confidential and making sure that we put the you know our arms around it because otherwise tribes won't protect us, they won't trust us with their data. I think the other thing that um, we're doing right now is we're working with the White House Council on Native American Affairs to quantify for the federal government and its agencies what living up to the trust and treaty obligations look like and how do we chart a path to fully funding those obligations and how do we measure those unmet obligations to make sure that we're making progress? But then how do our own tribal communities use that information so, so that they can plan properly uh, for their future needs? Um, and in terms of developing healthy economies, we need to give up some data if we're looking for people to lend us funding and we're looking for people to partner with us to help be partners in that economic development. So I think that those are a couple of examples. Uh, but what I do want to say is, again, I think being a partner with our tribal communities is the most important stepping stone to gaining the trust of those tribal communities. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that trust is important. Um, in a similar vein, Lakota, I'll come to you with this question first. How are you thinking about the tremendous amount and speed of change happening, especially with like technology advancement or artificial intelligence? Like, What are the unique opportunities and challenges they present for Native communities? Yeah, thank you, Carly. I think it's, it's a great question. I think all of us on this panel are sort of the speed of which things are happening is really incredible. And as Native nations, I think we're sort of used to that as recently colonized in our histories. You know, we've 
a lot of systems were designed in America that we weren't, our voices weren't included on. And I feel like that's what's happening with big data and generative AI at the moment. It's all moving at a speed that our voices aren't being applied. So I think if we hold that truth up and begin looking backwards down the stream on how do we get our voices to this space, a lot of it you know, goes into STEM and building up students' interest in the sciences, understanding computer science and data collection, and then continuing to work with tribal nations, as um, Chief Malerba said, just ensuring that tribal leadership are aware of just data systems and data strategies that are important for them to develop for their nations so that they can stay involved in the conversation. I think the thing we all don't want to happen is us to just be users of a platform. We want to be creators or co-creators of a platform. As users, we know that there's going to be discrimination sort of that's embedded within the system. It just automatically happens in every algorithm, especially in the financial sector. Algorithms surround us. They're everywhere. But we really need to position ourselves so that we're at the point of creating. And I think another space, you know, outside of that, that's really interesting to me at the moment is the impacts on the environment for some of these large language learning models and the generative AI features. It's always at the forefront of our minds as Native peoples, and the, the carbon impacts of that are really profound. And I think that with a lot of the new funding that Chief Malerba mentioned, there's opportunities for us to sort of get ahead of that and begin to think of it. But we have to track the impact of that in footprint and understand what it's like and begin having these conversations. And it just takes each of us on this panel going back to our nations and continuing to ask these questions. Great, thank you. Um, very wise, very wise words. Um, Amber, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Gosh, I don't know that I have much to add from Lakota. <laughs> I guess uh, the thing that I think about too is the moment that we're in, um, in, in, again, in my FinTech world, in my little bubble, we're dealing a lot with open banking at this point in time and uh, regulators are formulating standards and uh, reading through comments and, and suggestions from folks and different interest groups on, um, who really owns your data at the end of the day? Do you as the individual own it? And then if you do, what are the responsibilities of the corporations and industries that we've built around that data to facilitate your ability to move that? So it, for example, in our in our context, it comes up the most with opening new accounts. So or or moving money between accounts and being able to uh, you know, access your one bank system through another, you know, intermediary and what permission you grant and, and don't grant. And so that's that's a battle that is again like as, as Lakota said, it's we're in the middle of having these discussions that will determine how we approach this going forward. And so it's just such an important time for tribes to be paying attention to this um, when we're making these really important decisions about who who does own your data. And and it's looking more and more like the the consensus is that individuals own their own data. And so what does that mean for? A society that's typically coming from a communal collective perspective. And there's a lot of um, interesting questions there that I agree, like the timeliness, like the time is now. We've got to be talking about these questions, which is why it's so great that we're all here today. Fantastic. And Alicia, I'll give you an opportunity to add on to that. Yeah, thank you, Amber. I agree. And I appreciate the comments from Lakota as well. And one thing that we're working on and in, in, in the time is now is that we're the Navajo Nation has a Department of Intellectual Property. And what we're working on is, is, def is defining all of those things that need protection. Data is a is is a as one component, but we're also talking about traditional story, language, images, and designs and art, uh, food, plants, all of the things that we want to, to ensure. We, the, our, our generations to come have access to those uh, items and resources and knowledge. Um, so we are in the midst of 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 continually meeting with our partners, our our research institutions, Arizona State University. Um, we have our Department of Justice on on board in turn in in this work to define and and label and identify what are those components of our of our economy and of our our communities that need protection um so it's it's happening now and, and it's like how, how fast can we can how fast do we have to move to keep up with these times it's really exciting work and i think i think i also echo a comment that was um, said earlier that we are walking in two worlds and when we have operate we have that opportunity to do that that's powerful and we we are in this group and in this panel and this network of 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 coil and what the summit is all about is is addressing those and putting work into the act to the actions and and plans and strategizing for our whole our whole um, 
movement forward with keeping up with the times. Um, but I, 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 I don't have me much to add, but it is really exciting work. Thank you. Um, in the comments that have been made so far have been so great. And, you know, I, in coming to this next question and I'll, and I'll start with you, Chief Malerba. Um, but, um, as we think about getting to the point of creating and not using or um, who has that information, um, is there a role for non-Native organizations, individuals and governments in promoting tribal data sovereignty? And if so, what is that role? I absolutely believe there's a role for um, other uh, not-for-profit agencies or organizations, because again, when you think about tribes, we all have varying capacities, right? You know, there are some tribes that are very sophisticated. They have a lot of economic development. They have a lot of things going on. You have some tribes that are very remote and very rural. Um, and so I see our regional and tribal organizations as um, conduits for information uh, who can then provide good information about best practices for data and who can develop policies around that for consideration for their member tribes. Um, so I see that as one path forward. And I would point everyone to the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. Um, they've been doing a lot of research around data sovereignty and I've shamelessly borrowed from them when I was developing our Tribal Data Sovereignty Review Board. Um, they've been doing this for a long time and uh, they have written many, many articles that I think are very illuminating. Um, so for anyone who has the time, I would take a look at that. Um, but I do think it really is about educating our tribal communities. And not everyone is going to be expert um, in terms of what data sovereignty means, what does it look like, how do you protect it, you know, what are the, the mechanics around that, and, and to think about what data actually is. There's a lot when you think about what, what does data mean. It means different things to different communities. Um, and so I think there is a good role to play. And I do think as a federal agencies, we should always be asking the question too, how do we protect the data of the people who are entrusting it to us? And again, partnering um, with you know, our tribal communities to make sure that we're designing those mechanisms to meet their needs um, in every way that we can. That's great. Uh, Alicia, I'll give you a chance to, to add on to Chief Malerba's comments. Yeah, I uh, agree. Uh partnerships with the, the the government agencies that surround us are essential to to furthering this work um as not, where where we're situated is we have we have three states that we have to uh, partner with New Mexico, Arizona and Utah and those collaborative relationships helped us with a lot of things that that benefit both the uh, the non-indigenous communities and the indigenous communities so when we talk about um, data sovereignty, and I think they they those those relationships are are going to be um, crucial. Um, and I I already enjoy, enjoy jumping onto the team that was existing before I even got here is learning about that partnership in in not just with the agencies that are that are part of a government, but also the the schools, the higher education institutions that have a lot of research empowered. A power in research to contribute to our government and 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 have the connection to the communities that where where they're going to be feeling those impacts of any changes or of any developments of our of our laws or our our policies. Um, so connecting to our tribal uh, colleges and universities um, is is just as important as those connections with the government entities as well. Thank you, and and Amber, we would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I think. Wherever you sit, um, whether you participate directly with tribes or work with tribes or not, there's stuff. There are things that you can do. We all we all deal with data every day. Um, there there's uh, there's no secret that n natives are not described in data in the best ways, in the most accurate ways, in ways that are healthy and uplifting for our people. And there are a lot of reasons for that, um, that I think Lakota was speaking to a little bit in her intro that really uh, touched me actually the way that she talked about that. Um, like we have a really tangible example from Totem though, we're, you know, we're, as you all know, we're a digital bank, right? So our whole goal is to get more of our people access to banking. Natives are the largest group of unbanked people in the country. When you look at racial and ethnic groups, um, we were unbanked at a rate of about 16%, according to the FDIC's, uh, 2019 unbanked survey. 
However, uh, in the 2021 FDIC unbanked survey, that number dropped from 16% to, I believe it was uh, 9%, 9%. Um, so it was a, an absolutely huge drop. Uh, oh, not even nine. It was 6.9% in 2021. Um, so going from 16% unbanked to 6.9% unbanked in two years was a huge differential that definitely caught our attention because that is a number that's really important for our mission. Our whole goal is to reduce that number and make sure that more of our people have access to banking. But when we're looking at that and it's less than half of our people are all of a sudden supposedly banked within the span of two years, not only is that just completely inaccurate, and we'll go into like why that was briefly, but it causes huge issues for every company that is out there, whether it's a CDFI or us as a digital bank or any other group out there in the financial services space that's relying on those numbers to show a need in our community. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, your investors are going, oh, there's no problem. You you know, more Black households are unbanked or more Asian households. Let's focus on them. And it's like, no, no, it's still a problem. It's just not being reported correctly. And so what they had done was the FDIC does this survey every two years. And of course, there's, you know, a little asterisk in the table that tells you to go down and find in a footnote that the sample size was incredibly small. It was like 850 people. And then when you dig even further, because this study caused ripples in my little area, my corner of the world. So I've actually been discussing this study with other bodies, other researchers, the FDIC itself, trying to get to the bottom of how this happened. And not only is the sample size so incredibly small, but the Census Bureau allows people to self-identify as Indigenous people. And that number of people that self-identified as Native doubled between the 2010 and the 2020 census because tribes are not a part of that discussion. Tribes have no say over how people self-identify. They have no ability to correct that information, to choose to claim people or not claim people. So the number of people that they are saying are Native that they're using for this FDI IC survey, even the very small amount of those, odds are even the small amount of people that they are using may not actually be Native in reality in any tangible ways that our communities accept, at least. So it was it was just an incredibly eye-opening situation where multiple large groups have chosen to report out this data in what's arguably a really irresponsible manner. Um, I mean, they have the asterisk, but it's like... The, just thinking through the implications of how you are positioning and representing data and where it's coming from um, is just could not be more important, no matter what area you're in, Thank government, you. non-government. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a great point to to call out. Um, I'm going to go to Lakota for this for this question. Um, are there recent developments in tribal data sovereignty space that excite you? I think I, I just think um, I hear our ancestors like singing songs of praise and happiness about all of the roles that Native Americans are playing in this, you know, in the space these days. And one of them that I just wanted to bring up was we have something called the Native Biodata Consortium happening. Um, it's a group of composed of nations leading indigenous <clears throat> geneticists. And so just saying those words together, I'm just really proud of how far we've come as Native peoples. And I think a lot of it has already been discussed, but what this specific group is focusing on is just ensuring that samples and data is kept local, that there's consent around the use of bio, bio, biological data. You know, as Chief Malerbo mentioned in her opening comments about what sometimes can happen with biological data and, and without consent, um, right? And they're building tribal capacity about how to make these decisions, like going to tribal nations and asking them to institute um, IRB boards, institutional review boards, which is really exciting conversations for our nations to be happening. So I just wanted to mention that really one unique you know, group of people that are coming together to discuss data in a really important way. Thank you. And, and I wanna say to this panel, you guys have terrific, like the most professional minds. And when I couldn't have a better panel to have this conversation with today, and I would like to thank COIL for hosting this panel today. And as this conversation advances, I hope that people can look to you leaders to be voices, as Lakota mentioned, how do we get our voices into this space? I hope people look up to you guys as 
voices to turn to as you have so eloquently displayed this topic that can be very touchy, but it is so important, especially as the federal government itself is taking a strong stand to include more tribal components into the work across the federal government, including indigenous traditional eco ecological knowledge and in those spaces with uh, intellectual property and all of those conversations. And we're all gonna start hearing these words a little bit more often. So I'm happy to have this conversation and open some eyes to some folks that may have not heard about this information or in a way that you guys have described it today. So I really, really thank you for your conversation and participation today. And so I, I wanna thank you. And thanks again for everybody who joined. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chief Malerba, Lakota, Alicia, Amber, and Carol Lee for sharing your insights, wisdom, and work with all of us. It's been a true honor to have your presence at this year's event to shed light on this crucial topic. We'll now transition over to our next speaker. Since 20, January 2022, Director Santos has served as the 26th Director of the U.S. Census Bureau. Before coming to the Bureau, he was Vice President and Chief Methodologist at the Urban Institute, and he has held numerous leadership positions at the nation's top survey research organizations, including the American Statistical Association, University of Chicago's National Opinion Research Center, the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research, and Temple University's Institute for Survey Research. I'll now pass it over to Director Santos. Uh, thank you very much. I assume you can hear me, and if you can't, then I assume that you'll let me know. Um, I always like those bios, but I, I I absolutely want folks to also understand that I'm a photographer, too. <laughs> uh, I was a live music photographer for South by Southwest for about uh, festivals for about eight years, and that experience has actually added a lot to my vision as a leader the way I operate with people and uh, my vision of how we can be better. Um, but putting that aside, uh, I am delighted to be here today to uh, have the closing keynote uh, for the uh, for the summit, uh, the the Opportunity Program Summit. So. Um, First, let me congratulate all the different projects and the individuals that participated. Congratulations to COIL for all that they have done to put this summit together and as well as the program itself. Um, and uh, thanks to you, the participants, because we would not have this summer and we would not have our projects without you, the, the participants. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about that, but today I, I just, I want to get a little, or I want to get real again. Uh, we're always real, right? The, real in the data world and the science world. Uh, but I want to get real more in terms of the, the community. So, um, if you take a look at the projects, the list of projects, they're really amazing, of course. Um, and they involve taking technology taking innovation and data and combining them with people and experts and such, but for what? It's for local usage, for the benefit of tribes, for the benefit of you know, local, local communities um, and so forth. So if you look at the projects this year, and I'll just mention a few of them, one was access to capital in indigenous communities. There's community focus social infrastructure resilience for local communities, data access for local policymakers. So you have the local focus. Improving literacy in Puerto Rico. Literacy is a ground level, boots on the ground type of endeavor. So the Opportunity Project, with what all these projects have in common, the Opportunity Project gets us to focus on the end user the, the folks that actually will benefit from the tools that are developed and thinking and the insights that are developed. And they do it in a very special way. They do it with community engagement. And why is this happening and, and why the interest? Well, let me motivate it with a, with a little story. I like to tell stories. And it's a story about... Um, that, that hopefully will get us to think a little differently 
about how the Opportunity Program operates in the context of communities and the high-tech world and people and experts coming together. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. Back in the back in the mid '90s, I was on a study section. You know, we reviewed grant applications and you know we'd score them, and then uh, it was for a federal government agency, uh, and that's how a lot of scholarly research was done. And as part of that whole effort, I would I would occasionally get you know these regular newsletters uh, from NIH and from other places that would you know newsletter it would tell you what's been going on, some of the research that's been done. And uh, this was like in the mid '90s, something really interesting popped up, and it was a little snippet on a project that had to do with um, health clinics, healthcare clinics. And it was a study, you know, nice, you know, design and everything. And the findings, that's what caught me. It was a study about uh, the use of an alternative language in healthcare clinics. So this was at the time, the mid nineties, some of you may not remember this, uh, this was at the time where there was uh, the English only legislation was being considered by states and the federal government and things of that sort. Uh, and so there was a real issue about folks who didn't have facility with the English language presenting themselves at health clinics and being able to understand what was going on. And this project basically took two, two different groups and it had one set of individuals seeking health care at clinics where they spoke no English at all. I mean, sorry, no alternative language at all. This was Spanish, no Spanish. They only spoke English. And they another set of, of people seeking healthcare uh, went to clinics where there was just a little bit of Spanish that was spoken, either by an administrator or one of the nurses or, or whatever. And the finding was that even if a clinic had just a little bit of Spanish facility built, baked into some of their staff, the patient outcomes were actually better. So I read that, 1995, and I burst out laughing. It was like, come on, do we really need a study to say that if a patient understands in their own language some instructions that you're going to have better outcomes, it was like, <laughs> give me a break. But then it, it hit me. It, it absolutely hit me, and I had an epiphany. This was the first time I'd ever seen a federally funded project that showed that U.S. society, and in this case, the healthcare industry, was acculturating to a more diverse society. It was amazing. It was an epiphany. Wow. Think about it. So outcomes aren't necessarily the, uh, uh, driven by... Um, hey, we got a program for you. You have these deficiencies and here's how we were going to help you. Instead, outcomes were being seen, rightly so, as the end result of the interaction between the patient and the healthcare institution itself. So outcomes were seen as an interaction. And that was really important because what it told me and what it drove from my perspective over the course of the next 30 years in terms of the research I did uh, in the public policy research world was think about the role of institutions in adapting to our increasingly beautiful society. Now, what does this have to do with the Opportunity Project? Well, if you think about it, the federal statistical system is in fact an institution. And in some way, by bringing together different types of data, 
creating a platform for philanthropies and for communities and for others, you know, technical experts to come together to look at problems. We're doing our part. And so are other institutions doing their parts in, acc in acclimating or acculturating to our increasingly diverse society in a way that's culturally relevant to the communities that we're trying to help. This is, this, to me, this is a big deal. And this is why I like the Opportunity Project so much. I look at it from this, that lens. There are many other lenses to look at in terms of, oh, big data and all these, you know, cool data products and such and data visualizations. But I like to think about it more as leveraging this enormous power of data and technology and bringing it together and demonstrating how it is that society needs to, in, in, in this case, U.S. society, is adapting to an increasingly diverse uh, and wonderfully, beautifully diverse nation that we have here. Um, we're bringing together, like I said, institutional institutions, federal agencies, communities, tech industries, nonprofits, philanthropies. And uh, the, the Census Bureau is not a policy institute. We don't do policy. <laughs> uh -uh. We do statistical data. What we're doing here with through COIL and the beauty of it is we're creating the opportunity to bring folks together so that they can be empowered to use the data for the benefit of society. Um, so congratulations for that, Coyle, and congratulations in that, in that context to both the technical experts uh, and to uh, the participants, the cultural folks, uh, the, the folks in, on the ground who came together for all of these wonderful projects and all those in the past. So to all you participants out there, I encourage you, given, given what I've said so far, to put on your critical thinking hats, leverage your entire self, your whole self, your culture, your values, your life experiences, your training, and identify problems from your communities using your unique perspectives that come from your whole self and submit those to the Opportunity Project for consideration for the next round. And uh, with that, I'll say congratulations again, and I'll turn it back to Haley and the COIL team. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Director Santos. Uh, those remarks were just the most magnificent way to end a day focused on human-centered data and human-centered design. And we really just love your message of bringing your whole self. So thank you very much. Um, and thanks to all of our wonderful speakers today and yesterday. It's been such an exciting second day of Census Open Innovation Summit. I hope everyone tuning in today learned something new and was inspired to join the Census Open Innovation community. Now it's time for the fun part, when we get to thank everyone who made this event and another year of open, open innovation possible. You might not know that this event itself is organized by a fairly small team at the Census Bureau. You've heard from mem many members of our team already. In addition to Drew Zachary, Dominique Zhu, Alexandra Barker, Lorena Molina Irizari, and Thera Naiman, we'd like to give a special shout out and thank you to our amazing team members working behind the scenes, including Alessandra Hartkopf, Victoria Fine, Dorcas Lynn, Vanessa Yip, and Sadie J. Thank you so much to the whole COIL team for your tireless work to create this event and all of our programs. And although COIL's work, COIL works very hard to bring you this event, it's also a huge team effort that spans across the entire Census Bureau. We would like to take a moment now to acknowledge all of the amazing people who contribute to this work. Thank you so much to our top sprint leaders and executive champions from the agencies we worked with this year as well as all of the Sprint participants and the networks that helped to spread the message about TOP. We've also shared a lot about Stat Ventures over the last two days and would like to thank our Stat Ventures partners as well. A huge thank you to Nick, Nick Orsini, Kevin Deirdreff, Stephanie Duds, Carla Medaglia, and Christian Muscardi, and many other experts from the Economic Directorate at the Census Bureau for making our first competition, the Supply Chain Challenge, possible. And thank you to all the phase one winners and phase two competitors for participating. 
and phase two judges from across government for volunteering your time to help us select the winners. We look forward to announcing the winners of phase two soon and launch phase three later this year. Many Census Bureau colleagues are also critical to this work. We would like to acknowledge several people and offices who are instrumental collaborators. A huge thank you to Mike Morgan and the Ventana team for the incredible behind the scenes work that makes the production of this event possible. We truly could not do this without you. We'd also like to thank Anthony Calabrese, Luke Keller, Kathy Parvis, Robin Weivel, Kathy Hanker, Eileen O'Brien, Michael Cook, and our colleagues in the Communications Directorate from PIO, CNMP, Clemso, and OCIA. The work of COIL would not be possible without you. A huge special thanks to Melissa Creech, Letitia McCoy, and others in the Office of the General Counsel. You are our most critical advisors in launching new innovation efforts as well as Everett Whitley and the Budget Division for your ongoing collaboration. There are many we may have missed, but thank you all. This is a Census Bureau-wide effort. And of course, thank you to our leaders, Director Santos, Deputy Director Jarman, and many more who champion this work and make it possible. And Haley, of course, we have to thank you for your amazing leadership of top this year. You have received many shout outs the past few days from our partners, and it shows how much dedication you have put into leading all the teams and sprint partners to successful products. As we mentioned yesterday, we are hoping that everyone who has turned tuned in over the past two days will take action. And here is how you can get involved in STAT Ventures. We are currently in the judging phase for phase two of the supply chain challenge, which seeks ideas to radically innovate the way we provide supply chain data. If you apply to phase two, please stay tuned as we plan to announce the winners and the next steps very soon. We also be launching a new staff venture competition, the Address Geolocation Challenge. We'll be seeking ideas from the private sector and academia on how the Census Bureau can innovate the way we geolocate residential addresses in rural and remote locations. If you are interested in competing in any staff interest challenges, visit coil.census.gov slash staventures to learn about the open challenges and the application process as well. You can also subscribe to receive updates about staventures so you never miss out on a new challenge and the deadline to apply. And at the Census Bureau, we also provide tons of valuable data and partnership opportunities. To access the wealth of data available from the Census Bureau, visit data.census.gov. You will be able to access demographic, housing, and business data about all communities across the country to support your business plan, grant proposal, research project, and more. You can also visit census.gov API to access the Census API for developers. If you need help understanding how to access and use Census Bureau data, Census Academy is a great place to start. You can watch our data gems, which are short how-to videos to learn tips and tricks about data, or you can take a course or attend a live webinar. And if you have a great idea for new content for Census Academy, please email to census.academy at census.gov. If you'd like to join a top sprint this year, lead a sprint as a federal employee, use the product showcase at Summit, please visit opportunity.census.gov. We'll be launching new top sprints in just a few months and would love to work with you as a sprint leader, tech team, user advocate, data steward, or product advisor. We'd also like to share a few announcements. After eight years of top, we're undertaking a large scale effort to document the full impact of this program on the teams, product users, federal agencies, and the economy. COIL will be conducting a survey of all past project teams and our partners at the Center for Open Data Enterprise, or CODE, with support from IBM Center for the Business of Government, we'll be conducting a series of interviews and publishing a report on TOP's impact. If you've participated in TOP and would like to be interviewed, please let us know. As a second update, we've launched a COIL blog to share what we're doing and learning. Check out our first post at coil.census.gov slash blog and stay tuned for much more content after Summit. Although today concludes our live stream, tomorrow we have another great day of workshops to close out this year's conference. Our final day of Census Open Innovation Summit will focus on interactive learning. From 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern, choose between two workshops, engaging with top through the TopX Toolkit or learn from leading business experts in a product sustainability masterclass, elevating your product to the next level. 
Then from 1.45 to 3.15 p.m., you can choose from another two interactive sessions, exploring the future of top sprint by and for indigenous peoples or Commerce Data Innovation Forum's Take Summit, an interactive session on DOC innovation. Please note the DOC session is only open to Commerce employees. These sessions require an RSVP by 10 a.m. Eastern Friday, tomorrow, and a separate Zoom link. So remember to sign up on the event website, coilsummit2024.splashthat.com. Before you sign off today, don't forget to post what you've learned with hashtag coilsummit2024 and hashtag opportunity project and tag at U.S. Census Bureau. Thank you so much for joining us, and we can't wait to see you tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern.